Chapter Zero Zero of the Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. Chapter Zero Zero. Preface to the New English Edition Although there have been, for more than thirty years, a vast manufacture of cheap romances of the scalp hunter and bandits of the plains description, it is still true that work setting forth the frontier life of America by men who have really experienced it are actually rare, and this is especially the case as regards real residence on familiar terms among the Red Indians. This is to be regretted because every student of history will, in another generation, wonder at this indifference as regards a state of society which is, even by us, regarded as intensely interesting. The chief reason for this is that those who were best qualified by experience were in most cases the worst fitted as regards education to observe or record what they had lived through. Young people very generally believe that the mere fact of having seen much of the world or having traveled qualifies anybody to describe well. When, on the contrary, a man who has not keenly cultivated the arts of observation and writing generally acquires nothing of the kind. On the contrary, as we often see in sailors, constant change makes him indifferent to everything save mere personal interests. Like the stork who had traveled every year of his life from Antwerp to Egypt or India, yet could tell of nothing except where the best swamps and pools were with the fattest frogs and largest worms. So men who have traveled most can very often only tell us where are the best restaurants and hotels. James Beckworth was a man who had really had a very wild and varied life on the frontier, all of which might have remained unknown had he not chanced upon Mr. T. D. Bonner, who, as this work indicates, wrote English in a straightforward manner and knew how to elicit narratives from his subject in a straightforward style. Beckworth had lived among Indians in the old buffalo days, which means, without exaggeration, that he had perhaps held his life in his hand on an average about once a day, had really been recognized by the United States government as a man who was capable of influencing and restraining the formidable tribe of Crow Indians for which badly performed duty he was for a long time paid a high salary, and finally he had, beyond all question, undergone hundreds of adventures as wild and characteristic as any described in this book. I would here protest that so far as I am concerned, the revising and editing this work is by no means a piece of literary hack work, since it was my intention to write on this man thirty years ago. Through personal channels, I have often heard of him. Mrs. General Ashley, so celebrated for her grace and refinement, of whom Beckwork speaks so admiringly, was an intimate friend of my mother, and I have often conversed about Beckwork himself with Mr. Shorto, but it was to Mr. Robert P. Hunt of St. Louis, who had known Beckworth well in his wildest life in the plains that I was chiefly indebted for my knowledge and interest in this strange semi-outlaw, and of him I will speak a none. I am also very much indebted, and hereby return my most cordial thanks to Horace Klephart, Esquire, librarian of the Mercantile Library of St. Louis, Missouri, for kindly taking the pains to look up for me the two following paragraphs which supply the principal data of Beckworth's life not given in Mr. Bonner's book, or which are subsequent to it as to time. James P. Beckworth, 
was born in Virginia of a Negro slave and mother and an Irish overseer. He resided for a time in the valley of the Sierra Nevada, but being implicated in certain transactions which attracted the notice of the vigilants, fled and went to Missouri. When the migration to Colorado was at its height in 1859, he proceeded to Denver and was taken into partnership with Louis Vasquez and his nephew. Being tired of trade, he went to live on a farm and took a Mexican wife, but fell out with her and finally relapsed into his former mode of savage life, dying about 1867. Montana Post, February 23, 1867. The following note is penciled on the margin of the copy of Bonner's Life of Beckworth in the Mercantile Library of St. Louis. He now, 1865, lives three miles south of Denver City on Cherry Creek, Colorado, has a ranch and was in the engagement against the Cheyennes at Sand Creek, November 29, November 27, 1864, and is a noted old liar. The last word brings us to a critical point in Beckworthiana. It recalls the anecdote that somewhat said to him that some men are really worthy of belief, but that Jim was always Beckworthy of unbelief. At the same time, we are told that this man was so splendid mendox, was really in a fight with the Cheyennes, of which it may be truly said that no lying whatever was necessary to enable a participant to tell a perfectly true and thrilling tale, that Beckwork had the very general frontier weakness of spinning marvelous yarns, and that he seldom narrated an adventure without making the utmost of it. Even when it was perfectly needless is probably true. I once knew a woman whose authentic adventures are a matter of history, and who had really led the most marvelous life in every corner of the globe, yet whose imagination and love of exciting astonishment was so great that I always discounted 50% from her reminiscences. So it may have been with the Crow Chief. In relation to this weakness, I find the following from an American newspaper. There was a camp of miners in California to whom Beckworth was well known, and when his life appeared, they commissioned one of their number, who was going to San Francisco to obtain stores to purchase the book. Not being very careful, he got by mistake a copy of the Bible. In the evening after his return, the messenger was requested to read aloud to the rest from the long-expected work. Opening the volume at random, he hit upon and read aloud the story of Samson and the Foxes, whereupon one of the listeners cried, That'll do. I know that story for one of Jim Beckwith's lies anywhere. Against this cloudy reputation, it may be remarked that perhaps the most extraordinary, desperately daring, and highly credible adventure of his life, the account of which I had from an eyewitness, who was a truthful gentleman, if such a man ever existed, and who had been at the same university where I myself graduated, is not mentioned in Bonner's life. It was as follows. I do not think that Beckworth was ever head chief among the crows, though I dare say he made himself out to be such, but that he was really a sub-chief is true, for I myself was on the ground when they made him one, and a strange sight it was. Beckworth was a very powerful man. He had been a blacksmith, and he certainly was a desperately brave fighter. A very large grizzly bear had been driven into a cage, and Beckworth asked of a great number of crows who were present whether any one of them would go in and kill the creature. All declined, for it seemed to be certain death. Then Beckworth stripped himself naked, and wrapping a Mexican blanket around his left arm, and holding a strong sharp knife, entered the cave, and after a desperate fight killed the bear. I came up to the place in time to see Beckworth come out of the cave, all torn and bleeding. He looked like the devil if ever man did. 
the crows were so much pleased at this that he was declared a sub-chief on the spot this same authority stated that beckworth was the offspring not of a negress but of a quadroon and a planter i incline to believe this if beckworth mother had been a negress he could never have resembled an indian so much as to pass for one when the education given him and the care bestowed on him in youth are more likely to come from an american planter than an irish overseer it may be remarked here that among the rough class of frontiersmen from whom biographical items of one another may be derived there is always a cynical disposition to ridicule and make fun of or to detract from the reputation of almost everybody ask any one of them who has known kit carson or buffalo bill or any other great man of the plains for information as to them and nine times out of ten he will demonstrate to you that the man in question was a humbug and proceed to relate anecdotes to his discredit for this reason i incline to think that beckworth had been too severely judged as regards veracity since the strictest judges must admit that there is nothing improbable in his biography or which might not have occurred to any bold and intelligent man who was in the varied positions which according to the most authentic testimony of others he really occupied the same friend to whom i have alluded who had passed twenty-five years as hunter trapper and trader in the west narrated to me the following i once as i verily believe saved beckworth's life i found him and his party nearly starved to death and gave them supplies food and ammunition and things which i do not now distinctly recall well it happened a long time after that i and my party convoyed a large wagon train over the plains after a while a party of crow indians began to run us badly they hovered about trying to shoot and scalp our stragglers and steal our cattle and at last things became intolerable they were in such numbers that i feared lest they might wipe us out i soon observed from the manner of attack that they were under command of a white man and came to the conclusion that it must be beckworth i resolved on a bold stroke when the indians had settled down one evening i took my best men and rode right into their camp as i expected i found that beckworth was leader i said to him at once jim beckworth you the reader must fill this hiatus with the choicest flowers of western phaseology what do you mean by acting in this manner the united states government pays you two thousand dollars a year for acting as agent and keeping your indians quiet and you repay it by scalping and robbing the travelers whom you are paid to protect have you forgotten how i once saved your life the very last time we met now here i am and our lives are in your hands but i tell you that by god i will shoot you dead this instant if you don't call off your indians and make a clear way you know very well that if you kill me it will be known far and wide from here to washington then beckworth spoke me fair and said that he did not know it was i and so on and looking about i saw a white boy a mexican he was the handsomest boy i'd ever saw in my life and i said you have no business to take and keep white captives american or mexican and that boy must go with me and he made great demure but finally consented so he called off his indians and we went peacefully over the plains and the mexican boy i wish i left him among the indians he turned out to be the most infernal young scoundrel on the face of the earth the reader may be perfectly assured of the truth of every word of these reminiscences and it is evident that they correspond altogether to the manner and style of adventure narrated by beckworth himself daily life on the plains consisted in those days of constant raiding and being raided robbing and running or in horse-stealing with not a little fighting 
On the very first hour on which I arrived at the most advanced surveyor station on the Kansas Pacific Railway in 1866, an employee came in reporting they had just escaped with his life from a party of Apaches in war paint four miles distance, and before another half an hour passed, there came in a Lieutenant Hasselberger who brought in a poor woman and her two daughters whom he had recently ransomed from Indians at the risk of his life. They had seen husband and father murdered before their eyes at their home in Texas, their house being burned, after which they had been subjected for six months to such infamous and horrible brutalities that it was marveled that they survived the treatment. It is worth mentioning that Henry Stanley, who has since become known as the great African explorer, was on the spot and wrote an account of the captivity of these poor creatures for the New York Herald. Such were for a long time the daily events of my life. At one time it was a buffalo hunt, another an adventure of some curious sort among the Indians. Altogether, when I recall my own experience and adventures on different occasions in the West and on the frontier during and after the War of the Rebellion, I cannot find that it was much less interesting, varied, or striking than that of Beckworth, the one great difference being that it was less bloody, albeit there was no lack of sanguinary occurrences in the guerrilla country at the time of the Battle of Murfreesboro, etc., about which place and Nashville I then passed the winter. If a man like Beckworth had been intelligent enough to take an interest in folklore, that is to say, in Indian traditions, superstitions, and observances, or a student of nature in its varied forms, one can imagine what an extraordinary book he might have written. As it was, only the most startling incidents of battle and murder remained in his memory. The nomadic Indians among whom he lived are the most savage and brutal of their kind. The Algonquin and other tribes of Canada, which include the Chippewas, are of a different sort. They represent a decayed civilization, so to speak, that is, a state of society which, though essentially savage, was two centuries since strangely developed as regards social relations, the administration of justice and the culture of myths. But the horse Indians of the plains, though they have, as recent researches establish, much that is peculiar and recondite, in their cult are still on the whole extremely wild and rough what may be deduced is that beckworth's narrative making every allowance for exaggeration and falsehood reflects very truly the real spirit of life as it was among those aborigines with whom he lived the anecdotes which i have here selected abundantly prove this my own honest opinion of the work is that it is true in the main, simply because it was impossible for its hero to have lived through the life which other sources prove that he experienced, and not have met with quite as extraordinary adventures as those which he describes. Life is even to this day as exciting and full of peril in some parts of America as is possible. I can remember on one occasion to have met with a man who, in journeying from western Arkansas to Philadelphia, had been shot at twelve times on the route. This was in 1866, but much more recently, in this Langham Hotel where I am now writing, the following actually occurred. There happened to be assembled in the smoking room half a dozen men from the far west. Conversation turned on wild adventure in and west of the Rocky Mountains, and many thrilling tales were told, not as marvels, but as matters of ordinary occurrence. There was present one who took no part in the conversation. After the rest had departed, he remained smoking in silence. 
I remarked that what we had heard was very interesting. He did not seem to quite understand what I meant, and asked to what I specifically alluded. I said that such stories of Indian warfare were highly exciting, to which he replied, Oh, yes, Injuns are the devil. That's a fact. The last time I came over the plains, six months ago, they shot seven balls into me. There are four of them in me yet. I went today to one of the best surgeons in London, and he says there are three of them which he can never get out. This was told in a matter-of-fact, commonplace tone, as if having bullets shot into one by Indians was no more remarkable than an attack of the rheumatism might be. Beckwith's adventures are in reality nothing beyond such experiences as this. Even he never had seven bullets in him at once. The number recalls another antidote. One day in western Kansas, a man who had shown me some kindness observed that I collected Indian arms, etc. Observed, Mr. Leland, I wish I had known you cared for such things. The Indians killed a man right near here a little while ago, and I pulled seven arrows out of his dead body. I gave them all away. I wish now I had kept them for you. It may be remarked in this connection that there are certain men who have a strange and mysterious gift of getting on with and conciliating Indians. I myself am one of these, and it is an hereditary endowment. There is a legend in the family that my great-grandfather, more than a century ago, went into Canada to trade with the Indians and made such a favorable impression on them that they took him captive and kept him prisoner among them all winter merely to enjoy the pleasure of his company. In the Canadian records, I find that this Mr. Leland on one occasion acted as interpreter in the French and Indian tongues. It was once remarked of me by one who had observed closely that among a number of white men, Indians picked me out at sight to confide in, and it was said that I might go among the wildest tribes safely. He who said this had had great experience among them, spoke several Indian tongues, and he declared that about one white man in a hundred had the gift. Beckworth was one of these naturally Indian white men, and I believe that it was the real secret of his influence, a fact worth considering in reading this book. All things considered and all due allowances being made, this life of Beckworth still remains beyond all question an extremely interesting record of a most interesting state of society, manners, and customs of classes of people who are very rapidly passing away. In this work, a kind of life every whit as daring, desperate, and marvelous as that recorded in the Norse sagas, and indeed far abounding in fighting and murder, is brought before us with much real skill and yet in the simplest and most direct language. In this latter respect, it deserves great commendation. I myself can testify that having read it when it first appeared more than 30 years after, I still retained its leading incidents in my mind, as I have done with those of very few other books. And as it combines the two great requisites of valuable information and that of deep interest for readers of all classes and ages, I cordially commend it to the public, hoping that all may find it as attractive as I have done. Signed, Charles Godfrey Leland. Langham Hotel, London, September 25, 1891. Preface to the American edition. Buried amid the sublime passes of the Sierra Nevada are the old men who, when children strayed away from our crowded settlements and gradually moving farther and farther from civilization, having in time become domesticated among the wild beasts and wilder savages, have lived scores of years wetting their intellects in the constant struggle for self-preservation, whose only pleasurable excitement was found in facing danger, whose only repose 
was to recuperate preparatory to participating in a new and thrilling adventure. Such men whose simple tale would pale the imaginative creations of our most popular fictionists sink into their obscure graves unnoticed and unknown. Indian warriors whose bravery and self-devotion find no parallels in the preserved traditions of all history and their career on the war pass sing and triumph their death song and become silent leaving no impression on the intellectual world among the many men who have distinguished themselves as mountaineers traders chiefs of the great indian nations and as early pioneers in the settlement of our pacific coast is james p beckworth whose varied and startling personal adventures would have found no record but for the accident of meeting with a wanderer in the mountains of california who became interested in the man and patiently listened to his story proceeded as it fell from his lips to put it upon paper this autobiography was thus produced and was the result of some months labor in the winter eighteen fifty four fifty five in prosecuting the task, the author has in no instance departed from the story of the narrator, but it was taken down literally as it was from day to day related. Beckworth kept no journal and, of course, relied upon his memory alone. Consequently, dates are often wanting, which it was impossible to give with accuracy when recurring to events transpiring in the course of very many years. Beckworth is personally known to thousands of people living on both sides of the mountains and also from his service under the United States government, has enjoyed the acquaintance of many officers of the United States Army who have been stationed in Florida, Mexico, and California. In his long residence with the Indians, he adopted their habits, and in every respect conformed to their ways. The consequence was, from his great courage and superior mental endowments, he rose rapidly in their estimation, he rose rapidly in their estimation, and finally became their chief. As an Indian, therefore, he speaks of their customs and describes their characteristics, and probably in his autobiography we have more interesting particulars than were ever before given of the Aborigines. Beckworth, after 10,000 adventures, finally became involved in the stream that set towards the Pacific, and almost unconsciously he established a home in one of the pleasant valleys that border on Feather River. Discovering a pass in the mountains that greatly facilitated emigrants in reaching California, his house became a stopping place for the weary and dispirited among them, and no doubt the associations thus presented have done much to efface his natural disposition to wander and seek excitement among the Indian tribes. In person he is of medium height, of strong muscular power, quick of apprehension, and for a man of his years very active. From his neck is suspended a perforated bullet with a large oblong bead each side of it, secured by a thread of sinew. This amulet is just as he wore it while chief among the crows. With the exception of this, he has now assumed the usual custom of civilized life, and in his occasional visits to San Francisco, vies with many prominent residents in the dress and manners of the refined gentlemen. It is unnecessary to speak of the natural superiority of his mind. His autobiography everywhere displays it. His sagacity in determining what would please the Indians has never been surpassed, for on the most trying occasions, when hundreds of others would have fallen victim to circumstances, he escaped. His courage is of the highest order, and probably few men ever lived who have met with more personal adventures involving danger to life, though in this respect he is not an exception to all mountaineers and hunters who early engaged in the fur trade and faced the perils of an unknown wilderness. End of Prefaces Recording by 
Gary Ullman, West Palm Beach, Florida. Chapter One of the Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter One Birthplace and Childhood. Removal to St. Louis. I was born in Fredericksburg, Virginia, on the 26th of April, 1798. My father's family consisted of 13 children, 7 sons, and 6 daughters. I was the third child, having one sister and one brother older than myself. My father had been an officer in the Revolutionary War and had held a major commission. He served throughout the glorious struggle, which raised the dignity of man and taught him to be free. I well recollect, when a small boy, the frequent meeting of the old patriots at my father's house, who would sit down and relate the different battles in which they had taken part during those days that tried men's souls. According to the custom of those days, their meetings were occasionally enlivened with some good old peach brandy, the same kind, I presume, as that with which the old Tory treated MacDonald when he delivered his splendid charger, Salim, to him for presentation to Colonel Tarleton, which circumstance was very frequently spoken of by the old soldiers. Often during these reminiscences, every eye would dim and tears course down the cheeks of the old veterans as they thus fought their battles o'er again and recalled their sufferings during the struggles they had passed through. My youthful mind was vividly impressed with the stirring scenes depicted by these old soldiers, but time and subsequent hardship had obliterated most of their narratives from my memory. One incident I recollect, however, related by my father when he formed one of a storming party in the attack on Stony Point made under General Wayne. When I was but about seven or eight years of age, my father removed to St. Louis, Missouri, taking with him all his family and 22 Negroes. He selected a section of land between the forks of the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers, 12 miles below St. Charles, which is to this day known as Beckworth's Settlement. At this early period of our history, 1805 to 6, the whole region of country around was a howling wilderness, inhabited only by wild beasts and merciless savages. St. Louis at that time was but a small town, its inhabitants consisting almost wholly of French and Spanish settlers who were engaged in trafficking with the Indians. The commodities of civilization such as fire water, beads, blankets, arms, ammunition, etc., for peltry. For protection against the Indians, who were at that time very troublesome and treacherous, it became necessary for the whites to construct blockhouses at convenient distances. These blockhouses were built by the united exertions of the settlers who began to gather from all quarters since the Jefferson Purchase had been effected from the French government. The settlers or inhabitants of four adjoining sections would unite and build a blockhouse in the center of their possessions so that in case of alarm they could all repair to it as a place of refuge from the savages. It was necessary to keep a constant guard on the plantations, and while one portion of the men were at work, the others with their arms. Side note, ardent spirits in Chippewa, Shinja Wanuba, in all Red Indian languages, it is so called as well as in Gypsy, CGL, with their arms were on the alert watching the wily Indians. These days are still fresh in my memory, and it was then that I received, young as I was, the rudiments of my knowledge of the Indian character, which had been of such inestimable value to me in my subsequent adventures among them. 
There were constant alarms in the neighborhood of some of the blockhouses, and hardly a day passed without the inhabitants being compelled to seek them for protection. As an illustration of our mode of life, I will relate an incident that befell me when about nine years old. One day my father called me to him and inquired of me whether I thought myself man enough to carry a sack of corn to the mill. The idea of riding a horse and visiting town possessed attractions which I could not resist, and I replied with a hearty affirmative. A sack of corn was accordingly deposited on the back of a gentle horse selected for the purpose, and young Jim, as I was called, was placed upon the sack and started for the mill two miles distant. About midway to the mill lived a neighbor having a large family of children with whom I frequently joined in boyish sports. On my way, I rode joyously up to the little fence which was separating the house from the road, thinking to pass a word with my little playmates. What was my horror at discovering that all the children, eight in number, from one to fourteen years of age, lying in various positions in the dooryard with their throats cut, their scalps torn off, and the warm lifeblood still oozing from their gaping wounds. In the doorway lay their father and near him their mother in the same condition. They had all shared the same fate. I found myself soon back in my father's house, but without the sack of corn. How I managed to get it off I never discovered, and related the circumstance to my father. He immediately gave the alarm throughout the settlement, and a body of men started in pursuit of the savages who had perpetuated this fearful tragedy. My father, with ten of his own men, accompanied them. In two days, the band returned, bringing with them eighteen Indian scalps, for the backwoodsmen fought the savage in Indian style, and it was scalp for scalp between them. The day when I beheld the harrowing spectacle of my little murdered playmates, it's still as fresh in my memory as at the time of its occurrence, and it will never fade from my mind. It was the first scene of Indian cruelty my young eyes had ever witnessed, and I wondered how even savages could possess such relentless minds as to wish to bathe their hands in the blood of little innocents against whom they could have no cause of quarrel. But my subsequent experience has better acquainted me with the Indian character, as the reader will learn in the course of the following pages. I also recollect a large body of Indians assembling in their war costume on the opposite side of the Mississippi River in what is now the state of Illinois. This was at Portage de Sioux, 25 miles above St. Louis, about two miles from my father's house, and their attention was to cut off all the white inhabitants of the surrounding country. The alarm was given, a large party of the settlers collected, crossed the river, and after severe engagement, defeated the Indians with great loss and frustrated their bloody purpose. Three days after this battle, a woman came into the settlement who had been three years captive among the Indians. She had made her escape during the confusion attending their defeat and reached her friends in safety after they had long supposed her dead. The name of this woman I do not remember, but I have no doubt there are old settlers in that region who yet recollect the circumstance and the general rejoicing with which her escape was celebrated. The news that she brought was of the most alarming nature. She related how several of the Indian tribes had held a grand council and resolved upon a general attack upon St. Louis and all the surrounding country with the view to butcher indiscriminately all the white inhabitants, French and Spanish excepted. This intelligence produced the greatest alarm among the inhabitants, and every preparation was made to repel the attack. New blockhouses were erected, old ones repaired, 
and everything placed in the best posture for defense. The Indians soon after appeared in great force opposite St. Louis. Blondo, an interpreter, was dispatched across the river to them to inform them of the preparations made for their reception. He informed them of the intelligence communicated by the woman fugitive from the camp and represented to them that the people of St. Louis were provided with numerous big guns mounted on wagons, which in case of attack could not fail to annihilate all their warriors. They credited Blondo's tale and withdrew their forces. At the period of which I speak, the major part of the inhabitants of St. Louis were French and Spanish. These were on friendly terms with all the Indian tribes and wished to confine their long-established traffic with the red man to themselves. For this reason, they discountenanced the settlement of Americans among them, as they considered it an invasion of their monopoly of the traffic with the Indians, and St. Louis being the grand trading depot for the regions of the west and northwest, the profits derived from the intercourse were immense. The Indians, too, thinking themselves better dealt with by the French and Spanish, united with the latter in their hostility to the influx of the Americans. When about ten years of age, I was sent to St. Louis to attend school, where I continued until the year 1812. I was then apprenticed to a man in St. Louis named George Kasner to learn the trade of blacksmith. This man had a partner named John L. Sutton, who was yet a resident in St. Louis. I took to the trade with some unwillingness at first, but became reconciled to it. I was soon much pleased with my occupation. When I had attained my nineteenth year, my sense of importance had considerably expanded, and like many others of my age, I felt myself already quite a man. Among other indiscretions, I became enamored of a young damsel, which, leading me into habits that my boss disapproved of, resulted finally in a difficulty between us. Being frequently tempted to transgress my boss's rules by staying from home somewhat late of an evening and finding the company I spent my time with so irresistibly attractive that I could not bring myself to obedience to orders, I gave way to my passion and felt indifferent whether my proceedings gave satisfaction or otherwise. One morning I was assailed by my principal in language which I considered unduly harsh and insulting, and on his threatening to dismiss me his house, I was tempted to reply with some warmth and acknowledge that his doing so would exactly square with my wishes. Provoked at this, he seized a hammer and flung it at me. I dodged the missile threw it back at him in return. I scuffled then ensued, in which I, being young and athletic, came off master of the ground, and accepting his polite dismissal, walked straight to my boarding house. But a few moments elapsed before my assailants walked in and forbade my landlady to entertain me further on his account. I replied that I had plenty of money and was competent to pay my own board. This provoked him to a second attack in which he again came off worsted. Hereupon, resolving to leave the house, I began to prepare for my departure. But before I had completed my preparations, a one-armed constable presented himself at the stairs and demanded to see me. Well knowing his errand, I took a well-loaded pistol in my hand and went to meet him, assuring him that if he ascended the steps to capture me, I would shoot him dead. In my exasperated state of mind, I really believe I should have executed my threat. The constable, perceiving my resolute bearing, after parleying a while, went away, feeling confident that he had gone for another officer who I feared might capture me. I 
expedited my departure and taking refuge in the house of a friend concealed myself for three days then shipped on board a keelboat proceeding to the mines on fever river but i was discovered by my boss and detained he holding himself responsible for my appearance until my father's decision was learned accordingly i went home to my father and related the difficulty i had recently had with my master he counseled me to return to my apprenticeship but i declared my determination never to be reconciled again my father then wished me to set up in business in his settlement but i expressed disinclination and declared a growing wish to travel seeing my determination my father finally consented to my departure he admonished me with some wholesome precepts gave me five hundred dollars in cash together with a good horse saddle and bridle and bade me god speed upon my journey bidding adieu to all my friends i proceeded to the boat and went on board the object for which the boat was dispatched up the fever river was to make a treaty with the sac indians to gain their consent to our working the mines at that time in their possession the expedition was strictly of a specific character and was led by colonel r m johnson a brother of the colonel's accompanied us and several other gentlemen went in the boat as passengers end of chapter one Recording by Gary Ullman, West Palm Beach, Florida. Chapter 2 of The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Expedition to the Mines. Am Hunter to the Party. First trip to New Orleans. Sick with yellow fever. Return home. First trip to the Great West. The expedition consisted of from six to eight boats, carrying probably about 100 men. The party in our boat numbered some eight or ten men, among whom were Colonel Johnson, his son Darwin Johnson, Messrs. January, Sims, Kennerly and others whose names have escaped me. I engaged in the capacity of hunter to the party. We pushed off, and after a slow and tedious trip of about twenty days, arrived at our place of destination, Galena of the present day. We found Indians in great numbers awaiting our disembarkation who were already acquainted with the objects of our expedition. The two tribes, Sacks and Foxes, received us peaceably, but being all armed, they presented a very formidable appearance. There was a considerable force of United States troops quartered in that region, under the command of Colonel Morgan, stationed in detachments at Prairie du Chien, Rock Island, St. Peter's, and Des Moines. After nine days parleying, a treaty was effected with them and ratified with the signatures of the contracting parties. On the part of the Indians, it was signed by Black Thunder, Yellow, Blank, and Keokuk, father of the Keokuk, who figured in the Black Hawk War. On the part of the United States, Colonel Morgan and Johnson attached their signatures. This negotiation concluded the mines were then first opened for civilized enterprise. During the settlement of the preliminaries of the treaty, there was great difficulty with the Indians, and it was necessary for each man of our party to be on his guard against any hostile attempts of the former who were all armed to the teeth. On the distribution of presents which followed the conclusion of the treaty, consisting of casks of whiskey, guns, gunpowder, knives, blankets, etc., there was a general time of rejoicing. Powwows, drinking, and dancing diversified the time, and a few fights were indulged in as a sequel to the entertainment. 
The Indians soon became very friendly to me, and I was indebted to them for showing me their choicest hunting grounds. There were an abundance of game, including deer, bears, wild turkeys, raccoons, and numerous other wild animals. Frequently they would accompany me on my excursions, which always proved eminently successful, thus affording me an opportunity of increasing my personal knowledge of the Indian character. I have lived among Indians in the eastern and western states, on the Rocky Mountains and in California. I find their habits of living, their religious beliefs, substantially uniform through all the unmingled races. All believe in the Great Spirit. All have their prophets, their medicine men, and their soothsayers, and are alike influenced by the appearance of omens, thus leading to the belief that the original tribes throughout the entire continent from Florida to the most northern coast have sprung from one stock and still retain in some degree of purity the social constitution of their primitive founders. I remained in that region for a space of 18 months, occupying my leisure time by working in the mines. During this time I accumulated $700 in cash, and feeling myself to be quite a wealthy personage, I determined upon a return home. My visit paid, I felt a disposition to roam further and took passage in the steamboat Calhoun, Captain Glover about to descend the river to New Orleans. My stay in New Orleans lasted ten days, during which time I was sick with the yellow fever, which I contracted on the way from Natchez to New Orleans. It was midsummer, and I sought to return home heartily regretting I had ever visited this unwholesome place. As my sickness abated, I lost no time in making my way back, and remained under my father's roof until I had in some measure recruited my forces. Being possessed with a strong desire to see the celebrated Rocky Mountains and the great western wilderness so much talked about, I engaged in General Ashley's Rocky Mountain Fur Company, the company consisted of 29 men who were employed by the fur company as hunters and trappers. We started on the 11th of October with horses and pack mules. Nothing of interest occurred until we approached the village situated on the Kansas River when we came to a halt and encamped. Here it was found that the company was in need of horses and General Ashley wished for two men to volunteer to proceed to the Republican Pawnees, distant 300 miles, where he declared we could obtain a supply. There was, in our party, an old and experienced mountaineer named Moses Harris, in whom the general reposed the strictest confidence for his knowledge of the country and his familiarity with Indian life. This Harris was reputed to be a man of great leg, and capable from his long sojourning in the mountains of enduring extreme privation and fatigue. There seemed to be a great reluctance on the part of the men to undertake in such company so hazardous a journey, for it was now winter. It was also whispered in the camp that whoever gave out in an expedition with Harris received no succor from him, but was abandoned to his fate in the wilderness. Our leader, seeing this general unwillingness, desired me to perform the journey with Harris. Being young and feeling ambitious to distinguish myself in some important trust, I asked leave to have a word with Harris before I decided. Harris being called, the following colloquy took place. Harris, I think of accompanying you on this trip. Very well, Jim, he replied, scrutinizing me closely. Do you think you can stand it? I don't know, I answered, but I am going to try. I.e., a great traveler, able to go a great distance in a day. But I wish you to hear one thing in mind. If I should give out on the road, and you offer to leave me to perish, as you have the name of doing, if I have strength to raise my rifle, I shall certainly bring you to a halt. 
Harris looked me full in the eye while he replied, Jim, you may proceed me the entire way and take your own jog. If I direct the pass and give you the lead, it will be your own fault if you tire out. That satisfies me, I replied. We'll be off in the morning. The following morning we prepared for departure. Each man loaded himself with 25 pounds of provisions, besides a blanket, rifle, and ammunition each. We started on our journey. After a march of about 30 miles, I in advance, my companion bringing up the rear, Harris complained of fatigue. We halted and Harris sat down while I built a large cheerful fire, for the atmosphere was quite cold. We made coffee and partook of a hearty supper, lightening our packs, as we supposed, for the following day. But while I was bringing in wood to build up the fire, I saw Harris seize his rifle in great haste, and the next moment bring down a fat turkey from a tree a few rods from camp, immediately reloading, for old mountaineers never suffer their guns to remain empty for one moment. While I was yet rebuilding the fire, Crack won his rifle again, and down came a second turkey, so large and fat that he burst in, striking the ground. We were thus secured for our next morning's meal. After we had refreshed ourselves with a hearty supper, my companion proposed that we should kill each a turkey to take with us for our next day's provisions. This we both succeeded in doing, and then, having dressed the four turkeys, we folded ourselves in our blankets and enjoyed a sound night's rest. The following morning we breakfasted off the choicest portions of two of the turkeys and abandoned the remainder to the wolves, who had been all night prowling round the camp for prey. We started forward as early as possible and advanced that day about forty miles. My companion again complained of fatigue and rested while I made a fire, procured water, and performed all the culinary work. The selected portions of last evening's turkeys with the addition of bread and coffee supplied us with supper and breakfast. After a travel of ten days, we arrived at the Republican Pawnee Villages, when what was our consternation and dismay to find the place was entirely deserted. They had removed to their winter quarters. We were entirely out of provisions, having expected to find abundance at the lodges. We searched diligently for their caches, places where provisions are secured, but failed in discovering any. Our only alternative was to look for game, which, so near to an Indian settlement, we were satisfied must be scarce. I would break my narrative for a while to afford some explanation in regard to the different bands of Pawnee tribe, a subject which at the present day is but imperfectly understood by the general reader the knowledge being confined to those alone who, by living among them, have learned their language and hence become acquainted with the nature of their divisional land. The reader perhaps has remarked that I related we were on a visit to Republican Pawnee villages. This is a band of the Pawnee tribe of the Indians, which is thus divided. The Grand Pawnee Band, the Republican Pawnee Band, the Pawnee Loops or Wolf Pawnees, the Pawnee Picks, or Tattooed Pawnees, and the Black Pawnees. The five bands constitute the entire tribe. Each band is independent and under its own chief, but for mutual defense or in other cases of urgent necessity, they unite into one body. They occupy an immense extent of country, stretching from beyond the Platte River to the south of the Arkansas and at the time I speak of, could raise from 30,000 to 40,000 warriors. Like all other Indian tribes, they have dwindled away from various causes, the smallpox and war having carried them off by the thousands. Some of the bands have been reduced to one half by this fatal disease. In many instances, introduced 
designedly among them by their civilized brethren a disease more particularly fatal to the indians from their ignorance of any suitable remedy their invariable treatment for all ailments being a cold water immersion it is not surprising that they are eminently unsuccessful in their treatment of smallpox horse stealing practiced by one band upon the other leads to exterminating feuds and frequent engagements wherein great numbers are mutually slain the following interesting episode i had from the lips of the interpreter some thirty-two years ago during monroe's administration a powerful indian named tuax chief counselor of the pawnee loop band went to pay his great father the president a visit he was over six feet high and well proportioned athletic build and as straight as an arrow he was delegated to washington by his tribe to make a treaty with his great father being introduced his father made known to him through the interpreter the substance of his proposal the keen-witted indian perceiving that the proposed treaty talked all turkey to the white man and all crow to his tribe sat patiently waiting the reading of the paper the reading finished he rose with all his native dignity and in that vein of true indian eloquence in which he was unsuppressed declared that the treaty had been conceived in injustice and brought forth in duplicity that many treaties had been signed by indians of their great father's concoction wherein they bartered away the graves of their fathers for a few worthless trinkets and afterwards their hearts cried at their folly that such indians were fools and women he expressed his free opinion of the great father and all his white children and concluded by declaring that he would sign no paper which would make his own breast or those of his people to sorrow accordingly two acts broke up the council abruptly and returned to his home without making any treaty with his father side mark it is a curious coincidence that in new zealand and other pacific islands the natives died by thousands from plunging into cold water when attacked by the small plucks. c g leland this expression to talk turkey i e to one's own profit also in the purpose is said to have originated as follows a white man and an indian went hunting together having agreed to share the game at the end of the day there were two crows and a wild turkey in a bag the white man as the lion made the division here he said to the indian is a crow for you then a turkey for me then a crow for you to which the indian replied me no like that you talk all turkey for you and all crow for me c j leland end of chapter two recording by gary ullman west palm beach florida chapter three of the life and adventures of james p beckworth by thomas d bonner this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gary Ullman. chapter three return from the deserted pawnee villages suffering on the way prospects of starvation fall in with the indians most opportunely safe arrival at eli's trading post at the mouth of the kansas my companions and myself took counsel together how to proceed our determination was to make the best of our way to the grand nemaha river one of the tributaries of the missouri we arrived at that river after nine days travel being with the exception of a little coffee and sugar entirely without provisions my companion was worn out and seemed almost disheartened i was young and did not feel much the worse for the journey although i experienced a vehement craving for food 
Arrived at the river, I left Harris by a good fire, and taking my rifle, went in quest of game, not caring what kind I met. As fortune would have it, I came across an elk, and my rifle soon sent a leaden messenger after him. We encamped near him, promising ourselves a feast. He was exceedingly poor, however, and hungry as we were. We made a very unsavory supper of his flesh. The next morning we continued our journey down the Nimaha, traveling on for five days after I had killed the elk without tasting food. The elk had been so rank that we carried no part of him with us, trusting to find some little gabe in which we were disappointed. We had thrown away our blankets to relieve ourselves of every burden that would impede our progress, which, with all, was extremely slow. On the fifth day we struck a large Indian trail which bore evident marks of being fresh. My companion now gave entirely up and threw himself to the ground, declaring he could go no further. He pronounced our position to be thirty miles from the trading post. I endeavored to arouse him to get up and proceed onward, but he could only advance a few rods at a time. I felt myself becoming weak. Still, I had faith that I could reach Eli's. If I had no hindrance, if I lingered for Harris, I saw we should both inevitably perish. He positively declared he could advance not a step further. He could scarcely put one foot before the other, and I saw he was becoming bewildered. In the dilemma, I said to him, Harris, we must both perish if we stay here. If I make the best of my way along the trail, I believe I can reach Eli sometime in the night, for I was aware that the Indians, whose trail we were following, were proceeding thither with their peltry. But Harris would not listen to it. Oh, Jimmy explained, don't leave me. Don't leave me here to die. For God's sake, stay with me. I did my best to encourage him to proceed. I assisted him to rise, and we again proceeded upon our journey. I saw by the progress we were making we should never get on, so I told him if I had to advance and leave him to throw himself on the trail and await my return on the following day with a good horse to carry him to the trading post. We walked on. I a hundred yards in advance, but I became convinced that if I did not use my remaining strength in getting to Eli's, we should both be lost. Accordingly, summoning all my forces, I doubled my speed, determined to reach the post before I stopped. I had not proceeded half a mile ere I heard the report of two rifles, and looking in the direction of the sound, I saw two Indians approaching with demonstrations of friendship. On reaching me, one of them explained, You are dead. You no live. I explained to him that I had left my companion behind, and they were both nearly starved to death. On this, they spoke a few words to each other in their own language, and one started off like a racehorse along the trail, while the other returned with me to my companion. As we approached him, I can hear him moaning, Ho, oh, Jim, come back, come back, don't leave me. We went up to him, and I informed him that we were safe, that I had met the Indians, and we should soon be relieved. After waiting about three hours, the rattling of hoofs was heard, and looking up, we discovered a troop of Indians approaching at full speed. In another moment, they were by our side. They brought with them a portion of light food, consisting of cornmeal made into a kind of gruel, of which they would give us but a small spoonful at short intervals. When Harris was sufficiently restored to mount a horse, with the assistance of the Indians, we all started forward for the post. It appeared that the two Indians whom I had so fortunately encountered had lingered behind the main party to amuse themselves with target shooting with their rifles. The one that started along the trail overtook the main body at a short distance, and making our case known to them, induced them to return to our succor. We encamped with them that night, and they continued the same regimen of small periodic doses of gruel. 
several times a large indian grabbed hold of an arm of each of us and forced us into a run until our strength was utterly exhausted others of the party would then support us on each side and urge us on till their own strength failed them after this discipline a spoonful or two of gruel would be administered to us this exercise being repeated several times they at length placed before us a large disc containing venison bear meat and turkey with the invitation to eat all we wanted it is unnecessary to say that i partook of such a meal as i never remembered to have eaten before or since early the next day we arrived at the trading post of eli and curtis situated on the missouri river near the mouth of the kansas as i entered the house i heard someone exclaim here comes jim beckworth with black harris the name he went by where he was known eli sprang up to welcome us sure enough he said it is they but they look like corpses another voice exclaimed hello jim what is the matter with you is it yourselves or only your ghosts come along and take some brandy anyway living or dead you must be dry we accepted the invitation and took each a glass which in our greatly reduced state quite overpowered us left to my reflections i resolved that if i survived my present dangers i would return to civilized life the extremities i had been reduced to had so moderated my resentments that had i encountered my former boss i should certainly have extended my hand to him with ready forgiveness the indians we had so opportunely fallen in with belonged to the kansas band of the osage tribe and were on the way as we had surmised to dispose of their goods at the trading post their wares consisted principally of peltry obtained by their sagacity in trapping and their skill in hunting the wild animals of the plains in purchasing their skins of them messrs eli and curtis rewarded the indians very liberally with government stores for the humanity in succoring us while exhausted and as an encouragement to relieve others whom they might chance to find similarly distressed after thoroughly recruiting at the trading post where i received every attention from messrs eli and curtis i started for st louis on my arrival at g Shockton's trading post i calculated the intervening distance to st louis and abandoned my intention of proceeding thither delaying my return till the spring when the ice would break up in the missouri mr chowto engaged me to insist in packing peltries during the winter and twenty five dollars per month when the river was free from ice i took passage in a st louis boat and after a quick run arrived safe in the city early in the evening of the fifth day shortly after my arrival i fell in with general ashley who had returned to the city for more men the general was greatly surprised to see me he having concluded that my fate had been the same with hundreds of others engaged to four companies who had perished with cold and starvation the general informed me that he had engaged one hundred and twenty men who were already on their road to the mountains he declared that i was just the man he was in search of to ride after and overtake the men and accompany them to the mountains and added that i must start the next morning my feelings were somewhat similar to those of a young sailor on his return from his first voyage to sea i had achieved one trip to the wild west and had returned safe and now i was desirous of spending a long interval with my father i suffered the arguments of the old general to prevail over me however and i re-engaged to him with the promise to start on the following morning this afforded me short time to visit my friends to whom i had just paid a flying visit and returned to the city in the morning after attending 
to the general's instructions and receiving eight hundred dollars in gold to carry to mr fitzpatrick an agent of general ashley then stationed in the mountains i mounted a good horse and put on in pursuit of the party who were five or six days journey in advance i may here remark that the general had been recently married and feeling some reluctance to tear himself away from the delights of hymen he sent me on for the performance of his duties the general followed after in about a week and overtook the party at franklin on the missouri it was early may when i commenced my journey unfolding nature presented so many charms that my previous sufferings were obliterated from my mind the trees were clothing themselves with freshest verdure flowers were unveiling their beauties on every side and birds were carolling their sweetest songs from every bough these sights and sounds struck more pleasantly upon my senses than the howl of the wolf and the scream of the panther which assailed our ears in the forests and prairies of the wild west after being joined by our general we proceeded up the missouri to council bluffs and thence struck out for the platte country soon after our arrival on the platte we had the great misfortune to lose nearly all our horses amounting to about two hundred head stolen from us by the indians we followed our trail for some time but deeming it useless to follow mountain indians while we were on foot our general gave up the pursuit we could not ascertain what tribe the robbers belonged to but i have since been convinced that they were either ayatans or arapahoes our general then gave orders to return to the missouri and purchase all the horses we needed while he returned to st louis to transact some affairs of business and possibly play his devotions to his very estimable lady we succeeded in obtaining a supply of horses after retracing about two hundred miles of our journey paying for them with drafts upon general ashley in st louis we then again returned to our camp in the platte this adventure occupied nearly the whole summer and we guarded against the repetition of the misfortune by strictly watching the horses day and night while a portion of the company was engaged in making purchase of our second supply of horses and the other portion remained on the ground to hunt and track and gather together a supply of provisions for our consumption they met with excellent success and caught a great number of beavers and otters together with a quantity of game general ashley rejoined us in september and by his orders fitzpatrick and a robert campbell proceeded to the loop fork taking with them all the men except eight who remained behind with the general to ascend the platte in quest of the company he left there the preceding winter from which harris and myself had been detached on our expedition to the pony camp after several days travel we found the company we were seeking they were all well had been successful in trapping had made some good trades with straggling parties of indians in the exchange of goods for peltry they had fared rather hard a part of the time as game which was their sole dependence was often difficult to obtain i should here mention that we found harris in the course of our second trip who rejoined our company well and hearty fur companions in those days had to depend upon their rifles for a supply of food no company could possibly carry provisions sufficient to last beyond the most remote white settlements our food therefore consisted of deer wild turkeys which were found in great abundance bear meat and even in times of scarcity dead horses occasionally a little flour sugar and coffee might last over the mountains but those who held these articles asked exorbitant prices for them and it was but few who tasted such luxuries we were now in the buffalo country but the indians had driven them all away 
Before we left the settlements, our party made free use of the beehives, pigs, and poultry belonging to the settlers, a marauding practice commonly indulged in by the mountaineers, who well knew that the strength of their party secured them against any retaliation on the part of the sufferers. There were two Spaniards in our company, whom we one morning left behind us to catch some horses which had strayed from the camp. These two men stopped at a house inhabited by a respectable white woman, and they, seeing her without protection, committed a disgraceful assault upon her person. They were pursued to the camp by a number of settlers who made known the outrage committed upon the woman. We all regarded the crime with the utmost abhorrence and felt mortified that any one of our party should be guilty of conduct so revolting. The culprits were arrested and they at once admitted their guilt. A council was called in the presence of the settlers and the culprits offered their choices of two punishments, either to be hung to the nearest tree or to receive one hundred lasses each on the bare back. They chose the latter punishment, which was immediately inflicted upon them by four of our party. Having no cat or nine tails in our possession, the lashes were inflicted with hickory rites. Their backs were dreadfully lacerated, and the blood flowed in streams to the ground. The following morning, the two Spaniards and two of our best horses were missing from the camp. We did not pursue them, but by the tracks we discovered of them, it was evident they had started for New Mexico. End of chapter 3 Recording by Gary Ullman Chapter 4 of The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recordings by Gary Oldman. Chapter 4 Severe Sufferings in the Camp, Grand Island, Platte River, Up the South Fork of the Platte, The Dog, the Wolf, and the First Buffalo. On our arrival at the upper camp, related in the preceding chapter, we found the men, 26 in number, reduced to short rations, in weekly condition, and in a discouraged state of mind. They had been expecting the arrival of a large company with abundant supplies, and when we rejoined them, without any provisions, they were greatly disappointed. General Ashley exerted himself to infuse fresh courage into their disconsolate breast, well knowing himself, however, that unless we could find game, the chances were hard against us. We remained in camp three or four days until we were well refreshed and then deliberated upon our next proceeding. Knowing there must be game further up the river, we moved forward. Our allowance was half a pint of flour a day per man, which we made into a kind of a gruel. If we happened to kill a duck or a goose, it was shared as fairly as possible. I recalled to mind the incidents of our Pawnee expedition. The third evening we made a halt for a few days. We had seen no gain worth it charge of powder during our whole march and our rations were confined to the half pint of flour per day we numbered thirty-four men all told and a duller encampment i suppose never was witnessed no jokes no fireside stories no fun each man rose in the morning with the gloom of the preceding night filling his mind we built our fires and partook of our scanty repast without saying a word at last our general gave orders for the best hunters to sally out and try their fortune i seized my rifle and issued from the camp alone feeling so reduced in strength that my mind involuntarily reverted to the extremity i had been reduced to with harris about three hundred yards from camp i saw two teal ducks i leveled my rifle and handsomely decapitated one this was a 
temptation to my constancy and appetite and consciousness had a long strife as to the disposal of the booty. I reflected that it would be but an inconsiderable trifle in my mess of four hungry men, while to roast and eat him myself would give me strength to hunt for more. A strong inward feeling remonstrated against such an invasion of the rights of my starving messmates. But if by fortifying myself i gained the ability to procure something more substantial than a teal duck my dereliction would be sufficiently atoned and my overruling appetite at the same time gratified had i admitted my messmates to the argument they might possibly have carried it adversely but i received the conclusion as valid so roasting him without ceremony in the bushes i devoured the duck alone and felt gravely invigorated with the meal passing up the stream i pushed forward to fulfil my obligation at the distance of about a mile from camp i came across a narrow deer trail through some rushes and directly across the trail with only the centre of his body visible his two extremes being hidden by the rushes not more than fifty yards distant i saw a fine large buck standing i did not wait for a nearer shot i fired and broke his back i dispatched him by drawing my knife across his throat and having partially dressed him hung him on a tree close by proceeding onward i met a large white wolf attracted probably by the scent of the deer. I shot him, and depriving him of his meal, devoted him for a repast to the camp. Before I returned, I succeeded in killing three good-sized elk, which added to the former, afforded a pretty good display of meat. I then returned near enough to the camp to signal to them to come to my assistance. They had heard the reports of my rifle, and knowing that I would not waste ammunition, had been expecting to see me return with the game. All who were able turned out to my summons, and when they saw the booty awaiting them, their faces were irradiated with joy. Each man shouldered his load, but there was not one capable of carrying the weight of forty pounds. The game being all brought into camp, the fame of Jim Beckworth was celebrated by all tongues. Amid all this gratulation, I could not separate my thoughts from the duck, which has supplied my clandestine meal in the bushes. I suffered them to appease their hunger with the proceeds of my toil before I ventured to tell my comrades of the offense I had been guilty of. All justified my conduct, declaring my conclusions obvious. As it turned out, my proceeding was right enough, but if I had failed to meet with any game, I had been guilty of an offense which would ever after have haunted me. At this present time, I never kill a duck on my ranch, and there are thousands of teal duck there. But I think of my feast in the bushes while my companions were famishing in the camp. Since that time, I have never refused to share my last shilling, my last biscuit, or my last blanket with a friend, and I think the recollection of that temptation in the wilderness will ever serve as a lesson to more constancy in the future. The day following, we started forward up the river, and after progressing some four or five miles, came in sight of plenty of deer sign. The general ordered a halt and directed all hunters out as before we sallied out in different directions our general who was a good hunter forming one of the number at a short distance from camp i discovered a large buck passing slowly between myself and the camp at about pistol shot distance as i happened to be standing against a tree he had not seen me i fired the ball passed through his body and whizzed past the camp. Leaving him, I encountered a second deer within three quarters of a mile. I shot him and hung him on a limb. Encouraged with my success, I climbed the tree to get a fairer view of the ground. Looking round from my elevated position, I perceived some large, dark-colored animals grazing on the side of a hill. 
some mile and a half distant. I was determined to have a shot at him, whatever he might be. I knew meat was in demand, and that fellow, well stored, was worth more than a thousand teal ducks. I therefore approached with the greatest precaution to within the fair rifle shot distance, scrutinizing him very closely, and still unable to make out what he was. I could see no horns, and if he was a bear, I thought him an enormous one. I took sight of him over my faithful rifle, which had never failed me, and then set it down to contemplate the huge animal still further. Finally, I resolved to let fly. Taking good aim, I pulled trigger. The rifle cracked, and I then made rapid retreat towards camp. After running about 200 yards and hearing nothing in movement behind me, I ventured to look round, and to my great joy, I saw the animal had fallen. Continuing my course on to the camp, I encountered the general, who, perceiving blood on my hands, addressed me. Have you shot anything, Jim? I replied, yes, sir. What have you shot? Two deer and something else, I answered. And what is the something else, he inquired. I do not know, sir. What did he look like? The general interrogated. Had he horns? I saw no horns, sir. What color was the animal? You can see him, general, I replied, by climbing yonder tree. The general ascended the tree accordingly, and looking through his spy glass, which he always carried, he exclaimed, A buffalo by heavens! And, coming nimbly down the tree, he gave orders for us to take a couple of horses and go and dress the buffalo and bring him into camp. I suggested that two horses could not carry the load. Six were therefore dispatched, and they all came back well packed with his remains. There was great rejoicing throughout the camp at such bountiful provision, and all fears of starvation were removed, at least for the present. The two deer were also brought in, besides a fine one killed by the general, and ducks, geese, and such like were freely added by other hunters who had taken a wider circuit. It appears strange that although I had traveled hundreds of miles in the buffalo country, this one was the first that I ever seen. The conviction weighing upon my mind that it was a huge bear I was approaching had so excited me that, although within fair gunshot, I actually could not see his horns. The general and my companions had many a hearty laugh at my expense, he often expressing wonder that my keen eye could not, when close to the animal, perceive the horns, while he could see them plainly nearly two miles distant. A severe storm setting in about this time, had it not been for our excellent store of provisions, we should most probably have perished of starvation. There was no game to be procured, and our horses were beginning to die from want of nourishment. We remained in this camp until our provisions were all expended, and our only resource was the flesh of the horses which died of starvation and exposure to the storm. It was not such nutritious food as our fat buffalo and venison, but in our present circumstances it relished tolerably well. Were General Ashley now living, he would recollect the hardships and delights we experienced in this expedition. When the storm was expended, we moved up the river, hoping to fall in with game. We unfortunately found but little on our course. When we had advanced some twenty miles, we halted. Our position looked threatening. It was midwinter, and everything around us bore a gloomy aspect. We were without provisions, and we saw no means of obtaining any. At this crisis, six or seven Indians of the Pawnee Loop Band came into the camp. Knowing them to be friendly, we were overjoyed to see them. They informed our interpreter that their village was only four miles distant, which at once accounted for the absence of game. They invited us to their lodges where they could supply us with everything that we needed. But on our representing to them our scarcity of horses 
and quantity of peltry we had no means of packing, they immediately started off to their village, our interpreter accompanying them, in quest of horses, and speedily returned with a sufficient number. Packing our effects, we accompanied them to the village. Two acts, of whom I have previously made mention, and a Spaniard named Antoni Bebelli, chief of the band, forming part of our escort. Arriving at their village, which we found well provided with everything we needed, the Indians gave us a hospitable reception and spread a feast, which, as they had promised, made all our hearts glad. Our horses, too, were well cared for and soon assumed a more rotund appearance. We purchased for our future use beans, pumpkins, corn, cured meat, besides some beaver skins, giving them in exchange a variety of manufactured goods used in the Indian trade, of which we had a great plenty. We replaced our lost horses by purchasing others in their stead, and now everything being ready for departure, our general intimated to Two Axe his wish to get on. Two Axe objected. My men are about to surround the buffalo, he said, and if you go now, you will frighten them. You must stay four days more, then you may go. His word was law, so we stayed accordingly. Within the four days appointed, they made the surround and killed 1,400 buffaloes. The tongues were counted by General Ashley himself, and thus I can guarantee the truth of the assertion. To the reader, unacquainted with the Indian mode of taking these animals, a concise description may not be uninteresting. There were probably engaged in this hunt from one to two thousand Indians, some mounted, some on foot. They encompassed a large space where the buffalo are contained, and closing in around them on all points, form a complete circle. Their circle at first enclosed may measure perhaps six miles in diameter, with an irregular circumference determined by the movement of the herd. When the surround is formed, the hunters radiate from the main body to the right and left until the ring is entire. The chief then gives the order to charge, which is communicated along the ring with the speed of lightning. Every man then rushes to the center, and the work of destruction is begun. The unhappy victims, finding themselves hammed in on every side, run this way and that in their mad efforts to escape. Finding all chance of escape impossible, and seeing their slaughtered fellows drop dead at their feet, they bellow with affright, and in the confusion that overwhelms them, lose all power of resistance. The slaughter generally lasts two or three hours, and seldom many get clear of the weapons of their assailants. The field over the surround presents the appearance of one vast slaughterhouse. He who has been most successful in the work of devastation is celebrated as a hero and receives the highest honors from the fair sex, while he who has been so unfortunate as not to kill a buffalo is jeered and ridiculed by the whole band. Flaying, dressing, and preserving the meat next engages their attention and affords them full employment for several weeks. The surround accomplished, we receive permission from 2X to take up our line of march. Accordingly, we started along the river and had only proceeded five miles from the village when we found that the Platte forked. Taking the South Fork, we journeyed on some six miles when we encamped. So we continued every day making slow progress, some days not advancing more than four or five miles until we had left the Pawnee villages 300 miles in our rear. We found plenty of buffalo along our route until we approached the Rocky Mountains, when the buffalo as well as all other game becomes scarce, and we had to resort to the beans and corn supplied to us by the Pawnees. End of chapter 4. Recording by Gary Ullman, West Palm Beach, Florida. Chapter 5 of 
The Life and Adventure of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Oldman. Chapter 5 Sufferings on the Platte. Arrive at the Rocky Mountains. Fall out with General Ashley. Horses again stolen by the Crow Indians. Sickness of our General. Rescue of the General from a Wounded Buffalo. Remarkable Rescue of the General from the Green River Suck. Not finding any game for a number of days, we again felt alarmed for our safety. The snow was deep on the ground, and our poor horses could obtain no food but the boughs and bark of the cottonwood trees. Still we pushed forward, seeking to advance as far as possible, in order to open a trade with the Indians, and occupy ourselves in trapping during the finish of the season. We were again put upon reduced rations, one pint of beans per day being the allowance to a mess of four men, with other articles in proportion. Here I had a serious difficulty with our general, which arose in the following manner. The general desired me to shoe his horse, which I cheerfully proceeded to do. I had finished setting three shoes, and had yet one nail to drive in the fourth. When about to drive the last nail, the horse, which had been very restless during the whole time, withdrew his foot from me. My patience became exhausted. I applied the hammer several times to his belly, which is the usual punishment inflicted by blacksmiths upon unruly horses. The general who was standing near flew into a violent rage and poured his curses thick and fast upon me. Feeling hurt at such language from the lips of a man whom I had treated like my own brother, I retorted, reminding him of the many obligations he owed me. I told him that his language to me was harsh and unmerited, and that I had thus far served him faithfully, and that I had done for him what no other man would do, periling my life for him on several occasions, that I had been successful in killing game when his men were in a state of starvation and warming at the recapitulation. I added, There is one more nail to drive, General, to finish shoeing that horse which you may drive for yourself or let go undriven, for I will see you dead before I will lift another finger to serve you. But little more was said on either side at that time. The next morning the general gave orders to pack up and move on. He showed me a worn-out horse, which he ordered me to pack and drive along. I very well knew that the horse could not travel far, even without a pack. Still influenced by the horse language, the general had addressed to me on the previous day. I said, General, I will pack the horse, but I wish you to understand that whenever he gives out, there I shall leave him horse and pack. Obey my orders and let me have none of your insolence, sir, said the general. I was satisfied this was imposed upon me for punishment. I, however, packed the horse with two pigs of lead and sundry small articles and drove him along in the rear, the others having started a considerable time previous. The poor animal struggled on for about a mile, and then fell groaning under his burden. I unpacked him, assisted him to rise, and repacking him, drove him on again in the trail that the others had left in the snow. Proceeding half a mile further, he fell again. I went through the same ceremony as before. He advanced a few yards, fell a third time. Feeling mad at the general for imposing such a task upon me, my hands tingling with cold through handling the snowy packed ropes, I seized my hammer from the pack and striking with all my power, it penetrated the poor animal's skull. There, said I, take that. I only wish you were General Ashley. You do, do you, said a voice from the bushes on the side of the trail. I well knew the voice. It was the general himself, and another volley of curses descended uninterruptedly upon my head. I was not the man to flinch. What I said I meant, I explained, and it makes no odds whether you heard it or not. You are an infernal scoundrel, and I'll shoot you. 
and suiting the action to the word he cocked his piece and levelled it i cocked my rifle and presented it also and then we stood at bay looking each other direct in the eyes general i at length said you have addressed language to me which i allow no man to use unless you retract that last epithet you and i must surely die he finally said i will acknowledge that it was language which never should be used to a man but when i am angry i am apt to speak hastily but he added i will make you suffer for this not in your service general i replied you can take your horse now and do what you please with him i am going to return to st louis your general almost smiled at the idea you will play going back to st louis he said when in truth you were afraid of being killed by the indians through being left too far behind with that old horse i left general horse and pack and started on to overtake the advanced party in order to get my saddlebags before leaving them approaching the party i advanced to fitzpatrick in whose possession they were and addressed him hold up fitzpatrick give me my saddlebags i am going to leave you and return to st louis what exclaimed he have you had more words with the general yes i replied words that will never be forgiven by me at least in this life i am bound to return well said he wait till we had camp a few hundred yards ahead your things are in the pack when we stop you can get them i accompanied them till they encamped then taking my goods from the pack i was getting ready to return when the general came up seeing me about to carry my threat into execution he addressed me jim you have ammunition belonging to me you cannot take that with you luckily i had plenty of my own so i delivered up all in my possession belonging to him sir i said as fortune has favored me with plenty i deliver up yours but if i had had none of my own i would have retained a portion of yours or died in the attempt and it seems to me that you must have a very small soul to see a man turned adrift without anything to protect him against hostile savages or procure him necessary food in traversing this wild wilderness he then said no more to me but called fitzpatrick and requested him to dissuade me from leaving fitzpatrick came and exerted all his eloquence to deter me from going telling me of the great distance before me the danger i ran when alone of being killed by indians representing the almost certain fact that i must perish from starvation he reminded me that it was now march and that the snows were already melting that spring with all its beauties would soon be ushered in and i should lose the sublime scenery of the rocky mountains but my mind was bent upon going all my former love for the man was forfeited and i felt i could never endure his presence again fitzpatrick's mission having failed the general sent a french boy to intercede toward whom i felt great attachment he was named baptiste la guanice and was about seventeen years of age i had many times protected this lad from the abuse of his countrymen and had fought several battles on his account for which reason he naturally fled to me for protection and had grown to regard me in the light of a father when this boy saw that i was in earnest about leaving fearing that all attempts at persuasion would be useless he hung his nether lip and appeared perfectly disconsolate the general calling this lad to him desired him to come to me and persuade me from the notion of leaving he pledged his word to baptiste that he would say no more to displease me and he would spare me no effort to accommodate me and offered me free use of his horses assigning as a reason for this concession that he was unwilling for word to reach the states that he had suffered a man to perish in the wilderness through a private difficulty in the camp at this moment la pointe presented himself manifesting by his appearance that he had something of importance to communicate general he said 
More than half the men are determined to leave with Beckworth. They are now taking ammunition from the sacks and hiding it about. What is to be done? I will do the best I can. Then, turning to the lad, he said, I took Jim's ammunition, thinking to deter him from going. Had he insisted upon going, I should have furnished him with plenty. Go now, he added, and tell him I want him to stay. But if he insists upon going, to take whatever he wants. Baptiste left the group which surrounded the general and made his way to me with his head inclined. Mon frere, said the lad, addressing me as I sat. The general talked much good. He want you stay. I tell him you no stay, dat you en colère. I tell him if mon frere go, by gar I go too. He says you go talk to Jim and get him to stay. I tell you vat I think. You stay little longer, and if the general talk you bad one time more, then we go by gar. You take one good horse. Me take one good horse too. We carry our planket. We take some viads and some poudre. Then we leave. We go now. We take nothing. Then we die. I knew that the boy gave good advice, and foregoing my former resolve, I concluded to remain. My decision was quickly communicated to the whole camp, and the hidden parcels of ammunition were restored to their proper places. The storm in the camp ceased, and all were ready to proceed. I have heard scores of emigrants, when stopping with me in my hermitage in Beckworth Valley, California, relate their hair-breadth escapes from Indians and various hardships endured in their passage across the plains. They would dwell upon their perilous nights when standing guard, their encounters with Indians or some daring exploit with a buffalo. These recitals were listened to with incredulous ears, for there is in human nature such a love of the marvelous that traditionary deeds by dint of repetition become appropriated to the narrator, and the tales that we related as actual experience now mislead the speaker and the audience. When I recurred to my own adventures, I would smile at the comparison of their suffering with what myself and other men of the mountains had really endured in former times. The forts that now afford protection to the traveler were built by ourselves at the constant peril of our lives amid indian tribes nearly double their present numbers without wives and children to comfort us on our lonely way without well-furnished wagons to resort to when hungry no roads before us but trails temporarily made our clothing consisting of the skins of the animals who had fallen before our unerring rifles, and often whole days on insufficient rations, or entirely without food. Occasionally our whole party on guard the entire night, and our strength deserting us through unceasing watching and fatigue. These are sufferings that made theirs appear trivial, and ours surpass in magnitude my power of relation. Without doubt, many immigrants was subject to considerable hardship during the early part of the emigration by the loss of cattle, and the Indians came in for their full share of blame. But it was through extreme carelessness that so many were lost, and those who have charged their losses upon the Indians have frequently found their stock, or a portion of it, harnessed to wagons either far in advance of them or lagging carelessly in the rear. The morality of the whites I have not found to exceed very much that of the red men, for there are plenty of the former belonging to trains on the routes who would not hesitate to take an axe or two if any chance offered for getting hold of them. But to return, at the time when I had concluded to proceed with the party, we were encamped in the prairie away from any stream, having passed the fork of the Platte and were again in starving condition. Except an occasional hare or rabbit, there was no sign of supplying ourselves with any kind of game. We traveled on till we arrived at Pilot but Butte. We traveled on till we arrived at Pilot Butte, where two misfortunes befell us. 
a great portion of our horses were stolen by the crow indians and general ashley was taken sick caused beyond doubt by exposure and insufficient fare our condition was growing worse and worse and as a measure best calculated to procure relief we all resolved to go on a general hunt and bring home something to supply our pressing necessities all who were able therefore started in different directions our customary mode of hunting i travelled as near as i could judge about ten miles from the camp and saw no sign of game i reached a high point of land and on taking a general survey i discovered a river which i had never seen in this region before it was of considerable size flowing four or five miles distant and on its banks i observed acres of land covered with moving masses of buffalo i hailed this as a perfect godsend and was overjoyed with the feeling of security infused by my opportune discovery however fatigued and weak i accelerated my return to the camp and communicated my success to my companions their faces brightened up at the intelligence and all were impatient to be at them the general on learning my intelligence desired us to move forward to the river with what horses we had left and each man to carry a pack on his back of the goods that remained after loading the cattle he further desired us to roll up snow to provide him with a shelter and to return the next day to see if he survived the men in their eagerness to get to the river which is now called green river loaded themselves so heavily that three or four were left with nothing but their rifles to carry though my feelings toward the general were still unfriendly knowing that he had expressed sentiments concerning me that were totally unmerited i could not reconcile myself to deserting him in his present helpless condition accordingly i informed him that if he thought he could endure the journey i would make arrangements to enable him to proceed along with the company he appeared charmed with the magnanimity of the proposal and declared his willingness to endure anything in reason his consent obtained i prepared a light litter and with the assistance of two of the unladen men placed him upon it in the easiest position possible then attaching two straps to the ends of the litter bars we threw them over our shoulders and taking the bars in our hands hoisted our burden and proceeded with all the ease imaginable our rifles were carried by the third man the anxiety of the general to remain with us prevented his giving utterance to the least complaint and we all arrived in good season on the banks of the green river we were rejoiced to find that our companions who had preceded us had killed the fine buffalo and we abandoned ourselves that evening to a general spirit of rejoicing our leader in a few days entirely recovered and we were thus by my forethought in bringing him with us spared the labor of a return journey we all feasted ourselves to our heart's content upon the delicious coarse-grained flesh of the buffalo of which there was an unlimited supply there were beside plenty of wild geese and teal ducks on the river the latter however i very seldom venture to kill one day several of us were out hunting buffalo the general who by the way was a very good shot being among the number the snow had blown from the level prairie and the wind had drifted in in deep masses over the margins of the small hills through which the buffalo had made trails just wide enough to admit one at a time these snow trails had become quite deep like all snow trails in the spring of the year thus affording us a fine opportunity for lurking in one trail and shooting a buffalo in another the general had wounded a bull which smarting with pain made a furious plunge at his assailant burying him in the snow with a thrust from his savage-looking head and horns i seeing the danger in which he was placed sent a ball into the beast just behind the shoulder instantly dropping him dead 
the general was rescued from almost certain death having received only a few scratches in the adventure after remaining in the camp four or five days the general resolved upon dividing our party into detachments of four or five men each and sending them upon different routes in order the better to accomplish the object of our perilous journey which was the collecting of all the beaver skins possible while the fur was yet valuable accordingly we constructed several boats of buffalo hides for the purpose of descending the river and proceeded along any of its tributaries that might lie in our way one of our boats being finished and launched the general sprang into it to test its capacity the boat was made fast by a slender string which snapped with the sudden jerk the boat was drawn into the current and drifted away general and all in the direction of the opposite shore it will be necessary before i proceed further to give the reader a description in as concise a manner as possible of this green river suck we were camped as we had discovered during our frequent excursions at the head of a great fall of the green river where it passes through the utah mountains the current at a small distance from our camp became exceedingly rapid and drew towards the centre from each shore this place we named the suck the fall continued for six or eight miles making a sheer descent in the entire distance of upwards of two hundred and fifty feet the river was filled with rocks and ledges and frequent sharp curves having high mountains and perpendicular cliffs on either side below our camp the river passed through a canyon or canyon as it is usually written a deep river passed through a bluff or mountain which continued below the fall to a distance of twenty-five or thirty miles wherever there was an eddy or a growth of willows there was sure to be found a beaver lodge the cunning creatures having selected that secluded and as they doubtlessly considered inaccessible spot to conceal themselves from the watchful eye of the trapper to return to the general his frail bark having reached the opposite shore encountered a ledge of rocks and had hardly touched when by the action of the rolling current it was capsized and he was thrown struggling into the water as providence would have it he reached the bluff on the opposite side and holding on to the crevice in the high and perpendicular cliff sung out lustily for assistance not a moment was to be lost some one must attempt to save him for he could not hold his present position in such cold water long i saw that no one cared to risk his life amid such imminent perils so calling to a frenchman of the name of doorway whom i knew to be one of the best swimmers to come to the rescue i threw off my leggings and plunged in supposing he would follow i swam under water as far as i could to avail myself of the undercurrent this mode is always practiced by the indians in crossing a rapid stream i struck the bluff a few feet above the general after taking breath for a moment or two i said to him by the way he was no swimmer there is only one way i can possibly save you and i may fail in that but you must follow my directions in the most minute degree or we are certainly both lost anything you say james i will follow said he then i continue when i float down to you place your hands on my shoulder and do not take hold of my neck then when i give you the word kick out with all your might and we may possibly get across i then let myself down to the general who was clinging to the rocks like a swallow he did as i directed and i started he kicking in my rear like the stern wheel of a propeller until i was obliged to bid him desist for with such a double propelling power as we produce i could not keep my mouth out of the water we swam to within a few yards of the opposite shore where the main suck caught us 
and my strength becoming exhausted we began slowly to recede from the shore towards inevitable death at this moment fitzpatrick thrust a long pole towards us to the end of which he attached the rope which the party on shore retained possession of i seized the pole with a death grip and we were hauled out of our perilous situation a few moments later and the world had seen the last of us after this rescue the general remarked to fitzpatrick that beckwith is surely one of the most singular men i have ever met i do not know what to think of him he never speaks to me except when absolutely unavoidable still he is the first and only man to encounter peril on my behalf three times he has now saved my life when not another man attempted to succor me he is a problem i cannot possibly solve agreeably to previous arrangements on the following morning our company proposed to dispense in different directions while preparing to leave our comfortable camp to take our chance in the mountains i happened to be out among the stock the general inquired for me and i was pointed out to him where i stood he is a singular being he exclaimed he knows we are about to separate and yet he does not trouble himself to come and bid me good-bye i must go to him approaching me he said james we are now about to part these toilsome enterprises in the mountains are extremely hazardous although i hope to see you again perhaps we may never meet more i am under great obligations to you you have several times rescued me from certain death and by your skill in hunting you have done great service to my camp when my mind was irritated and harassed i was betrayed into the use of language towards you which i regretted immediately after and still regret i wish you to forgive me and desire to part in friendship so long as you continue to use the same precautions you have hitherto used i can securely hope you will escape all accident and look forward to meeting you again under a more auspicious circumstances and he concluded by bidding me good-bye i bade him good-bye and we separated previous to this and after his rescue from the suck he mentioned to fitzpatrick that i ought to have the lead of a party and that he believed i was as capable as any one in the company for it fitzpatrick told him he did not believe i would accept the responsibility the general bade him ask me he came and communicated to me our general's wish and asked me if i would take the leadership of one of our detached parties i declined the offer assigning as my reason that i was too young to undertake the responsibilities of the charge that this was my first trip to the mountains i had but little experience in trapping and that there were older men better qualified for the duty the leadership of a party of a fur company is a very responsible post placed similarly to a captain of a whaling vessel where all depends upon his success if a captain is fortunate and returns from a profitable voyage of course in the eyes of the owner he is a first-rate officer and stands well for the future but if he has experienced unusual hardships and returns more or less unsuccessful he is disgraced in his command and is thrust aside for a more fortunate man it is just similar with trappers in the mountains whatever is their fortune good or bad the leader is the person on whom the praise or blame falls end of chapter five recording by gary ullman west palm beach florida Chapter Six of the Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. We separate into six detachments and start out. Trapping on Green River. Narrow escape from a massacre by the Arapahoes. One man murdered in camp. Retreat 
fall in with a detachment of our company. Great joy at the meeting. Return of the detachments to the place of rendezvous at the suck. After catching our peltry and goods by burying them in safe places, we received instructions from our general to rendezvous at the suck. By the 1st of July following, bidding each other adieu, for we could hardly expect we should meet again, we took up our different lines of march. Our party consisted, led by one Clements, of six among whom was the boy Baptiste, he always insisting on remaining with his brother, as he called me. Our route was up the river, a country that none of us had ever seen before, where the foot of the white man has seldom, if ever, left its print. We were successful in finding beaver as we progressed, and we obtained plenty of game for the wants of our small party. Wherever we hauled up a track, we usually found a beaver. Besides, a considerable number we killed with the rifle. In moving up the river, we came to a small stream, one of the tributaries of Green River, which we named Horse Creek, in honor of a wild horse we found on its banks. The creek abounded with the objects of our search, and in a very few days we succeeded in taking over 100 beavers, the skins of which were worth ten dollars per pound in St. Louis. Sixty skins, when dried, formed a pack of one hundred pounds. After having finished our work on Horse Creek, we returned to the main river and proceeded on, meeting with very good success, until we encountered another branch, which we subsequently named La Brock Creek, from our comrade who was murdered by the Indians. Our success was much greater here than at any point since leaving the suck, and we followed it up until we came to a deep canyon in which we encamped. The next day, while the men were variously engaged about the camp, happening to be in a more elevated position than the others, I saw a party of Indians approaching within a few yards, evidently unaware of our being in their neighborhood. I immediately shouted, Indians, Indians, to your guns, men, and leveled my rifle at the foremost of them. They held up their hands, saying, Bueno, bueno, meaning that they were good or friendly, at which my companions cried out to me, Don't fire, don't fire, they are friendly, they speak Spanish. But we were sorry afterward we did not all shoot. Our horses had taken fright at the confusion and ran up the canyon. Baptiste and myself went in pursuit of them. When we came back with them, we found sixteen Indians sitting around our camp smoking and jabbering their own tongue, which none of us understood. They passed the night and next day with us in apparent friendship, thinking this conduct assumed from the fact they rather overdid the thing. We deemed it prudent to retrace our steps to the open prairie, where, if they did intend to commence an attack upon us, we should have a fairer chance of defending ourselves. Accordingly, we packed up and left, all the Indians following us. The next day, they continued to linger about the camp. We had but slight suspicion of their motives, although for security we kept constant guard upon them. From this they proceeded to certain liberties, which I here strictly caution all immigrants and mountaineers against ever permitting, such as handling our guns, except the arms of the guard, piling them and then carrying them together. At length one of the Indians shouldered all the guns, and starting off with them ran fifty yards from camp. Mentioning to my mates, I did not like the maneuvers of these fellows. I started after the Indian and took my gun from him. Baptists doing the same, and we brought them back to camp. Our companions chided us for doing so, saying we should anger the Indians by doubting their friendship. I said I considered my gun as safe in my own hands as in the hands of a strange savage. If they choose to give up theirs, they were at liberty to do so. When night came, we all lay down except Paula Brock, 
who kept guard, having an Indian with him to replenish the fire. Some of the men had fallen asleep lying nearby when we were all suddenly startled by a loud cry from LeBlanc and the instant report of a gun, the contents of which passed between Baptiste and myself, who both occupied one bed the powder burning a hole in our upper blankets we were all up in an instant an indian had seized my rifle but i instantly wrenched it from him though i acknowledge i was too terrified to shoot when we had in some measure recovered from our sudden fright i hastened to lebrock and discovered that a tomahawk had been sunk in his head and there remained I pulled it out, and in examining the ghastly wound, buried all four fingers of my right hand in his brain. We bound up his head, but he was a corpse in a few moments. Not an India was then to be seen, but we well knew they were in the bushes close by, and that, in all probability, we should every one share the fate of our murdered comrade. What to do now was the universal inquiry. With the butt of my rifle, I scattered the fire to prevent the Indians making a sure mark of us. We then proceeded to pack up with the utmost dispatch, intending to move into the open prairie, where, if they attacked us again, we could at least defend ourselves, notwithstanding our disparity of numbers, we being but five to sixteen. On searching for La Brock's gun, it was nowhere to be found. The Indian who had killed him, having doubtless carried it off, while hastily packing our articles, I very luckily found five quivers well stocked with arrows, the bows attached, together with two Indian guns. These well supplied our missing rifle, for I had practiced so much with bow and arrow that I was considered a good shot. When in readiness to leave, our leader inquired in which direction the river lay. His agitation had been so great that his memory had failed him. I directed the way and desired every man to put the animals upon their utmost speed until we were safely out of the willows, which order was complied with. While thus running the gauntlet, the balls and arrows whizzed around us as fast as our hidden enemies could send them. Not a man was scratched, however, though two of our horses were wounded, my horse having received an arrow in the neck and another being wounded near the hip, both slightly. Pursuing our course, we arrived soon in the open ground where we considered ourselves comparatively safe. Arriving at a small rise in the prairie, I suggested to our leader that this would be a good place to make a stand, for if the Indians followed us, we had the advantage of position. No, said he, we will proceed on to New Mexico. I was astonished at his answer, well knowing, though but slightly skilled in geography, that New Mexico must be many hundreds of miles further south. However, I was not captain, and we proceeded. Keeping the return track, we found ourselves in the afternoon of the following day, about 60 miles from the scene of the murder. The assault had been made, as we afterwards learned, by three young Indians who were ambitious to distinguish themselves in the minds of their tribe by the massacre of an American party. We were still descending the banks of the Green River, which is the main branch of the Colorado, when about the time mentioned above, I discovered horses in the skirt of the woods on the opposite side. My companions pronounced them buffalo, but I was confident they were horses, because I could distinguish white ones among them. Proceeding still farther, I discovered men with the horses. My comrades still confident I was in error. Speedily, however, they all became satisfied of my correctness, and we formed the conclusion that we had come across a party of Indians. We saw by their maneuvers that they had discovered us, for they were then collecting all their property together. We held a short council, which resulted in a determination to retreat towards the mountains. I, for one, was tired of retreating and refused to go farther. Baptiste joining me in my resolve, we took up a strong position for defense, 
being a place of difficult approach, and having our gun and ammunition and abundance of arrows for defense, considering our numbers, we felt ourselves rather a strong garrison. The other three left us to our determination to fall together and took to the prairie, but changing mind they returned and rejoined us in our position deeming our means of defense better in one body than when divided we all therefore determined to sell our lives as dearly as possible should the enemy attack us feeling sure we could kill five times our number before we were overpowered and that we should in all probability beat them off by this time the supposed enemy had advanced towards us and one of them hailed us in english as follows who are you we are trappers what company do you belong to general ashley's hooray 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 they all shouted and we in turn exhausted our breath in replying is that you jim beckwith said a voice from the party yes is that you castenga I replied. He answered in the affirmative, and there arose another hurrah. We inquired where their camp was. They informed us that it was two miles below at the fort. Baptiste and myself mounted our horses, descended the bank, plunged into the river, and were soon exchanging salutations with another of the general's old detachments. They also had taken us for Indians and had gathered in their horses while we took up our position for defense. The night was spent in general rejoicing and relating our adventures and recounting our various successes and reverses. There is as much heartfelt joy experienced in falling in with a party of fellow trappers in the mountains as is felt at sea when after a long voyage a friendly vessel just from port is spoken and boarded in both cases a thousand questions are asked all have wives sweethearts or friends to inquire after and then the general news from the states is taken up and discussed the party we had fallen in with consisted of sixteen men they had been two years out and had left Fort Yellowstone only a short time previously and were provided with every necessary for a long excursion. They had not seen the general and did not know he was in the mountains. They had lost some of their men who had fallen victims to the Indians, but in trapping had been generally successful. Our little party also had done extremely well, and we felt great satisfaction in displaying to them seven or eight packets of sixty skins each. We related to them the murder of Le Brock, and every trapper boiled with indignation at the recital. All wanted instantly to start in pursuit and revenge upon the Indians the perpetration of their treachery but there was no probability of overtaking them and they suffered their anger to cool down the second day after our meeting i proposed that the most experienced mountaineers of their party should return with baptiste and myself to perform the burial rites of our friend i proposed three men with ourselves as sufficient for the sixteen indians in case we should fall in with them and they would certainly be enough for the errand if we met no one my former comrades were too tired to return we started and arrived at our unfortunate camp but the body of our late friend was not to be found though we discovered some of his long black hair clotted with blood on raising the traps which we had set before our precipitate departure we found a beaver in every one except four which contained each a leg the beavers having amputated them with their teeth we then returned to our companions and moved on to willow creek where we were handy to the catches of our rendezvous at the suck it was now about june first eighteen twenty two here we spent our time very pleasantly occupying ourselves with hunting 
fishing, target shooting, foot racing, gymnastic, and sundry other exercises. The other, de the other detachments now came in, bringing with them quantities of peltry, all having met with very great success. End of chapter six. Recording by Gary Ullman, West Palm Beach, Florida. Chapter 7 of The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 7 Arrival of General Ashley and Party. His relation of their sufferings after leaving the rendezvous. Their excursion to Salt Lake. Fall in with a fur company before unknown to the mountaineers. His final fortune and return to St. Louis. Sitting in camp one beautiful summer morning for the month of June is always lovely in northern latitudes. An Indian last stepped up to me and wished me to kill a deer or an antelope and bring her the brains wherewith to dress a deer skin, offering me, in compensation, a handsome pair of moccasins. Thinking to save two dollars by a few minutes' exertion, I took my rifle and, alone, left camp. After traveling two miles, I obtained sight of a fine antelope, which had also seen me and kept himself at a respectful distance. In following him up to get a fair shot, I at length found myself about ten miles from camp, with small prospect of getting either brains or moccasins. While among the wild sage, still trying to approach the antelope, I observed a horse and rider coming in my direction. Feeling satisfied that the rider was an Indian, made up my mind to run no farther after the antelope, but to shoot him and take his brains to the squaw, as she would know no difference. I therefore concealed myself in the sage until he should come within range of my rifle. Becoming impatient at length at his tardy approach, I raised my head I raised my head to take a look, when, to my utter astonishment, I saw General Ashley in the act of mounting his horse at a few paces distance. He had stopped to adjust something belonging to his saddle, and to this trifling circumstance he was indebted for his life. On seeing who it was, I became so excited at the narrow escape he had made that my rifle fell from my hand. If I had shot him, it being well known in camp that I was not entirely reconciled to him, I should, most undoubtedly, have been charged with his murder. But I told the general of the narrow escape he had just made. He was surprised at my mistaking him for an Indian, and inquired if I did not know that they never traveled singly. I then inquired after his health and the success he had met with, and then related to him our own losses and success generally. He inquired where the camp was. I told him it was close at hand. In conducting the general thither, he pronounced my close at hand rather distant. Arrived at camp, the general related their adventures in descending the Green River over the rapids through the Suck and Canyon in the following narrative. We had a very dangerous passage down the river and suffered more than I ever wish to see men suffer again. You are aware that we took but little provisions with us, not expecting that the canyon extended so far, and passing over the rapids, where we lost two boats and three guns. We made use of ropes in letting down our boats over the most dangerous places. Our provisions soon gave out. We found plenty of beaver in the canyon for some miles, and expecting to find them in as great plenty all the way. We saved none of their carcasses, which constituted our food. As we proceeded, however, they became more and more scarce, until there were none to be seen, and we were entirely out of provisions. To retrace the river was impossible. To ascend the perpendicular cliffs, which hemmed us in on either side, was equally impossible. Our only alternative was to go ahead. After passing six days without tasting food, the men were weak and disheartened. 
I listened to all their murmurings and heart-rending complaints. They often spoke of home and friends, declaring they would never see them more. Some spoke of wives and children whom they dearly loved and who must shortly become widows and orphans. They had toiled, they said, through every difficulty, had risked their lives among wild beasts and hostile Indians in the wilderness, all which they were willing to undergo. But who could bear up against actual starvation? I encouraged them all in my power, telling them that I bore an equal part in their suffering, that I too was toiling for those I loved and whom I yet hoped to see again, and we should all endeavor to give up our courage and not add to our misfortunes by giving way to despondency. Another night was passed amid the barren rocks. The next morning the fearful proposition was made by some of the party for the company to cast lots to see which should be sacrificed to afford food for the others, without which they must inevitably perish. My feelings at such a proposition cannot be described. I begged of them to wait one day more, to make all the way they could meanwhile. By doing so, I said, we must come to a break in the canyon where we could escape. They consented, and moving down the river as fast as the current would carry us, to our inexpressible joy, we found a break and a camp of trappers therein. All now rejoiced they had not carried their fearful proposition into effect. We had fallen into good hands and slowly recruited ourselves with the party, which was under the charge of one provo, a man whom I was well acquainted by his advice we left the river and proceeded in a northwesterly direction provo was well provided with provisions and horses and he supplied us with both we remained with his party until we arrived at the great salt lake here i fell in with a large company of trappers composed of canadians and iroquois indians under the command of peter ogden in the service of the northwest fur company with this party i made a very good bargain as you will see when they arrive at our camp having purchased all their peltry on very reasonable terms the general concluded his narrative and was congratulated by all present on his safe arrival we were all rejoiced to hear that during our absence of six or seven weeks he had not lost a man we then proceeded to uncatch our goods which we had buried in the suck and prepared to move up the river to a point where the canadians and indians had engaged to meet him with their peltry the general appointed me captain of a party to meet the canadians and escort them to the rendezvous which he had proposed to them while he and some few others remained to bring up the goods consisting of flour sugar coffee blankets, tobacco, whiskey, and all other articles necessary for that region. There were at this time assembled at our camp about 200 men, beside many women and children. For many of the Frenchmen were accompanied with a squaw. I took with me 80 men with their women, children, and effects, leaving for the general a strong guard of 120 men to escort the goods up the river. Two days after, we had started, being about a mile from the river, we stopped to dress a buffalo. While resting, a party of 400 Indians passed at full speed between us and the river, driving a large number of horses. We mounted with all haste and started after them, but not in time to recapture the whole of the horses, which they had just stolen, or rather forced from the general in the presence of his men. We fired on the Indians, and after a smart skirmish in which I received an arrow in the left arm, we recaptured 27 of the animals, the Indians running off the remainder, amounting to 70 or 80 head, a severe loss, for we needed them to carry our peltry. We found three dead Indians on the field, whom we scalped, leaving them for the wolves to feed on. I ordered a camp to be formed, wherein to leave the women and children with a guard and then mustering all the horses we took the return track to the camp fearing that the party had been surprised 
and perhaps all massacred. On the road we met a party which the general had dispatched to us, he having similar apprehensions in regards to us. They informed us that the Indians had broken in upon them in broad daylight, unawares, and stampeded one hundred head of horses. The two of their men were wounded, of whom Sublet, since well known to the western people, was one. It seems he was with the horses at the time the Indians rushed in upon them. He fired at one, but missed him. Then, clubbing his piece, he struck the Indian, nearly knocking him off his horse. The Indian rallied again and fired at Sublet, wounding him slightly. Both the wounded men were doing well. Arrived at the camp, we related our exploit to the general. He was overjoyed to hear that we had recaptured so many horses without the loss of a single man. This was my first engagement with the Indians in the capacity of an officer, and never did General Scott or Taylor feel more exultation at their most signal triumph than did I in this trifling affair where a score or so of the horses were captured at the expense of myself and two of my men receiving slight wounds we all moved together feeling ourselves a match for a thousand indians should they dare to assail us on arriving at the rendezvous we found the main body of the salt lake party already there with the whole of their effects the general opened none of his goods except tobacco until all had arrived as he wished to make an equal distribution for goods were then very scarce in the mountains and hard to obtain when all had come in he opened his goods and there was a general jubilee among all at the rendezvous we constituted quite a little town numbering at least eight hundred souls of whom one half were women and children there were some among us who had not seen any groceries such as coffee sugar and etc for several months the whiskey went off as freely as water even at the exorbitant price he sold it for all kinds of sports were indulged in with a heartiness that would astonish more civilized societies the general transacted a very profitable trade with our salt like friends he purchased all their beaver of which they had collected a large quantity so that with his purchases and those of our own collection he had now one hundred and ninety one packs all in excellent order and worth a thousand dollars per pack in st louis there lay the general's fortune in one immense pile collected at the expense of severe toil privation suffering peril and in some cases loss of life it was supposed the general was indebted in the mountains and elsewhere to the amount of seventy five thousand dollars the skins he had purchased of the northwest company and free trappers had cost him comparatively little if he should meet with no misfortune on his way to st louis he would receive enough to pay all his debts and have an ample fortune besides in about a week the general was ready to start for home the packs were all arranged our salt lake friends offered him the loan of all the horses he wanted and engaged to escort him to the head of wind river one of the branches of the yellowstone the number selected to return with the general was twenty men including my humble self thirty men were to accompany us as a guard and to return the horses we had borrowed the night previous to our departure i and my boy baptiste were sleeping among the packs as were also some of the other men when the sentinel came to me and tell me that he had seen something which he believed to be indians i arose and satisfied myself that he was correct i sent a man to acquaint the general at the same time waking the boy and two men near me we noiselessly raised ourselves took as good aim as possible, and at a signal from me, all four fired. We saw two men run. By this time, the whole camp was aroused. The general asked me what I had fired at. I told him I believed an Indian. Very good, said he. Whenever you see an Indian about camp at night, you do right to shoot him. Our whole force was on guard from that time till the morning, when we discovered two dead Indians lying where we had directed our aim in the night. 
We knew they had been killed by our guns, for the other two men fired with shotgun loaded with buckshot. One had been killed with a ball through the arm and body, the other was shot through the head. We had first supposed that the two Indians belonged to the Blackfeet, but we subsequently found they were crows. One of them wore a fine pair of buckskin leggings, which I took from him and put on myself. We started with an escort of fifty men following the Wind River down to the Yellowstone, where we built our boats to descend the river. On the sixth day after leaving camp, while we were packing our effects for an early start, the alarm of Indians was given, and on looking out we saw an immense body of them, well mounted, charging directly down upon our camp. Every man seized his rifle and prepared for the living tornado. The general gave orders for no man to fire until he did. By this time, the Indians were within half pistol shot. Greenwood, one of our party, pronounced them crows and called out several times not to shoot. We kept our eyes upon our general. He pulled trigger, but his gun misfired, and our camp was immediately filled with their warriors. Most fortunate was it for us that the general's gun did misfire, for they numbered over a thousand warriors, and not a man of us would escape to see the Yellowstone. Greenwood, who knew the Crows, acted as interpreter between our general and the Indian chief, whose name was Apsaro Kebet Set Sa, Sparrow Hawk Chief. After making numerous inquiries about our success in hunting, the chief inquired through the interpreter where we were from. From Green River was the reply. You killed two Blackfeet there? Yes. Where are their scalps? My people wish to dance. Don't show them, cried Greenwood to us, turning to the Indian. We did not take their scalps. Ugh, that is strange. During this colloquy, I had buried my scalp in the sand and concealed my leggings, knowing they had belonged to a crow. Chief gave orders to his warriors to move on, many of them keeping with us on our road to the camp which was but a short distance off. Soon after reaching there, an Indian woman issued from a lodge and approached the chief. She was covered with blood and crying in the most piteous terms, addressed the chief. These are the men that killed my son on Green River, and will you not avenge his death? She was almost naked, and according to their custom, when a near relative is slain, had inflicted wounds all over her body in token of her deep mourning. The chief, turning to the general, then said, The two men that were killed in your camp were not Blackfeet, but my own warriors. They were good horse thieves and brave men. One of them was a son of this woman, and she is crying for his loss. Give her something to make her cease her cries, for it angers me to see her grief. The General cheerfully made her a present of what things he had at hand, to the value of about fifty dollars. Now, said the chief to the woman, go to your lodge and cease your crying. She went away seemingly satisfied. During the day, two other Indians came to the encampment, and displaying each a wound, said, See here what you white people have done to us? You shot us. White people shoot good in the dark. These were the two whom we had seen run away after our night discharge on the Green River. They had been wounded by the other two men's shotguns, but their wounds were not serious. They said that their intention had been to steal our horses, but our eyes were too sharp for them. The general distributed some further presents among these two men, happening to look among their numerous horses, we recognized some that had been stolen from us at the time the general was sick, previous to our discovery of the Green River. The general said to the chief, I believe I see some of my horses among yours. Yes, we stole them from you. What did you steal my horses for? I was tired with walking. I had been to fight the Blackfeet, and coming back would have called at your camp you would have given me tobacco, but that would not carry me. When we stole them, they were very poor. They are now fat. We have plenty of horses. You can take all that belong to you. 
The chief then gave orders for them to deliver up all the horses taken from our camp. They brought in 88, all in excellent condition, and delivered them up to the general, who was overjoyed at their recovery, for he had never expected to see his horses again. On our issuing from their camp, many of the Indians bore us company for two days until we came to a pass in a mountain called Bad Pass, where we encamped. Several of the party being out with their guns searching for game, a man by the name of Baptiste, not the boy, having a portion of a buffalo on his horse, came across a small stream flowing near the trail. When he halted to get a drink, while stooping to drink, a grizzly bear sprang upon him and lacerated him in a shocking manner. Passing that way, I came across his dismounted horse, and following his tracks down to the river, discovered the poor fellow with his head completely flayed and several dangerous wounds in various parts of his body. I quickly gave the alarm and procured assistance to carry him to the camp. Soon after reaching the camp, we heard a great rush of horses, and looking in the direction of the noise, perceived a party of our half-breeds charging directly towards our camp, and driving before them an other bear of enormous size. All the camp scattered and took to the trees. I was standing by the wounded man at the time, became so terrified that I hardly knew whether I was standing on the ground or was in the tree. I kept my eye on the bear, not supposing that he would enter our camp, but he held his course directly for me. I withdrew to look for a tree, but for some reason did not climb. Every man was calling to me, to a tree, Jim, to a tree. But by this time the bear was in camp and the horsemen at his heels. On his seeing the wounded man lying there all covered with blood, he made a partial halt. I profited by the incident and put a ball directly into his heart, killing his bear ship instantly. The general fired at the same moment, his ball also taking good effect. The next day we went through Bad Pass, carrying our wounded companion on a litter, who, notwithstanding his dreadful wounds, recovered. On arriving at the Big Horn, as it is called there, we set about preparing boats, which, after five days, was ready for launching. There were fur travelers with us, who, having made a boat for themselves, went on in advance, intending to trap along down until we should overtake them. They accordingly started. When we went down, we found their boat and traps, which had been broken, but no remains of the trappers. But the appearance of the ground, it was evident that the Indians had surprised and murdered them, and afterwards removed their bodies. Nothing else of consequence occurred during our run down the Bighorn and Yellowstone to the junction of the latter with the Missouri, thus running a distance of 800 miles in our boats. In effecting a landing at the junction of these two rivers, we unfortunately sank one of our boats, on board of which were thirty packs of beaver skins, and away they went, floating down the current as rapidly as though they had been live beavers. All was noise and confusion in a minute, the general in a perfect ferment shouting to us to save packs. All the swimmers plunged in after them, and every pack was saved. The noise we made attracted a strong body of U.S. troops down to the river, who were encamped near the place, and officers, private, and musicians lined up the shore. They were under the command of General Atkinson, then negotiating a treaty with the Indians of that region on behalf of the government. General Atkinson and our general happened to be old acquaintances, and when we had made everything snug and secure, we all went into camp and freely indulged in festivities. Hooray for the mountains! rung through the camp again and again. The next morning we carried all our efforts from the boats to the encampment, and our hunters went out in search of game. Not a day passed, but we brought in great quantities of buffalo, venison, mountain sheep, etc. Of the latter, we caught 
some very young ones alive, one of which I presented to Lieutenant, now General, Harney, which circumstance I have no doubt he still bears in mind. After a stay of about a week, General Atkinson furnished us a boat of sufficient size to carry all our effects, and breaking up the encampment afforded us the pleasure of the company of all the troops under his command, we, gentlemen mountaineers, traveling as passengers. At our camping place, we very willingly supplied the party with game. At one of our encampments, an amusing accident occurred. We were out hunting buffalo, and had succeeded in wounding a bull who, furious with his wound made with the speed of lightning, directly for the camp, leaving a cloud of dust in his track. The troops, perceiving his approach, scattered in all directions as though an avalanche was bursting upon them. On went the buffalo, overturning tents, baggage, and guns, leaping every impediment that arrested his course. Then turning, he plunged into the river and gained the opposite prairie, leaving more than a hundred soldiers scared half to death at his visitation. They certainly discharged their pieces at him, but for all the injury they inflicted, he will probably live to a good old age. Previous to our arrival at Fort Clark, we met with another serious misadventure. The boat, containing all of our general's effects, running on a snack, immediately sunk. Again, all our packs were afloat, and General Atkinson, witnessing the accident, ordered every man overboard to save the peltry, himself setting the example. In an instant, the mountaineers... United States officers and soldiers plunged in to the rescue. Fortunately, it was shoal water, not more than waist high, and all was speedily saved. General Atkinson related a difficulty he had had with the Crow Nation in the course of a treaty with them at Fort Clark, on his way up the river. The Crows, in a battle with the Blackfeet, had taken a half-breed woman and child, whom they had captured on the Columbia River some time previously. General Atkinson ordered them to liberate the captives, which they refused to do, saying that they had taken them from their enemies, the Blackfeet, and that they clearly belonged to them. The general persisted in his demand, and the Indians refused to comply, even offering to fight about the matter. The general declined fighting that day, but desired them to come on the morrow, and he would be prepared. The next day, the Indian force presented themselves for the onset. They bring in a host of warriors. One of the chiefs visited the military camp for a talk. He had an interview with Major O'Fallon, who ordered him to give up the captives or prepare to fight. The chief boastingly replied, through Rose, the interpreter, that the Major's party was not a match for the Crows, that he would whip his whole army. On this, the Major, who was a passionate man, drew his pistol and snapped it at the chief's breast. It missed fire, and he then struck the Indian a violent blow on the head with the weapon, inflicting a severe gash. The chief made no resistance, but remained sullen. When this occurrence reached the ears of the Indian warriors, they became perfectly infuriated and prepared for an instant attack. General Atkinson pacified them through Rose, who was one of the best interpreters ever known in the whole Indian country. During the hubbub, the Indians spiked the general's guns with wooden spikes and stuffed them with grass. Their principal chief, Longhair, then visited the camp and addressed the general. White chief, the Groves have never yet shed the blood of the white people. They have always treated them like brothers. You have now shed the first blood. My people are angry, and we must fight. The general replied, Chief, I was told by my friend, the great red-haired chief, that the Crows were a good people, that they were our friends. We did not come to fight Crows, we came as their friends. The red-haired chief exclaimed long hair in astonishment, Are you his people? Yes, replied the general. The red-haired chief is a great chief, and when he hears that you have shed the blood of a crow, he will be angry and punish you for it. Go home, he added, and tell the red-haired chief that you have shed the blood of a crow. 
and though our people were angry, we did not kill his people. Tell him that you saw Long Hair, the Crow Chief, to whom he gave the red plume many winters ago. Long Hair and Rose then went out and harangued the warriors, who immediately withdrew, and soon the women and children were brought into camp. The general made them a present of a great number of guns and ammunition in abundance, at which they were highly delighted. The reader who has perused Lewis and Clark's travels, pleased to understand that the red-haired chief spoken of above was none other than Mr. Clark, whom the Crows almost worshipped while he was among them, and who yet hold his name in the highest veneration. He was considered by them to be a great medicine man, and they supposed him lord over the whole white race. Loss of the boat being supplied, and all to rights again, we continued our course down the Missouri, still in company with the troops, until we reached Fort Lookout, where we encamped for the night. There was a trading post at this fort, belonging to the American Fur Company, in charge of Major Pitcher. The Major made General Ashley present of a large grizzly bear for a plaything, and a pretty plaything we found him before we were done with him. He was made fast with a chain to the cargo box on deck, and seemed to think himself captain. At any rate, he was more imperious in his orders than a commodore on a foreign station. He would suffer no one on deck, and seemed literally to apply the poet's words to himself. I am monarch of all I survey. My right there is none to dispute. We continued our course down the river and camping on shore every night. We had a jovial time. We had a jovial time of it, telling stories, cracking jokes, and frequently making free with Uncle Sam's Oh Be Joyful, of which there was a great plenty for the supply of rations to the troops. The soldiers listened with astonishment to the wild adventures of the mountaineers and would in turn engage our attention with recitals of their own. At length we arrived at Council Bluffs, where we remained three days, feeling ourselves almost at home. We, of course, had a good time at the Bluffs, and the three days passed in continual festivities. Providing ourselves with a good boat, we bade adieu to the troops, who stayed behind at the bluffs and continued our descent of the river. The current of the Missouri is swift, but to our impatient minds, a locomotive would have seemed too tardy in removing us from the scenes of hardship and privation we had just gone through to the homes of our friends, our sweethearts, our wives, and little ones. Those who reside in maritime places and have witnessed the hardy tars step ashore in their native land can form an adequate idea of the happy return of the mountaineers from their wanderings on the plains to St. Louis, which is their great seaport, or, if a pun is admissible, I may perhaps say seaport, for there we see old friends, there we see our fun and merriment, and there we sometimes see sights. Arrived at St. Charles, twenty miles above St. Louis, the general dispatched a courier to his friends, Messrs. Warndorf and Tracy, to inform them of his great success and that he would be in with his cargo the next day about noon. When we came inside of the city, we were saluted by a piece of artillery which continued its discharges until we landed at the marketplace. There were not less than a thousand persons present who hailed our landing with shouts which deafened our ears. Those who had parents, brothers and sisters, wives or sweethearts met them at the landing, and such a rushing, crowding, pulling, hauling, weeping and laughing I have never before witnessed. Everyone had learned our approach by the courier. My father, who had moved to St. Louis, was in the crowd and was overjoyed to see me. He had lost a part of his property by being surety for other men, and I could see that age had left its traces upon him during the little time that I had been absent. Our cargo was soon landed and stored. 
the men receiving information that they would be paid off that afternoon at the store of Messrs. Warndorf and Tracy. We accordingly repaired thither in a body to receive our pay. The full amount was counted out in silver to each man, except three, namely La Roche, Pello, and myself. To us, the general gave $25 each, telling us he would see us there again. I immediately thought of my difficulty with him in the mountains and concluded that the remainder of my pay was to be withheld on that account. We took our $25 each and went away asking no further questions, though we took no trouble to conceal our thoughts. Before we left the counting room, the general told us to repair to any hotel we choose and have whatever we liked to call for until the next morning and he would pay the bill. Accordingly, we all repaired to Libera's hotel and had a glorious time of it. The house was thronged with our friends, besides, who all felt themselves included in the general's hospitality. General Ashley called on us the next morning, and perceiving that we had run all night, told us to keep on another day at his expense, adding that if we wished to indulge in a ride, he would pay for carriages. We profited by his hint, and did not fail to take into our party a good share of lassies and mountaineers. The next morning the general again visited us, and seeing we were pretty sober, paid the bill, not a trifling matter, and desired us to call on him at the store at ten o'clock. We went as appointed, not knowing yet how he would treat us when we were assembled. He paid us our wages in full, made us a present of three hundred dollars each, and desired us to purchase a first-rate suit of clothes each at his expense. I give you this extra, he said, for your faithful service to me in the mountains, for your watchfulness over my property and interests while there, for your kindness and caring for me while sick and helpless, carrying me when unable to walk, and not leaving me to perish in the camp alone. I forgot to mention the disembarkation of Grizzly at the proper time, but will do so here. After the peltry was all landed in store, the bear still occupied his station. Hundreds were yet gazing at him, many of whom had never seen one of this kind before. The general said to me, James, how under the sun are we going to get that animal off the boat? I, having a few glasses of artificial courage to back me, felt exceedingly valorous and thought myself able to throw a millstone across the Mississippi. Accordingly, I volunteered to bring him ashore. I procured a light stick, walked straight up to the bear, and speaking very sharp to him, as he had to us all the way down the river, deliberately unfastened his chain. He looked me in the eyes for a moment, and, giving a low whine, drooped his head. I led him off the boat along a staging prepared for the purpose, the crowd instantly falling back to a respectful distance. Landing him without accident, the general wished me to lead him to the residence of Major Biddle, distant a quarter of a mile from the landing. Courageous as ever, I led him on, though some of the time he would lead his leader. Bruin, often looking round at the crowd that was following up at a prudent distance behind. I arrived safe at the residence and made Grizzly fast to an apple tree that stood there. I had scarcely got to the length of his chain when he made a furious spring at me. The chain, very fortunate, was a strong one and held him fast. I then called at the Major's house, and delivering our General's compliments to him, informed him he had sent a pet for his acceptance. He inquired what kind of a pet, and taking him to the tree where I had made fast the bear, I showed the huge beast to him. The Major almost quaked with fear. While we stood looking at him, a small pig happened to pass near the bear. When the grizzly dealt him such a blow with his paw, that he left him not a whole bone in his body, and the piggy fell dead out of the bear's reach. The major then invited me in, and setting out some of his best, I drank his health according to the custom of those days, and left to rejoin my companions. End of chapter 7 Recording by Gary Ullman
Chapter 8 of The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Unexpected Return to the Rocky Mountains. Camp Removed. Final Success in Finding Our Party in the Mountains. Joyful Meeting. Horses Stolen by the Punnak Indians. A Battle and six Indians killed. We recapture our horses. I had been in St. Louis only one week when General Ashley came to me and desired me to return to the mountains immediately to carry dispatches to Mr. W. L. Sublet, captain of the trappers, and offering me the magnificent sum of $1,000 for the trip. I consented to go. La Roche and Pello were to accompany me. A journey to the mountains was then called 2,000 miles through a country considered dangerous even for an army. I left St. Louis this time with extreme reluctance. It is a severe trial to leave one's friends, but the grief of separating from father and all other relatives sank into insignificant when contrasted with the misery of separating from one in particular, one in whom all my affections were reposed, and upon whom all my hopes of the future were concentrated. The contemplation of the anguish I was about to inflict by the announcement filled my heart with sorrow. One week more, and the happy event that would make one of two loving hearts would have been consummated. The general's business was urgent, and admitted of no delay. After I had engaged, not a day, scarcely an hour was to be lost. The thousand dollars I was to receive looked large in my eyes, and that added to what I had already possessed, the better prepare me for a matrimonial voyage. I comforted myself with the reflection that my services were confined to the mere delivering of the dispatches, that service performed, I was free to return immediately. I bid my aged father farewell. It was the last time I saw him. To my other friends, I said cheerfully, Au revoir, expecting to return to them shortly. But my greatest conflict was to come. I had encountered perils, privation, and faced death itself. I had fought savages and the wild beasts of the mountains, but to approach this tender heart that had been affianced to my own for years unmanned me. That heart that was then so light, so buoyant with hope, so full of confidence in the future, that I must plunge in other darkness by the intelligence that in a few short hours I must leave her. Could I have communicated it to her by fighting a score of Indians? How much my pain would have been mitigated. But the time was urgent, and the sacred obligation to the lady must be performed. I called out my sweetheart. She looked more lovely than ever. She remarked my troubled looks. James, she said, you look saddened. What is the matter? Are you unwell? No, Eliza, I am well, but... But what, James? What has happened? Speak. Knowing that I had no time for delay, I felt it my duty to break the news to her at once. My dear girl, I said, I have loved you long and ardently. I have waited to see if the affection which you shared with me in childhood would stand the proof of maturer years. We are now both matured in years and are capable of judging our own hearts. Through all my sufferings and dangers, my devotion to you has grown with my growth and strengthened with my strength. We have decided on the day for our indissolvable union. But Eliza, I am yet young. My means of supporting you as I could wish are inadequate. I have just received a very tempting offer from General Ashley. What to do, James? He offers me $1,000 to carry dispatches to the mountains, which admits of my immediate return. And are you going? That is what I have come to inform you. Eliza, understand my motive. It is solely to obtain the means to enable us to start the fairer in life. I care not for the money, James, she said, bursting into a flood of tears. My heart sought relief from its overcharged feelings in the same way. I left her amid her sobs, 
promising to make a speedy return, and that we would part no more till death should separate us. The general had furnished us with two good saddle horses each, and one stout mule to carry our bedding. We mounted, and, leaving St. Louis, were soon some miles on our journey. We proceeded up the Missouri River, left the last white settlement, and issued out into the wilderness. We proceeded with the utmost caution, always halting before dark. We built a fire and ate our supper, then, moving on farther to a secure camping place, we lit no fire to avoid attracting the Indians to us. On arriving at the forks of the Platte, we held a council and resolved to follow up the north branch to its source, thence cross over to Green River, thus striking it much higher up than we had ever been on the stream before. We proceeded accordingly, crossed Green River, and held our course to the head of Salt River. Here we found a party belonging to the general's company. Winter was now beginning to set in, and it was time for the whole company to go into winter quarters. As nearly as I can recollect, this was the end of October, 1823. A place of rendezvous had been previously agreed upon, and as it was certain that the various parties would soon assemble i concluded to proceed to the rendezvous and wait the arrival of sublet for the delivery of my dispatches rather than undertake a search for him in the mountain wilderness i and my companions therefore continued with the party until we reached the rendezvous the parties one after the other came slowly in and sublet's was the last to arrive it was now too late for me to return i had no alternative but to wait until spring we accordingly moved to the mouth of the weaver's fork and established ourselves there when all were collected together for the winter our community numbered from six to seven hundred souls from two to three hundred consisting of women and children all strong and healthy as bears and all having experienced very good success shortly after we had become well settled down we had the misfortune to lose about eighty horses stolen one dark stormy night by the punaks a tribe inhabiting the headwaters of the columbia river on missing them the next day we formed a party of about forty men and followed their trail on foot the ground was covered with snow at the time i volunteered with the rest although fortunately my horses were not among the missing after a pursuit of five days we arrived at one of their villages where we saw our own horses among a number of others we then divided our forces fitzpatrick taking command of one party and a james bridger of the other the plan resolved upon was as follows fitzpatrick was to charge the indians and cover bridger's party while they stampeded all the horses they could get away with I formed one of Captain Bridges' parties, this being the first affair of the kind I had ever witnessed. Everything being in readiness, we rushed in upon the horses and stampeded from two to three hundred, Fitzpatrick at the same time engaging the Indians who numbered from three to four hundred. The Indians recovered a great number of the horses from us, but we succeeded in getting off with the number of our own missing and forty heads besides. In the engagement, six of the enemy were killed and scalped, while not one of our party received a scratch. The horses we had captured were very fine ones, and our return to the camp was greeted with the liveliest demonstrations. We found, on our return from the above marauding expedition, an encampment of Snake Indians to the number of 600 lodges, comprising about 2,500 warriors. They had entirely surrounded us with their encampments, adding very materially to our present population. They were perfectly friendly, and we apprehended no danger from their proximity. It appears that this was their usual resort for spending the winter, and after pitching their lodges, which are composed of skins, they proceeded to build a large medicine lodge. The word medicine 
or as they call it, Barchek Parchek, signifies a prophet or dreamer and is synonymous with the word prophet as employed in the Old Testament. The Indian form of government is a theocracy, and the medicine man is the high priest. His dreams or prophecies are sacred. If his predictions are not verified in the result, the fault is with themselves. They had disregarded some of his instructions. When by accident his dreams are exactly verified, their confidence in their prophet exceeds all belief. The medicine lodge is the tabernacle of the wilderness, the habitation of the great spirit, and the sacred ark of their faith. Our long residence with the snake tribe afforded us an excellent opportunity of acquainting ourselves with the domestic character of the Indians. They often invited us into their medicine lodge to witness their religious ceremonies and listen to their prophesizing. The name of the old prophet was Omogwa, which in English means woman's dress. One evening he delivered a prophecy for us. I can see, said he, white people on a big shell, Platte River. I see them boring a hole in a red bucket. I see them drawing out medicine water, whiskey. I see them fighting each other. But fate, sublet, has gone down on the other side of the river. He does not see them. He has gone to the white lodges. Where are you going? We are going, answered Fitzpatrick, to trap on Bearhead and the other small streams in the country of the Blackfeet. No, said the prophet, you will go to Sheep Mountain. There you will find the snow so deep that you cannot pass. You will then go down Port Neef to Snake River. If you are fortunate, you will discover the Blackfeet before they see you, and you will beat them. If they discover you first, they will rub you all out, kill you all. Bad hand, Fitzpatrick, I tell you there is blood in your path this grass. If you beat the Blackfeet, you will retrace your steps and go to Bear River, whose water you will follow until you come to Sage River. There you will meet two men who will give you news. To return to my narrative, Mr. Sublet, having left the camp in company with my old companion, Mr. Harris, before we returned, had left a letter of instructions for Fitzpatrick, desiring him to remove our camp as early in the spring as possible back to Ketch Valley and to repair to Weaver's Lake, where he would rejoin him. Sublet and Harris had parted for St. Louis, which they reached in safety after a journey in midwinter. We spent the winter very comfortably, and at the opening of spring we all moved, whites and Indians, back to Ketch Valley. Soon after we arrived, we commenced digging catches to secure the 75 packs of beaver skins in the possession of our party. While digging a catch in the bank, the earth caved in, killing two of our party, who were Canadians. The Indians claim the privilege of burying them, which ceremony they perform by hoisting them up in trees. This has ever been the method of disposing of the dead with most, if not all, of the Rocky Mountain tribes. The body is securely wrapped in blankets and robes, fastened with thongs, in which are enclosed the war implements, pipes, and tobacco of the deceits. If he had been a warrior, his war horse is killed and buried, together with his saddle and other implements, at the foot of the same tree. One more accident occurred, which at first occasioned us considerable alarm before we quitted the Cat Valley on our excursion. One of our men was out hunting and coming across an antelope, as he supposed, fired at the animal's head and killed it. On going to cut the animal's throat, to his surprise, he found that he had killed one of the snake Indians who had put on this disguise to decoy the antelopes near him. This was an accident that we deeply lamented, as the snakes were very friendly towards us. Before the Indians discovered the accident, we held a council and resolved to make a precipitate retreat.
as we felt very distrustful of the consequences. While we were preparing to start, the chief came among us and was greatly surprised at our sudden departure, especially as we had given him no previous notice. We excused ourselves by saying we were going to engage in hunting and trapping. He then asked what ailed us, saying we all looked terrified and wished to know what had happened. Fitzpatrick at length told him what had taken place and how it came to pass. Oh, said the chief, if that is what you are alarmed at, take off your packs and stay. The Indian was a fool to use a decoy when he knew the antelope came into the stage every day and that the white men shoot all they see. He then made a speech to his warriors, telling them what had happened and ordered some of his men to bring in the dead Indian. Then, turning to us, he said, You and the snakes are brothers. We are all friends. We cannot at all times guard against accidents. You lost two of your warriors in the bank. The snakes have just lost one. Give me some red cloth to wrap up the body. We will bury the fallen brave. We gave the chief a scarlet blanket as he desired, and all was well again. End of chapter 8. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 9 of The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. The company removes from Catch Valley on a hunting and trapping excursion. Discovery of a band of Blackfeet. A battle ensues with them. Description of the battle. Return to the rendezvous. Fulfillment of the medicine chief's prophecy. The peltry and other things not required in our expedition being all safely catch, our whole party, numbering 250 besides women and children, left Catch Valley for the country of the Blackfeet, expecting to make a profitable hunt. I had engaged to the fur company for the spring hunt for the sum of $500, with the privilege of taking for servant the widow of one of the men who had been killed in the bank. She was of light complexion, smart, trim, and active, and never tired in her efforts to please me. She seemed to think that she belonged to me for the remainder of her life. I had never had a servant before, and I found her of great service to me in keeping my clothes in repair, making my bed, and taking care of my weapons. We kept on till we came to Sheephorn Mountain, but finding it impassable for the snow, we changed our course, and proceeded down the Port Nief until we arrived at its junction with the Snake River, one of the main branches of the Columbia. No trappers having preceded us on the Port Nief, we met with excellent success all the way to the junction, a course which occupied us three weeks. An advance body arriving at the junction before the main body came up, immediately upon landing discovered Indians coming down the Snake River. They were not perceived by the Indians, who were as yet at a considerable distance. Our whole force was soon prepared to meet them, leaving 100 men in camp. The remaining 150 marched up the river, keeping in the timber, our policy being to retain our foes in the open prairie while we kept the protection of the woods. At last they perceived us, but seeing that we had the advantage of them they made signs of great friendship not wishing to be the aggressors we contented ourselves with observing the enemy and retired towards our camp without any hostile demonstrations on either side seeing signal smokes arise on every side we knew an attack on our little pen was meditated by their thousand of mounted warriors we therefore determined on a retreat as the safest course. There being many Indians about our camp, it required a strict watch to be maintained, every man having his gun constantly at hand and the priming well looked to. We were able to converse with them, as many of our men could speak their language, but they still pretended to entertain towards us feelings of the most distinguished consideration. We encamped that night, keeping a strong guard, and saw all around us, as far as the eye could extend, numerous signal fires. At daylight, one of the men shouted, 
Stop the Indians! Stop the Indians! My rope is cut. On looking, we found that three of our best horses had been stolen, notwithstanding our unceasing vigilance. The cry then passed around. The ropes are cut. Shoot them down. Shoot them down. Rifles began to crack, and six of the Indians fell, five of whom were instantly scalped. For the scalps are taken off with greater ease while the bodies are warm. And the remaining Indian, having crawled into the river after receiving his wound, his scalp was lost. One of their chiefs was among the slain. He was shot in our camp before he had time to make his retreat with the others, who all ran as soon as our camp was alarmed. Not a moment was then to be lost. We knew that their signal fires would cover the whole prairie with savages, for we were in the very heart of their country. Packing up, in a few minutes we were on the retreat, which we pressed all day. We encamped the same night, as the Indians did not seem fit to follow us. Soon after this occurrence, a party of fur trappers, consisting of twelve men under the charge of Logan, left our company to try their fortune, but were never heard of afterwards. Every exertion was subsequently made to obtain some clue to the cause of their disappearance, but nothing was ever learned of them. Beyond doubt, they fell victims to the treachery of the Blackfeet. Our party continued trapping up the Port Nief until we came to Sheep Mountain, which we passed without difficulty, the snow having by this time disappeared. We proceeded on to Bear River and continued trapping upon that stream and its tributaries until we reached Sage River, where, very unexpectedly, and to our utter surprise, we met two white men, Black Harris and my old friend Port Toulouse. This verification of the prediction of the old chief was, to say the least, a remarkable coincidence, and one not easily accounted for. Our two friends informed us that they were from St. Louis and had left General Ashley and Sublet but a short distance in the rear. We took up our traps and moved immediately to Weaver Lake and formed their rendezvous to wait the arrival of the general and sublet. While resting, there was a party of 16 flatheads came to our camp and informed us that there were 30 white men with women and children encamped on a creek 12 or 15 miles distant. They stated that the party had 26 guns, but their ammunition was expended. Having some splendid horses in the very best condition, I proposed to go and take them some ammunition in the event of their having need for it on their way to our camp. Provo, Jarvie, and myself mounted three of our fleetest steeds and found the party in camp. As we had expected, we found that they were Campbell's party, among whom were many of our personal friends. They had met with very good fortune in their cruise and had lost none of their men. We encamped with them that night and escorted them to the rendezvous the next day. On our way to the rendezvous, we heard singing in our rear, and, looking in the direction of the noise, we discovered a party of 500 mounted Indians coming directly towards us. Flatheads! Flatheads! was shouted, and, believing them to be such, I and my two friends wheeled to go and meet them. Approaching within a short distance, to our horror and surprise, we discovered they were Blackfeet, a tribe who prize white scalps very highly. Wishing to take us all together, probably, they ordered us back, an order we obeyed with alacrity, and we speedily gave the alarm, bracing the women and children in advance and directing them to make all speed to a patch of willows six miles in front and there, to secure themselves, we formed to hold the Indians in check. The women made good time, considering the jaded state of their animals, for they were all accustomed to horseback riding. By this time, the Indians had commenced charging upon us, not so furiously as was their wont, but they doubtless considered their prey sure, and further, did not care to come into too close proximity to our rifles. Situated 
as we were it was impossible for them to surround us for we had a lake on one side and a mountain on the other they knew however that we must emerge into the open country where their chance of attack would be improved when they approached too near we used our rifles and always with effect our women the meanwhile urging on their animals with all the solicitude of mothers who knew that capture was certain death to their offspring the firing continued between both parties during the whole time of our retreat to the willows in fact it was a running fight through the whole six miles on the way we lost one man who was quite old he might have saved himself by riding to the front and i repeatedly urged him to do so telling him that he could not assist us but he refused even to spur on his horse when the indians made their charges i tarried with him urging him on until i found it would be certain death to delay longer my horse had scarcely made three leaps in advance when i heard him cry oh god i am wounded wheeling my horse i called on my companions to save him i returned to him and found an arrow trembling in his back i jerked it out and gave his horse several blows to quicken his pace but the poor old man reeled and fell from his steed and the indians were upon him in a moment to tear off his scalp this delay nearly cost two more lives for myself and jarby were surrounded with the blackfeet and their triumphant yells told us they felt certain of their prey our only chance of escape was to leap a slough fifteen feet from bank to bank which we vaulted over at full speed one indian followed us and he was shot in the back directly upon reaching the bank and back he rolled into the ditch we passed on around the slough in order to join our companions but in doing so we were compelled to charge directly through a solid rank of indians we passed with the rapidity of pigeons escaping without any damage to ourselves or horses although a shower of arrows and bullets whistled all around us as we progressed their charges became more frequent and daring our ammunition now grew very short and we never used the charge without we were sure of it paying for itself at length we gained the willows if our ammunition had been plenty we would have fought them here as long as they might have wished when all was gone what were we to do with an enemy more than ten times our number who never grants or receives quarter iroke proposed one bold charge for the sake of the women and children let us put our trust in god he exclaimed and if we are to die let us fall in protecting the defenseless they will honor our memory for the bravery they witnessed sixteen of us accordingly mounted our horses leaving the remainder to hold out to the last iroke led the charge in our fierce onset we broke through two ranks of mounted indians killing and overturning everything in our way unfortunately my beautiful horse was killed in its track leaving me alone amid a throng of indians i was wounded with an arrow in the head the scar of which with many other wounds received since i shall carry to my grave the boy baptiste seeing my danger called upon his comrades to assist him to save his brother they charged a second time and the indians who surrounded me were driven back at that moment baptiste rode up to me i sprang on the saddle behind him and retreated in safety to the willows the foe still pressed us sorely but the shots produced little effect except to cut off the twigs of the bushes which formed our hiding place as for charging in upon us they showed some disinclination to hold out much longer was impossible immediate assistance must be had and it could come from no other place than our camp to risk a message there seemed to subject the messenger to inevitable death yet the risk must be encountered by someone who'll go who'll go was asked on all sides i was wounded but not severely and at a time so pressing i hardly knew that i was wounded at all i said 
Give me a swift horse, and I will try to force my way. Do not think I am anxious to leave you in this perilous position. You will run the greatest risk, said they, but if you go, take the best horse. Campbell then said that two had better go, for there might be a chance of one living to reach the camp. Calhoun volunteered to accompany me if he had his choice of horses, to which no one raised any objection. Disrobing ourselves then to the Indian custom and, and tying a handkerchief round our heads, we mounted horses as fleet as the wind and bade the little band adieu. God bless you, shouted the men. The women cried. The great spirit preserve you, my friend. Again we dashed through the ranks of the foe before they had time to comprehend our movement. The balls and arrows flew around us like hail, but we escaped uninjured. Some of the Indians darted in pursuit of us, but seeing they could not overtake us, returned to their ranks. Our noble steeds seemed to fully understand the importance of the mission they were going on. When about five miles from camp, we saw a party of our men approaching us at a slow gallop. We halted instantly and, taking our saddle blankets, signaled to them first for haste and that there was a fight. Perceiving this, one man reeled and returned to the camp, while the others quickened their pace and were with us in a moment. Although they were a mile distant when we made the signal, there were only sixteen, but on they rushed, eager for the fray, and still more eager to save our friends from a horrible massacre. They all turned out from the camp, and soon the road was lined with men, all hurrying along at, at the utmost speed of the animals they bestrode. My companion and I returned with the first party, and breaking once more through the enemy's line, rode back into the willows, amid the cheers of our companions, and the loud acclamations of the women and children who now breathed more freely again. The Indians were surprised at seeing a reinforcement, and their astonishment was increased when they saw a whole line of men coming to our assistance. They instantly gave up the battle and commenced their retreat. We followed them about two miles until we came to the body of Bolier, the old man that had been slain. We then returned, bringing his mangled remains with us. On our side, we lost four men killed and seven wounded. Not a woman or child was injured. From the enemy, we took 17 scalps, most of them near the willows, those that we killed on the road we could not stop for. We were satisfied they had more than a hundred slain, but as they always carry off their dead, we could not ascertain the exact number. We also lost two packs of beavers, a few packs of meat, together with some valuable horses. After attending to our wounded, we all proceeded to camp where the scalp dance was performed by all the half-breeds and women many of the mountaineers taking part in the dance. The battle lasted five hours, and never in my whole life had I run such danger of losing my life and scalp. I now began to deem myself Indian proof, and to think I never should be killed by them. The reader will wonder how a contest could last that length of time when there were but thirty to oppose 500 men, and we not meet with greater loss. It is accounted for by the Indian mode of warfare. The Indian is a poor marksman with a gun more especially on horseback, and to kill with their arrows they must be near their mark. They often shoot their arrows when their horse is in full speed, and unless they are very near their object, they seldom take effect. When they hunt the buffalo, their horses are trained to keep by the side of their distant victim until the arrow is discharged. Then, springing directly away, he escapes the charge of the infuriated animal, which becomes dangerous as soon as wounded. Unlike the Indians, we seldom discharge our guns unless sure of our man for we had no ammunition to waste. 
Our victory was considered under the circumstances a glorious one, and all who participated in the battle, our companions lauded to the skies. The women, too, hailed us as the bravest of the brave, knowing that we had preserved them from a captivity to which death were preferable. Two days after the battle, we were again rejoined by our friends, the snakes, to the number of 4,000. They all took part in our scalp dance, and such a scene of rejoicing as we held has seldom been witnessed in the mountain. They deeply lamented that they had not come in season to take part in the battle, so that not one of the Blackfeet could have escaped. Their wishes for battle, however, were soon afterwards gratified. The absent parties began to arrive, one after the other, at the rendezvous. Shortly after, General Ashley and Mr. Sublet came in, accompanied with 300 pack mules, well laden with goods and all things necessary for the mountaineers and the Indian trade. It may well be supposed that the arrival of such a vast amount of luxuries from the East did not pass off without a general celebration. Mirth, songs, dancing, shouting, trading, running, jumping, singing, racing, target shooting, yawns, frolic with all sorts of extravagances that white men or Indians could invent were freely indulged in. The unpacking of the medicine water was contributed not a little to the heightening of our festivities. We had been informed by Harris, previous to the arrival of the general, the General Ashley had sold out his interest in the mountains to Mr. Sublet, embracing all his properties and possessions there. He now intended to return to St. Louis to enjoy the fortunes he had amassed by so much toil and suffering and in which he had so largely shared in person. End of chapter 9 Recording by Gary Ullman Chapter 10 of The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Great Battle with the Blackfeet. Departure of General Ashley. His Farewell Speech to the Mountaineers. Removal of our Rendezvous. Peace between the Flatheads and Blackfeet. Trading Post at their Village. I become son-in-law to the Blackfoot chief. Trouble in the family. Wife punished for disobedience. Trouble waters finally stilled. Two days after the arrival of the general, the toxin again sounded through our whole camp. The Blackfeet, the Blackfeet. On they came, making the very earth tremble with the tramp of their fiery war horses. In their advance, they surprised three men and two women belonging to the snakes who were out some distance from the camp gathering roots. The whole five were instantly overtaken, killed, and scalped. As soon as the alarm was given, the old prophet came to our camp and advising Mr. Sublet said, Cut face, three of my warriors and two women have just been killed by the Blackfeet. You say that your warriors can fight, that they are great braves. Now let me see them fight, that I may know your words are true. Sublet replied, You shall see them fight, and then you will know that they are all braves, and that I have no cowards among thy men, and that we are all ready to die for our snake friends. Now, men, added he, turning to us, I want every brave man to go and fight these black feet and whip them so that the snakes may see that we can fight and let us do our best before them as a warning to them remember i want none to join in this battle who are not brave let all cowards remain in camp every man was impatient to take part but seeing that his camp would be deserted and his goods exposed he detained quite a number as well as to guard the goods as to keep the general company, he not wishing to take part in the battle. There were over 300 trappers mounted in a few moments, who, with Captain Sublet at their head, charged instantly at the enemy. The snake warriors were also on hand, thirsting to take vengeance on the Blackfeet for the five scalps of their friends. 
After retreating before us about five miles, they formed in place of great security in a deep hollow on the border of the lake. At our arrival, the battle recommenced in great earnest. We and our allies fought them for about six hours. They certainly displaying great intrepidity, for they would repeatedly issue from their stronghold and make a bold sortie against us. When entrenched in their position, they had a great advantage over us, as it was difficult for a man to approach them without being shot, and to charge on them as they were situated would have occasioned us great loss of light. One Indian issuing from their position was shot through the background, thus depriving his legs of all power of motion. Seeing him fall, Sublet said to me, Jim, let us go and haul him away and get a scalp before the Indians draw him in. We went and, seizing each a leg, started towards our lines with him. The wounded Indian, grasping the grass with both hands, we had to haul with all our strength. An Indian suddenly springing up over their breastwork struck me a heavy blow in the back with his gun, causing me to lose hold of my leg and run. Both I and my companion were unarmed, and I, not knowing how many blows were to follow, deemed discretion on this particular occasion the better part of valor. Sublet made a strong demonstration against my assailant with his fists, at the same time calling me back and cursing me for running. I returned, and together we dragged the Indian to one of our men, also wounded for him to dispatch. But the poor fellow had not sufficient strength to perforate the Indian's skin with his knife, and we were obliged to perform the job ourselves. After six hours' fighting, during which time a number of the enemy were slain, we began to want nourishment. Sublet requested our allies to rub out all their foes while we went and procured refreshment. But on our leaving, they followed us, and we all arrived in camp together. On our return to the field of battle, we found the black feet were gone, having departed precipitately, as they had left a number of their dead, a thing unusual with the Indians. The fruits of our victory were 173 scalps with numerous quivers of arrows, war clubs, battle axes, and lances. We also killed a number of their horses, which doubtless was the reason of their leaving so many of their dead upon the field of battle. The trappers had seven or eight men wounded, but none killed. Our allies lost eleven killed in battle, beside the five slain before, but none of those killed in battle were scalped. Had this battle been fought in the open plain, but few of our foes could have escaped, and even as it was, had we continued to fight, not a dozen could have gotten away. But considering that we were fighting for our allies, we did not exert ourselves. As usual, on all such occasions, our victory was celebrated in camp, and the exercises lasted several days, conformably to Indian custom. General Ashley, having disposed of all his goods, and completed his final arrangements, departed for St. Louis, taking with him nearly 200 packs of beaver. Previous to his departure, he summoned all the men into his presence and addressed them, as nearly as I can recollect in the following words. Mountaineers and friends, when I first came to the mountains, I came a poor man. You, by your indefatigable exertions, toils, and privations, have procured me an independent fortune. With ordinary prudence in the management of what I have accumulated, I shall never want for anything. For this, my friends, I feel myself under great obligation to you. Many of you have served with me personally, and I shall always be proud to testify to the fidelity with which you have stood by me through all danger, and the friendly and brotherly feeling which you have ever, one and all, evinced towards me. For these faithful and devoted services, I wish you would accept my thanks. The gratitude that I express to you springs from my heart and will ever retain a lively hold on my feelings.
My friends, I am now about to leave you, to take up my abode in St. Louis. Whenever any of you return thither, your first duty must be to call at my house to talk over the scenes of peril we have encountered and partake of the best cheer my, my table can offer. I now wash my hands of the toils of the Rocky Mountains. Farewell, mountaineers and friends. May God bless you all. We were all sorry to part with the general. He was a man of untiring energy and perseverance, cheerfully enduring every toil and privation with his men. When they were short of food, he likewise hungered. He bore full share in their sufferings and divided his last morsel with them. There was always something encouraging in his manner. No difficulty dejected him. Kind and generous in his disposition, he was loved equally by all. If, which was seldom, he had any disagreement with them, if he discovered himself in fault, he would freely acknowledge his error and ask forgiveness. Before he left, he had a word of advice for me. James, he commenced, since I have been here, I have heard much of your exploits. I like brave men but I fear you are reckless in your bravery. Caution is always commendable, and especially is it necessary in encounters with Indians. I wish you to be careful of yourself and pay attention to your health, for with the powerful constitution you possess, you have many valuable years before you. It is my hearty desire to have you do well and live to a good old age. Correct your fault of encountering risks for the mere ostentatious display of your courage. Whenever you return home, come and see me, James. You will be a thousand times welcome, and should you ever be in need of assistance, call on me first. Goodbye. He left a can amid deafening cheers from the whole crowd. I did not see him again until the year 1836. At the general's departure, we broke up our camp and marched on to the country of the Flatheads on the Snake River. On our arrival at the new rendezvous, we were rejoiced to learn that peace existed between the two nations, the Flatheads and Blackfeet, and that they were in friendly intercourse together. This was very favorable for our purpose, for it is with Indian tribes as with civilized nations when at war various branches of business are impoverished and it becomes inconvenient for those engaged in them to make more than trifling purchases just for the supply of their immediate wants hostilities are still more destructive to indian commerce than to that of civilized nations for the reason that the time and resources of the whole community are engaged in their prosecution. The sinews of war with the Indian means literally himself and his horse. We spent the summer months at our leisure, trading with the Indians, hunting, sporting, and preparing for the fall harvest of beaver. We made acquaintance with several of the Blackfeet who came to the post to trade. One of the chiefs invited Mr. Sublet to establish a branch post in their country, telling him they had many people and horses and plenty of beaver, and if his goods were to be obtained, they would trade considerably. His being so far off prevented his people coming to Mr. Sublet's camp. The Indian appearing sincere, and there being a prospect of opening a profitable trade, Sublet proposed to establish a post among the Blackfeet, if any of the men were willing to risk their scalps in attending it. I offered to go, although I was well aware the tribe knew that I had contributed to the destruction of a number of their braves, but to the Indian the greater the brave, the higher their respect for him, even though an enemy. So taking my boy Baptiste and one man with me, we packed up and started for Beaver River, which is a branch of the Missouri and in the heart of the Blackfoot country. On our arrival, the Indians manifested great appearance of friendship and were highly pleased at having a trading post so conveniently at hand. 
I soon rose to be a great man among them, and the chief offered me his daughter for a wife. Considering this an alliance that would guarantee my life as well as enlarge my trade, I accepted his offer, and without any superfluous ceremony became son-in-law to as as to the head chief of the Blackfeet. As as to interpreted, means heavy shield. To me the alliance was more offensive than defensive. But thrift was my object more than hymeneal enjoyments. Trade prospered greatly. I purchased beaver and horse at my own price. Many times I brought a fine beaver skin for a butcher knife or a plug of tobacco. After residence among them of a few days, I had a slight difficulty in my family affairs. A party of Indians came into camp one day, bringing with them three white men's scalps. The sight of them made my blood boil with rage, but there was no help for it, so I determined to wait with patience my day of revenge. In accordance with their custom, a scalp dance was held, at which there was much additional rejoicing. My wife came to me with the information that her people were rejoicing and that she wished to join them in the dance. I replied, no. These scalps belong to my people. My heart is crying for their death. You must not rejoice when my heart cries. You must not dance when I mourn. She then went out, as I supposed, satisfied. My two white friends, having a great curiosity to witness the performance, were looking out upon the scene. I reproved them for wishing to witness the savage rejoicings over the fall of white men who had probably belonged to our own company. One of them answered, Well, your wife is the best dancer of the whole party. She outdances them all. This was a sting which pierced my very heart. Taking my battle axe and forcing myself into the ring, I watched my opportunity and struck my disobedient wife a heavy blow on the head with the side of the battle axe, which dropped her as if a ball had pierced her heart. I dragged her through the crowd and left her. I then went back to my tent. This act was performed in such a bold manner under the very noses of a hundred of them that they were thunderstruck and for a moment remained motionless with surprise. When I entered the tent, I said to my companions, There now, you had better prepare to hold on to your own scalps, since you take so much interest in celebration over those of your murdered brethren. Their countenances turned ashy pale, expecting instant death. By this time, the whole Indian camp was in a blaze. Kill him! Kill him, burn him, burn him, was shouted throughout the camp in their own language, which I plainly understood. I was collected, for I knew they could kill me but once. Soon I heard the voice of my father-in-law crying, in a tone which sounded above all. Stop, hold, hold, warriors, listen to your chief. All was hushed in an instant, and he continued, Warriors, I am the loser of a daughter, and her brothers have lost a sister. You have lost nothing. She was the wife of the traitor. I gave her to him. When your wives disobey your commands, you kill them. That is your right. That thing disobeyed her husband. He told her not to dance. She disobeyed him. She had no ears. He killed her, and he did right. He did as you all would have done, and you shall neither kill nor harm him for it. I promised the white chief that if he would send the traitor to my people, I would protect him and return him unarmed. This I must do, and he shall not be hurt here. Warriors, wait till you meet him in battle, or perhaps in his own camp, then kill him. But here his life is sacred. What if we kill them all and take what they have? It will last but a few suns. We shall then want more. Whom do we get such a punch powder from? We got it from the whites, and when we have expended what we have, we must do without or go to them for more. When we have no powder, can we fight our enemies with plenty? 
If we kill these three men whom I have given the word of a chief to protect, the wife chief will send us no more, but his braves will revenge the death of his brothers. No, no, you shall not harm them here. They have eaten of our meat and drunk of our water. They have also smoked with us. When they have sold their goods, let them return in peace. At this time, there was a great many flatheads at the Blackfoot camp, as they were at peace with each other. After the speech of my father-in-law, a great brave of the flatheads, called Bad Hand, replied, Hey, you are yourself again. You talk well. You talk like as as to again. We are now at peace. If you had killed these men, we should have made war on you again. We should have raised the battle axe, never to have buried it. These whites are ours, and the Flatheads would have revenged their deaths if they had been killed in your camp. The chief then made a loud and long harangue, after which all became quiet. As Astu next came to my camp and said, My son, you have done right. That woman I gave you had no sense. Her ears were stopped up. She would not hearken to you, and you had a right to kill her. But I have another daughter who is younger than she was. She is more beautiful. She has good sense and good ears. You may have her in place of the bad one. She will hearken to all you say to her. Well, thought I, this is getting married again before I have even had time to mourn. But I replied, very well, my father, I will accept of your kind offer, well knowing at the same time that to refuse him would be to offend as he would suppose that I disdained his generosity. My second wife was brought to me. I found her, as her father had represented, far more intelligent, far prettier than her other sister, and I was really proud of the change. I now possessed one that many a warrior had performed deeds of bloody valor to obtain, for it is a high honor to get the daughter of a great chief to wife, and many a bold warrior has sacrificed his life in seeking to attain such a prize. During the night, while I and my wife were quietly reposing, some persons crawled into our couch, sobbing most bitterly. Angry at the intrusion, I asked, who was there? Me, answered a voice, which, although well nigh stifled with bitter sobs, I recognized as that of my other wife, whom everyone had supposed dead. After lying outside the lodge, senseless for some hours, she had recovered and groped her way to my bed. Go away, I said, you have no business here. I have a new wife now, one who has sense. I will not go away, she replied. My ears are open now. I was a fool not to hearken to my husband's words when his heart was crying. But now I have good sense and will always hearken to your words. It did really seem as if her heart was broken and she kept her position until morning. I thought myself now well supplied with wives, having two more than I cared to have. But I deemed it Hardly worth while to complain, as I should soon leave the camp, wives and all. It is a universal adage. When you are among the Romans, do as the Romans do. I conform to the customs of a people really pagan, but who regarded themselves both enlightened and powerful. I was risking my life for gold that I might return one day with plenty to share with her I tenderly loved. My body was among the Indians, but my mind was far away from them and their bloody deeds. Experience has revealed to me that civilized man can accustom himself to any mode of life when pelf is the governing principle, that power which dominates through all the ramifications of social life, and gives expression to the universal instinct of self-interest. By living with the savages and becoming familiar with their deeds of injustice and cruelty, witnessing friends and companions struck down without a moment's warning, if a man has feelings, 
In a short time it becomes callous towards the relentless savage who can mock the dying struggles of the white man and indulge his inhuman joy as he sees his warm lifeblood saturate the earth on which a few moments since his victim stood erect in seeming security. Many a companion have I seen fall in the wild prairie or the mountain forest, dying with some dear name upon their lips, his body left as food for the wild beasts, or his bones to whiten in the trackless wilderness. It will be said he might have stayed at home and not have hazarded his life amid such dangers. So it might be said of the hardy mariner, whose compass guides him through all parts of the pathless ocean. The same motive impels them, both on their perilous career, self-interest, which, while it gratifies their individual desires, at the same time enriches and advances society by adding his acquisitions to the mart of commerce. We left the Blackfoot country after a stay of twenty days, having purchased thirty-nine packs of beaver and several splendid horses at a sum trifling in real value, but what they considered as far exceeding the worth of their exchanges. The chief lent us an escort of 250 mounted warriors, in addition to which nearly 100 flatheads returned with us to our camp, whom we met the second day on our road. They having become alarmed for our safety and being on the way to revenge our deaths in the event of the Blackfeet having proved treacherous. On our arrival, we were greeted with the liveliest expressions of joy. Presents were made to our escorts, and Mr. Sublet sent his father-in-law a valuable gift for his kindness to me, and as the assurance of his most distinguished consideration. I also sent some dress patterns to my wives, in addition to the presents I had previously made them. The Blackfeet, apparently well satisfied, returned to their homes. End of chapter 10「The Life and Adventure of James P. Beckworth」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner Chapter 11 Removal of our rendezvous, battle with our friends, the Blackfeet, a race for dear life, great victory over the Grovand band of Blackfeet. After we had rested, we departed for Snake River, making the Blackfoot Buttes on our way, in order to pass through the Buffalo region. I received a severe lecture from Mr. Sublet for my rashness while at the trading post. The second day of our march, one of our men, while fishing, detected a party of Blackfeet in the act of stealing our horses in the open day. But for the man, they would have succeeded in making off with a great number. The alarm was given, and we mounted and gave immediate chase. The Indians were forty-four in number and on foot. Therefore, they became an easy prey. We ran them into a thicket of dry bush which we surrounded and then fired in several places. It was quite dry, and there being good breeze at the time, it burned like chafe. This driving the Indians out, as fast as they made their appearance, we shot them with our rifles. Every one of them was killed. Those who escaped our bullets were consumed in the fire, and as they were all more or less roasted, we took no scalps. None of our party were hurt except one who was wounded by one of our men. On the third day, we found buffalo and killed great numbers of them by a surround. At this place, we lost six horses, three of them belonging to myself, two to a Swiss, and one to Baptiste. Not relishing the idea of losing them, 
for they were splendid animals, and seeing no sign of Indians, I and the Swiss started along the back track in pursuit with the understanding that we would rejoin our company at the Buttes. We followed them to the last place of rendezvous. Their tracks were fresh and plain, but we could gain no sight of our horses. We then gave up the chase and encamped in the thicket. In the morning we started to return and had not proceeded far when, hearing a noise in our rear, I looked round and saw between two or three hundred Indians within a few hundred yards of us. They soon discovered us and from their not making immediate pursuit, I inferred that they mistook us for two of their own party. However, they soon gave chase. They being also on foot, I said to my companion, Now we have as good a chance of escaping as they have of overtaking us. The Swiss, named Alexander, said, It is of no use for me to try to get away. I cannot run, save yourself, and never mind me. No, I replied, I will not leave you. Run as fast as you can until you reach the creek. There you can secrete yourself, for they will pursue me. He followed my advice and saved himself. I crossed the stream, and when I then appeared in sight of the Indians, I was on the summit of a small hill two miles in advance. Giving a general yell, they came in pursuit of me. On I ran, not daring to indulge the hope that they would give up the chase. But some of the Indians are great runners and would rather die than incur the ridicule of their brethren. On and on we tore, I to save my scalp and my pursuers to win it. At length I reached the buttes where I had expected to find the camp, but to my inconceivable horror and dismay, my comrades were not there. They had found no water on their route and had proceeded to the river forty-five miles distance. My feeling at this disappointment transcended expression. A thousand ideas peopled my feverish brain at once. Home, friends, and my loved one presented themselves with one lightning flash. The Indians were close at my heels. Their bullets were whizzing past me. Their yells sounded painfully in my ears, and I could almost feel the knife making a circuit around my skull. On I bounded, however, following the road which our whole company had made. I was scorching with thirst, having tasted neither sup nor bit since we commenced the race. I kept safely in advance of the range of their bullets, when suddenly the glorious sight of the camp smoke caught my eye. My companions perceived me at a mile from the camp, as well as my pursuers, and mounting their horses to meet me, soon turned the tables on my pursuers. It was now the Indians turn to be chased. They must have suffered as badly with thirst as I did, and our men cut them off from the river. Night had begun to close in. Under the protection of which the Indians escaped, our men returned with only five scalps, according to the closest calculation. I ran that day ninety-five miles. My heels thus deprived the rascally Indians of their anticipated pleasure of dancing over my scalp. My limbs were so much swollen the next morning that for two or three days ensuing it was with great difficulty I got about. My whole system was also in great pain. In a few days, however, I was as well as ever and ready to pay the Indians for their trouble. The third day after my escape, my companion, Alec, found his way into camp. He entered the lodge with dejection on his features. Oh, he exclaimed, I thank God for my escape, but the Indians have killed poor Jim. I saw his bones a few miles back. I will give anything I have if a party will go with me and bury him. The wolves have almost picked his bones, but it must be he. Poor Jim, gone at last. Ha! said someone present. Is Jim killed then? Poor fellow. Well, Alec, let us go back and give him a Christian burial. He had seen a body nearly devoured on the way, most likely that of a wounded Indian who had chased me in his retreat from our camp. I came limping into the crowd at this moment, and concerning this great race for life, it may appear impossible to some for a human being to accomplish such a feat. Those who survive of Sublet's company, and who knows the distances from point to point of my celebrated race, will please to correct me 
publicly if i am in error in the distance i have known i have known instances of indian runners accomplishing more than one hundred and ten miles in one day narrator i came limping into the crowd at this moment and addressed him before he had perceived me hello Alec. are you safe he looked at me for a moment in astonishment and then embraced me so tight that i thought he would suffocate me he burst into a flood of tears which for a time prevented his articulation he looked at me again and again as if in doubt of my identity at length he said oh jim you are safe and how did you escape i made sure that you were killed and that the body i saw on the road was yours sure i stopped and shed tears on a confounded dead indian's carcass alex stated that the enemy had passed within ten feet without perceiving him that his gun was cocked and well primed so that if he had been discovered there would have been one redskin less to chase me he had seen no indians on his way to camp I was satisfied that some, if not all, of my pursuers knew me, for they were Blackfeet, or they would not have taken such extraordinary pains to run me down. If they had succeeded in their endeavor, they would, in subsequent years, have saved their tribe many scalps. From this encampment, we moved on to Lewis's Fork on the Columbia River, where we made a final halt to prepare for the fall trapping season some small parties getting tired of inaction would occasionally sally out to the small mountain streams all of which contained plenty of beaver and would frequently come in with several skins i prepared my trap one day thinking to go out alone and see what my luck might be i mounted my horse and on approaching a small stream dismounted to take careful survey to see if there were any signs of beaver carefully I mounted my horse and on approaching a small stream dismounted to take a careful survey to see if there were any signs of beaver. Carefully ascending the bank of the stream, I peered over and saw not a beaver but an Indian. He had his robe spread on the grass and was engaged in freeing himself from vermin, with which all Indians abound. He had not seen nor heard me. His face was towards me, but inclined, and he was intently pursuing his occupation. Here, thought I, are a gun, a bow, a quiver full of arrows, a good robe, and a scalp. I fired my rifle, the Indian fell over without uttering a sound. I not only took his scalp, but his head. I tied two locks of his long hair together, hung his head on the horn of my saddle, and taking the spoils of the enemy, hurried back to camp. The next morning our camp was invested by 2,500 warriors of the Blackfoot tribe. We had now something on our hands which demanded attention. We were encamped in the bend of a river in the horseshoe. Our lodges were pitched at the entrance, or the narrowest part of the shoe, while our animals were driven back into the bend. The lodges, four deep, extended nearly across the land forming a kind of barricade in front not a very safe one for the inmates since being covered with buffalo hides they were penetrable to bullet and arrow the indians made a furious charge we immediately placed the women and children in the rear sending them down the bend where they were safe unless we were defeated we suffered the Indians for a long time to act on the offensive, being content with defending ourselves and the camp. I advised Captain Sublet to let them weary themselves with charging, by which time we would mount and charge them with greater prospect of victory. Whereas should we tire ourselves while they were fresh, we should be overwhelmed by their numbers and, if not defeated, inevitably lose a great many men. All the mountaineers approved of my advice, and our plans were taken accordingly. They drove us from our first position twice, so that our lodges were between the contending ranks, but they never broke our lines. When they approached us very near, we resorted to our arrows, which all our half-breeds used as skillfully as the Indians. Finally, perceiving their numbers and if not defeated, inevitably lose a great many men. 
All the mountaineers approved of my advice, and our plan was taken accordingly. They drove us from our first position twice. When they approached us very near, we resorted to our arrows, which all our half-breeds used as skillfully as the Indians. Finally, perceiving they began to tire, I went and ordered the women to saddle the horses in haste. A horse was soon ready for each man, four hundred in number. Taking one hundred and thirty men, I passed out through the timber, keeping near the river until we could all emerge and form a line to charge them, unobserved in the rear. While executing this division, the main body was to charge them in front. While defiling through the timber, we came suddenly upon ten Indians who were resting from the fight, were sitting on the ground unconcernedly smoking their pipes. We killed nine of them. The tenth one was making good his retreat. Our maneuver succeeded admirably. The Indians were unconscious of our approach in their rear until they began to fall from their horses. Then, charging on their main body simultaneously with Captain Sublet's charge in front, their whole force was thrown into irretrievable confusion, and they fled without further resistance. We did not pursue them, feeling very well satisfied to have got rid of them as we had. They left 167 dead on the field. Our loss was also very severe. 16 killed, mostly half-breeds, and 50 or 60 wounded. In this action, I received a wound in my left side, although I did not perceive it until the battle was over. As usual, there was a scalp dance after the victory in which I really feared that the fair sex would dance themselves to death. They had a crying spell afterward for the dead. After all, it was a victory rather dearly purchased. A few days after our battle, one of our old trappers named Le Bluex, who had spent twenty years in the mountains, came to me and telling me he knew of a small stream full of beaver which ran into Lewis's Fork about thirty miles from camp, wished me to accompany him there. We being free trappers at that time, the chance of obtaining a pack or two of beaver was rather a powerful incentive. Gain being my objective, I readily acceded to his proposal. We put out from camp during the night and traveled up Lewis's Fork, leisurely discussing our prospects and confidently enumerating our unhatched chickens when suddenly a large party of Indians came in sight in our rear. The banks of the river we were traveling along were precipitous and rocky and skirted with thick bush. We entered the bush without a moment's hesitation, for the Indians advanced on us as soon as they had caught sight of us. La Blue X had a small bell attached to his horse's neck, which he took off, and, creeping to a large bush, fastened it, with the end of his lariat, and returned holding the other end in his hand. This stratagem caused the Indians to expend a great amount of powder and shot in their effort to kill the bell, for of course they supposed the bell indicated the position of ourselves. When they approached near enough to be seen through the bushes, we fired one gun at a time, always keeping the other loaded. When we fired, the bell would ring as if the horse was startled, by the close proximity of the gun, but the smoke would not rise in the right place. They continued to shoot at random into the bushes without entering us or our faithful animals, who were close by us, but entirely concealed from the sight of the Indians. My companion filled his pipe and commenced smoking with as much sang -froid as if he had been in camp. This is the last smoke I expect to have between here and camp, said he. What are we to do? I inquired, not feeling our position very secure in a brush fort manned with a company of two and beleaguered by scores of Blackfoot warriors. In an instant, before I had time to think, crack went his rifle and down came an Indian, who, more bold than the rest, had approached too near to our garrison. Now, said Labuex, bind your leggings and moccasins around your head. I did so while I, he obeyed the same order. Now follow me. 
wondering what bold project he was about to execute i quietly obeyed him he went noiselessly to the edge of the bluff looking narrowly up and down the river and then commenced to slide down the almost perpendicular bank i closely followed him we safely reached the river into which we dropped ourselves we swam close under the bank for more than a mile until they discovered us wondering what bold project now said my comrade strike across the stream in double quick time we soon reached the opposite bank and found ourselves a good mile and a half ahead of the indians they commenced plunging into the river in pursuit but they were too late we ran across the open ground until we reached the mountain where we could safely look back and laugh at our pursuers we had lost our horses and guns while they had sacrificed six or eight of their warriors beside missing the two scalps they made so certain of getting hold of i had thought myself a pretty good match for the indians but i at once resigned all claims to merit la bluex in addition to all the acquired wiles of the red man possessed his own superior art and cunning he could be surrounded with no difficulties for which his inexhaustible brain could not devise some secure mode of escape we arrived safe at camp before the first guard was relieved following morning we received a severe reprimand from captain sublette for exposing ourselves on so hazardous an adventure as soon as the wounded was sufficiently recovered to be able to travel we moved down the river to the junction of salt river with guy's fork about a mile from snake river the next day the captain resolved to pass up to guy's fork to a convenient camping ground where we were to spend the interval until it was time to separate into small parties and commence trapping in good earnest for the season one day while moving leisurely along two men and myself proposed to the captain to proceed ahead of the main party to ascertain the best road to reconnoitre the various streams in short to make it a trip of discovery we were to encamp one night and rejoin the main body the next morning the captain consented but gave us strict caution to take good care of ourselves nothing of importance occurred that day but the next morning around sunrise we were all thunderstruck at being roused from our sleep by the discharge of guns close at hand two of us rose in an instant and gave the war hoop as a challenge for them to come on poor cotton the third of our party was killed at the first fire when they saw us arise rifle in hand they drew back whereas had they rushed on with their battle-axes they could have killed us in an instant one of our horses was also killed which with the body of our dead comrade we used for a breastwork throwing up at the same time all the dirt we could to protect ourselves as far as we were able the indians five hundred in number showered their balls at us but being careful to keep at a safe distance they did us no damage for some time at length my companion received a shot through the heel while carelessly throwing up his feet in crawling to get a sight at the indians without exposing his body i received some slight scratches but no injury that occasioned me any real inconvenience providence at last came to our relief our camp was moving along slowly shooting buffalo occasionally when some of the women hearing our guns ran to the captain exclaiming there is a fight hark hear the guns he concluding that there were more distant fighting than is common in killing buffalo dispatched sixty men in all possible haste in the direction of the reports we saw them as they appeared in sight on the brow of a hill not far distant, and sent up a shout of triumph the indians also caught sight of them and immediately retreated leaving seventeen warriors dead in front of our little fort whom we relieved of their scalps we returned to camp after burying our companion whose body was literally riddled with bullets the next day we made a very successful surround of buffalo killing great numbers of them in the evening several of our friends 
The snakes came to us and told us their village was only five miles further up, wishing us to move up near them to open a trade. After curing our meat, we moved on and encamped near the friendly snakes. We learned that there were 185 lodges in Punox and camped only two miles distance. A discarded band of the snakes, very bad Indians and very great thieves. Captain Sublet informed the snakes that if the Punax should steal any of his horses or anything belonging to his camp, he would rub them all out, and he wished the friendly snakes to tell them so. Two of our men and one of the snakes having strolled down to the Punak lodges one evening, they were set upon, and the snake was killed, and the two of our camp came home wounded. The morning volunteers were called to punish the Punaks for their outrage. Two hundred and fifteen immediately presented themselves at the call, and our captain appointed Bridger leader of the troop. We started to inflict vengeance. But when we arrived at the site of the village, behold, there was no village there. They had packed up and left immediately after the perpetration of the outrage. They, fearing no doubt that apple vengeance would be taken upon them. We followed their trail 45 miles and came up with them on Green River. Seeing our approach, they all made across to a small island in the river. What shall we do now, Jim? inquired our leader. I will cross to the other side with one half of the men, I suggested, and get abreast of the island. Their retreat will be thus cut off, and we can exterminate them in their trap. Go, said he. I will take them if they attempt to make this shore. I was soon in position, and the enfilading commenced, and was continued until there was not one left of either sex or any age. We carried back 488 scalps, and as we then supposed, annihilated the Poonet band. On our return, however, we found six or eight of their squaws who had been left behind in the flight, whom we carried back and gave to the snakes. On informing the snakes of what had taken place, they expressed great delight. Eight, they said, Poonaks, very bad Indians, and they joined in the scalp dance. We afterwards learned that the Punaks, when they fled from our vengeance, had previously sent their old men and a great portion of their women and children to the mountains, at which we were greatly pleased, as it spared the effusion of much unnecessary blood. They had a great medicine chief slain with the others on the island. His medicine was not good this time, at least. We proceeded thence to a small creek called Blackfoot Creek in the heart of Blackfoot country. It was always our custom, before turning out our horses in the morning, to send out spies to reconnoiter around and see if any Indians were lurking about to steal them. When preparing to move one morning from the last Dame Creek, we sent out two men, but they had not proceeded twenty yards from our corral before a dozen shots were fired at them by a party of Blackfeet, bringing them from their horses severely wounded. In a moment the whole camp was in motion. The savages made a bold and desperate attempt to rush upon the wounded and get their scalps. We were on the ground in time to prevent them and drove them back, killing four of their numbers. The next day we were overtaken by the snakes who, hearing of our skirmish, expressed great regret that they were not present to have followed them and given them battle again. We seldom followed the Indians after having defeated them, unless they had stolen our horses. It was our policy always to act on the defensive, even to the tribes that were known enemies. When the snakes were ready, we all moved on together for the head of the Green River. The Indians numbered six or seven thousand, including women and children. Our number was nearly eight hundred altogether, forming quite a formidable little army, or, more properly, a moving city. The number of horses belonging to the whole camp was immense. We had no farther difficulty in reaching Green River, where we remained six days. During this short stay, our numberless horses exhausted the grass in our vicinity, and it was imperative to change positions.
it was now early in september and it was time to break up our general encampment and spread in all directions as the hunting and trapping season was upon us before we formed our dispersing parties a number of the crows came to our camp and were rejoiced to see us again the snakes and crows were extremely amicable the crows were questioning the snakes about some scalps hanging on our lodge poles they gave them particulars of our encounter with the Blackfeet, how valiantly we had fought them, and how we had defeated them. The Crows were highly gratified to see so many scalps taken from their old and inveterate foes. Their old and inveterate foes. They wished to see the braves who had fought so nobly. I was pointed out as the one who had taken the greatest number of scalps. They had told them they had seen me fight and that i was a very great brave upon this i became the object of the crow's administration they were very anxious to talk to me and to cultivate my acquaintance but i could speak very little of their language one of the men named greenwood whose wife was a crow could speak their language fluently he and his wife were generally resorted to by the crows to afford full details of our recent victory. Greenwood, becoming tired of so much questioning, invented a fiction which greatly amused me for its ingenuity. He informed them that white-handled knife, as the snakes called me, was a crow. They all started in astonishment at this information and asked how that could be, said Greenwood in reply. You know that so many winters ago the Cheyennes defeated the Crows, killing many hundreds of their warriors and carrying off a great many of their women and children. Yes, we know it, they all exclaimed. Well, he was a little boy at that time, and the whites brought him to the Cheyennes, with whom he had stayed ever since. He has become a great brave among them, and all your enemies fear him. On hearing this astonishing revelation, they said that I must be given to them. Placing implicit faith in every word that they had heard, they hastened to their village to disseminate the joyful news that they had found one of their own people who had been taken by the Shians when a Barkata child who had been sold to the whites and who had now become a great white chief with his large bowl full of the scalps of the Blackfeet who had fallen beneath his gun and battle axe this excited a great commotion throughout their whole village throughout their whole village all the old men who remembered the defeat when the crows lost two thousand warriors and a host of women and children with the ensuing captivity were wondering if the great brave was not their own child thereupon ensured the greatest anxiety to see me and claim me as a son. I did not say a word in punging the authenticity of Greenwood's romance. I was greatly edified at the inordinate gullibility of the red man, and when they had gone to spread their tale of wonderment, we had a hearty laugh at their expense. Our party now broke up. Detachments were formed and leaders chosen. We issued from the camp and started in all directions, receiving instructions to return within a certain day. There were a great many fur trappers with us who hunted for their own profit and disposed of their peltry to the mountain trades. The trappers were accompanied by a certain number of hired men, selected according to their individual preferences, the strength of their party being regulated by the fire of the country they were going to if a party was going to the blackfoot country it needed to be numerous and well armed if going among the crows or snakes where no danger was apprehended there would go few or many just as was agreed upon among themselves but each party was in strict obedience to the will of its captain or leader his word was supreme law my party started for the crow country at which I was well content, for being a supposed crow myself, I expected to fare well among them. It seemed a relief also to be in a place where we could rest from our unsleeping vigilance, and to feel 
when we rose in the morning there was some probability of our living tonight end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the life and adventures of james p beckworth by thomas d bonner this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 12. Departure from the Rendezvous. Leave the party and traps. Arrival at the Crow Village. Great stir among the crows. Joyful meeting with my crow parents, brothers, and sisters. Three years without seeing a white man. I now parted with very many of my friends for the last time. Most of the members of that large company now sleep in death, their waking ears no longer to be filled with the death-telling yell of the savage. The manly hearts that shrunk from no danger have ceased to beat. Their bones whitened in the gloomy fastness of the Rocky Mountains or molder on the ever-flowering prairies of the far west. A cloven skull is all that remains of my once gallant friends to tell the bloody death that they died and invoke vengeance on the merciless hand that struck them down in their ruddy youth. Here I parted from the boy Baptiste, who had been my faithful companion so long. I never saw him again. The party that I started with consisted of 31 men, most of them skillful trappers, Captain Bridger, was in our party, and commanded by Robert Campbell. We started for Powder River, a fork of the Yellowstone, and arriving there without accident, was soon busied in our occupation. A circumstance occurred in our encampment on this stream. Trivial in itself, for trivial events sometimes determine the course of a man's life, but which led to unexpected results. I had set my six traps overnight and on going to them the following morning i found four beavers but one of my traps was missing i sought it i sought it in every direction but without success and on my return to camp mentioned the mystery captain bridger as skillful a hunter as ever lived in the mountains, offered to renew the search with me, expressing confidence that the trap could be found. We searched diligently along the river and the bank for a considerable distance, but the trap was among the missing. The float pole also was gone, a pole ten or twelve feet long and four inches thick. We at length gave it up as lost. The next morning, the whole party moved further up the river. To shorten our route, Bridger and myself crossed the stream at the spot where I had set my missing trap. It was a buffalo crossing, and there was a good trail worn in the banks, so that we could easily cross with our horses. After passing and traveling on some two miles, I discovered what I supposed to be a badger, and we both made a rush for him. On closer inspection, however, it proved to be my beaver with trap, chain, and float pole. It was apparent that some buffalo in crossing the river had become entangled in the chain and, as we conceived, had carried the trap on his shoulder with a beaver pendant on one side and the pole on the other. We inferred that he had in some way got his head under the chain between the trap and the pole, and, in his endeavors to extricate himself, had pushed his head through. The hump on his back would prevent it passing over his body, and away he would speed with his burden, probably urged forward by the four sharp teeth of the beaver, which would doubtless object to his certain equestrian, or rather bovine, journey. We killed the beaver and took his skin, feeling much satisfaction at the solution of the mystery. When we arrived at camp, we asked our companions to guess how and where we had found the trap. They all gave various guesses, but failing to hit the truth, gave up the attempt. Well, gentlemen, said I, it was stolen. Stolen? exclaimed a dozen voices at once. Yes, it was stolen by a buffalo. Oh, come now, said one of the party. What is the use of coming here and telling such a lie? 
I saw in a moment that he was angry and in earnest, and I replied, If you deny that a buffalo stole my trap, you tell the lie. He rose and struck me a blow with his fist. It was my turn now, and the first pass I made brought my antagonist to the ground. On rising, he sprang for his gun. I assumed mine as quickly. The bystanders rushed between us, and sizing our weapons compelled us to discontinue our strife, which would have infallibly resulted in the death of one. My opponent mounted his horse and left the camp. I never saw him afterwards. I could have taken his expression in jest, for we were very free in our sallies upon one another, but in this particular instance I saw his intention was to insult me, and I allowed my passion to overcome my reflection. My companions counseled me to leave camp for a few days till the ill feeling should have subsided. The same evening Bridger and myself started out with our traps, intending to be gone three or four days. We followed up a small stream until it forked, when Bridger proposed that I should take one fork and he the other, and the one who had set his traps first should cross the hill which separated the two streams and rejoin the other. Thus we parted, expecting to meet again in a few hours. I continued my course up the stream in pursuit of beaver villages till I found myself among an innumerable drove of horses, and I could plainly see they were not wild ones. The horses were guided by several of their Indian owners, or horse guards, as they termed them, who had discovered me long before I saw them. I could hear their signals to each other, and in a few moments I was surrounded by them, and escape was impossible. I resigned myself to my fate. If they were enemies, I knew they could kill me but once, and had to attempt to defend myself would entail inevitable death. I took the chances between death and mercy. I surrendered my gun, traps, and what else I had, and was marched to camp under a strong escort of horse guards. I felt very sure that my guards were crows, therefore I did not feel greatly alarmed at my situation. On arriving at their village, I was ushered into the chief's lodge, where there were several old men and women, whom I conceived to be members of the family. My capture was known throughout the village in five minutes, and hundreds gathered around the lodge to get a sight of the prisoner. In the crowd were some who had talked to Greenwood a few weeks before. They at once exclaimed, That is the lost crow, the great brave who has killed so many of our enemies. He is our brother. This threw the whole village into commotion. Old and young were impatient to obtain a sight of the great brave. Orders were immediately given to summon all the old women taken by the Shians at the time of their captivity, so many winters past, who had suffered the loss of a son at that time. The lodge was cleared for the examining committee, and the old women, breathless with the excitement, their eyes wild and protruding, and their nostrils dilated, arrived in squads until the lodge was filled to overflowing. I believe never was mortal gazed at with such intense and sustained interest as I was on that occasion. Arms and legs were critically scrutinized. My face next passed the ordeal, then my neck back, breast, and all parts of my body, even down to my feet, which did not escape the examination of these anxious matrons, in their endeavor to discover some mark or peculiarity whereby to recognize their brave son. At length, one old woman, after having scanned my visage with the utmost intensity, came forward and said, If this is my son, he has a mole over one of his eyes. My eyelids were immediately pulled down to the utmost stretch of their elasticity, when, sure enough, she discovered a mole just over my left eye. Then, and oh then, such shouts of joy as were uttered by that honest-hearted woman were seldom before heard, while all in the crowd took part in her rejoicing. 
It was uncultivated joy, but not the least heartfelt and intense. It was a joy which a mother can only experience when she recovers a son whom she had supposed dead in his earliest days. She had mourned him silently through weary nights and busy days for the long space of twenty years. Suddenly he presents himself before her in a robust manhood and graced with the highest name an indian can appreciate it is but nature either in the savage breast or civilized that hails such a return with overwhelming joy and feels the mother's undying affection awakened beyond all control all the other claimants resigning their pretensions i was fairly carried along by the excited crowd to the lodge of the big bull who was my father the news of my having proved to be the son of Mrs. Big Bull flew through the village with the speed of lightning, and on my arrival at the paternal lodge I found it filled with all degrees of my newly discovered relatives who welcomed me nearly to death. They seized me in their arms and hugged me, and my face positively burned with the enraptured kisses of my numerous fair sisters with a long host of cousins aunts and other more remote kindred all these welcoming ladies were firmly believed in my identity with the lost ones as they believed in the existence of the great spirit my father knew me to be his son told all the crows that the dead was alive again and the lost one was found he knew it was fact. Greenwood had said so, and the words of Greenwood were true. His tongue was not crooked. He would not lie. He also had told him that his son was a great brave among the white men, that his arm was strong, that the Blackfeet quailed before his rifle and battle-axe, that his lodge was full of their scalps, which his knife had taken that they must rally around me to support and protect me, and that his long lost son would be strong breastwork to their nation, and he would teach them how to defeat their enemies. They all promised that they would do as his word had indicated. My unmarried sisters were four in number very pretty, intelligent young women. They, as soon as the departure of the crowd would admit, took off my old leggings and moccasins and other garments and supplied their place with new ones most beautifully ornamented according to their very last fashion. My sisters were very ingenious in stuff work, and they well nigh quarreled among themselves for the privilege of dressing me. When my toilet was finished, to their satisfaction, I could compare in elegance with the most popular warrior of the tribe when in full costume. They also prepared me a bed not so high as Haman's gallows, certainly, but just as high as the lodge would admit. This was also a token of their esteem and sisterly affection. While conversing to the extent of my ability with my father in the evening and affording him full information respecting the white people, their great cities, their numbers, their power, their opulence, he suddenly demanded of me if I wanted a wife, thinking, no doubt, that if he got me married, I should lose all discontent and forego any wish of returning to the whites. I assented, of course. Very well, said he. You shall have a pretty wife and a good one. Away he strode to the lodge of one of the greatest braves and asked one of his daughters of him to bestow upon his son who the chief must have heard was also a great brave the consent of the parent was readily given the name of my prospective father-in-law was black lodge he had three very pretty daughters whose names were stillwater blackfish and three roads even the untutored daughters of the wild woods need a little time to prepare for such an important event but long and tedious courtships are unknown among them the ensuing day the three daughters were brought to my father's lodge by their father and i was requested to take my choice stillwater was the eldest and i liked her name if it was emblematic of her disposition she was the woman i should prefer Stillwater, accordingly, was my choice. They were all superbly attired in garments which must have cost them months of labor, which garments the young women either kept in readiness 
against such an interesting occasion as the present. The acceptance of my wife was the completion of the ceremony, and I was again a married man, as sacredly in their eyes as if the Holy Christian Church had fastened the irrevocable knot upon us. Among the Indians, the daughter receives no patrimony on her wedding day, and her mother and father never pass a word with the son-in-law after, a custom religiously observed among them, though for what reason I never learned. The other relatives are under no such restraint. My brothers made me a present of twenty as fine horses as any in the nation, all trained war horses. I was also presented with all the arms and instruments requisite for an Indian campaign. My wife's deportment coincided with her name. She would have reflected honor upon many a civilized household. She was affectionate, obedient, gentle, cheerful, and apparently quite happy. No domestic thunderstorms, no curtain lectures ever disturbed the serenity of our connubial lodge. I speedily formed acquaintances with all my immediate neighbors, and the Morning Star, which was the name conferred upon me on my recognition as the lost son, was soon a companion to all the young warriors in the village. No power on earth could have shaken their faith in my positive identity with the lost son. Nature seemed to prompt the old women to recognize me as her missing son, and all my new relatives placed him in and all my new relatives placed implicit faith in the genuineness of her discovery. Greenwood had spoken it, and his tongue was not crooked. What could I do under the circumstances? Even if I should deny my crow origin, they would not believe me. How could I dash with an unwelcome and incredible explanation all the joy that had been manifested on my return? The cordial welcome, the rapturous embraces of those who had me as a son and a brother, the exuberant joy of the whole nation for the return of a long lost crow, who, stolen when a child, had returned in the strength of maturity, graced with the name of a great brave and the generous strife I had occasioned in their endeavors to accord me the warmest welcome. I could not find it in my heart to undeceive these unsuspecting people and tear myself away from their untutored caresses. Thus I commenced my Indian life with the crows. I said to myself, I can trap in these streams unmolested and derive more profit under their protection than if among my own people, exposed incessantly to assassination and alarm. I therefore resolved to abide with them, to guard my secret, to do my best in their company, and assist them to subdue their enemies. There was but one recollection troubling me, and that was my lonely one in St. Louis. My thoughts were constantly filled with her. I knew my affections were reciprocated, and that her fond heart beat alone for me, that my promise was undoubting, confided in, and that prayers were daily offered for my safety, thus distant in the mountains, exposed to every peril. Repeatedly I would appoint a day for my return, but some unexpected event would occur and thrust my resolution aside. Still I hoped, for I had accumulated the means of wealth sufficient to render us comfortable through life. A fortunate return was all I awaited to consummate my ardent anticipation of happiness and render me the most blessed of mortals. Before proceeding further with my Indian life, I will conduct the reader back to our camp the evening succeeding to my disappearance from Bridger. He was on the hill crossing over to me, as agreed upon, when he saw me in the hands of the Indians being conducted to the village, which was also in sight, seeing clearly that he could oppose no resistance to my captors, he made all speed to the camp and communicated the painful news of my death. He had seen me in the charge of a whole host of Sheons who were conducting me to the camp. 
there to sacrifice me in the most improved manner their savage propensities could suggest and then abandon themselves to a general rejoicing over the fall of a white man with the few men he had in camp it was hopeless to attempt a rescue for judging by the size of the village there must be a community of several thousand indians all were plunged in gloom all pronounced my funeral eulogy all my daring encounters were spoken of to my praise my fortunate escapes my repeated victories were applauded in memory of me the loss of their best hunter of their kind and ever obliging friend was deeply applauded by all alas had it not been for that lamentable quarrel they exclaimed he would still be here among us poor jim peace to his ashes bridger lamented that he had advised me to leave the camp and again that he had separated from me at the forks if we kept together he murmured his fate might have been prevented for doubtless one of us would have seen the indians in time to escape thus as i was afterward informed by some of the party was my memory celebrated in that forlorn camp father having conceived a deep disgust at that vicinity they moved their camp to the headwaters of the yellowstone leaving scores of beaver unmolested in the streams the faithful fellows little thought that while they were lamenting my untimely fall, I was being hugged and kissed to death by a whole lodge full of near and dear, near and dear crow relatives, and that I was being welcomed with a public reception fully equal in intensity, though not in extravagance, to that accorded to the victor of Waterloo on his triumphal entry into Paris. Bridger had never supposed that the Indians whom he saw leading me away were crows he being ignorant that he was so near their territory. His impression was that these were Cheyennes, hence I was given up for dead and reported so to others. My death communicated to the rendezvous when the fall hunt was over and there was a general time of mourning in mountain style. I say mountain style in contradistinction to the manner of civilized circles, because with them, when the death of a comrade is deployed, his good deeds alone are celebrated. His evil ones are interred with his bones. Modern politics have introduced the custom of perpetuating all that is derogatory to a man's fair fame, and burying in deep oblivion all that was honorable and praiseworthy. Hence I say, give me the mountaineer, despite all the opprobrium that is cast upon his name, for in him you have a man of chivalrous feeling, ready to divide his last morsel with his distressed fellow, ay, and to yield the last drop of his blood to defend the life of his friend. End of chapter 12of the life and adventures of james p beckworth by thomas d bonner this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gary Ullman. chapter thirteen war between the crow nation and other indian tribes victory as a crow indian a melancholy and sentiment indian indian masonry return to camp great rejoicing among my innumerable relatives the little wife after fetting for about ten days among my new neighbors i joined a small war party of about forty men embodied for the ostensible purpose of capturing horses but actually to kill their enemies after advancing for three days we fell in with a party of eleven of the blood indians a band of the blackfoot tribe immemorial enemies of the crows our chief ordered a charge upon them i advanced directly upon their line and had struck down my man before the others came up the others after making a furious advance that threatened annihilation to our foes 
curveted aside in Indian fashion, thus losing the effect of a first onset. I corrected this unwarlike custom on this occasion, seeing me engaged hand to hand with the enemy's whole force. They immediately came to my assistance, and the opposing party was quickly dispatched. I despoiled my victim of his gun, wall club bow, and quiver of arrows. Now I was the greatest man in the party, for I had killed the first warrior. We then painted our faces black, their mode of announcing victory, and rode back to the village bearing eleven scalps. We entered the village singing and shouting, the crowds blocking up our way so that it was with difficulty we could get along. My wife met me at some distance from our lodge, and to her I gave my greatest trophy, the gun. My pretty sisters next presenting themselves for some share of my spoils, I gave them what remained and they returned to their lodge, singing and dancing all the way. Their delight was unbounded in their new-found relative, who had drawn the first blood. My companions told me how I had charged direct upon the enemy, how I struck down the first Indian at a blow, what strength there was in my arm, and a great deal more in my commendation. Again I was lionized and feted. Relatives I had not seen before now, advanced and made my acquaintance. I was feasted by all of the sachems and great braves of the village until their kindness nearly fatigued me to death, and I was glad to retire to my lodge to seek a season of quietude. It was a custom rigidly observed by the crows when a son had drawn the first blood of the enemy for the father to distribute all his property among the village, always largely recollecting his own kin in the proposed distribution. I saw that my achievement had ruined my poor old father. He seemed contented, however, to sacrifice his worldly goods to the prowess of his illustrious son. It was the Crow's religion, and he was thoroughly orthodox. Another traditional memento, was to paint a chief's coat with an image of the sun and hang that, together with a scarlet blanket, in the top of a tree as an offering to the great spirit to propitiate him to continue his favorable regards. Several small bands of the village had a grand dance after the victory, each band by itself. I watched them for some time to see which band or clique contained the most active men. Having singled one, I broke into the ring and joined the performers with great heartiness. Then their shouts arose. The great brave, the antelope, has joined our band, and their dancing increased in vehemence, and their singing became hilarious. By the act of joining their clique, I became incorporated with their number. For the next three weeks, I stayed at home, spending much of my time in trapping round the village. I was accompanied in these excursions by a fine and intelligent Indian who was without a relative. He was very successful in trapping. One day we went to our traps. As usual, he found eight fine beavers, but I had caught none. After flaying them, he offered me four of the skids. I looked at him in surprise, telling him that they were caught in his traps, that they were his. Take them, he said. You are my friend. Your traps have been unlucky today. Previous to this, our successes have been about equal. Then he wished me to sit down and have a talk with him. I sat down by him, and he began. My friend, said he, I am alone in the world. All my kindred are gone to the land of the great spirit. I now want one good friend, a confidential bosom friend, who will be my brother. I am a warrior, a brave, and so are you. You have been far away to the villages of the white man. Your eyes have seen much. You have now returned to your people. Will you be my friend and brother? Be as one man with me as long as you live? I readily acceded to all his desires. It is well, said he, and we must exchange traps. I agreed to it. Now we must exchange guns. It was done. So we went on until we had exchanged all our personal effects, including horse, clothing, and war implements. Now, he said, we are one while we live. What I know, you shall know. There must be no secret between us. We then proceeded to my father's lodge and acquainted him with the alliance we had entered into. He was much pleased at the occurrence, 
and even after received my allied brother as his son. But the assumed relationship debarred his ever entering the family as son-in-law, since the mutual adopted attached him as by ties of consanguinity. Shortly after, another war party was levied for an excursion after the enemy or their horses, as occasion made offer. The party consisted of eight or ninety warriors. My adopted brother inquired of me if I was going with the party. I told him I was, and asked the same question of him. No, he said, we are brothers. We must never both leave our village at once. When I go, you must stay, and when you go, I must stay. One of us must be here to see to the interests of the other. Should we both be killed, then who would be mourn faintly for the other? I was as yet but a private in the Crow Army, no commission having been conferred upon me for what little service I had seen. We started in the night, as is their custom, leaving the village one or two at a time. My brother came to me in the evening and expressed a wish to speak to me before I left and pointed to a place where he wished me to meet him alone as we passed out of the village. I went as appointed and found him there. He first asked me if I had done anything in the village. I did not see the importance of his question. Innocently answered no. Why, have you not been to war? Yes. Did the warriors not impart to you the war path secret? No. Ah, well, they will tell it to you tomorrow. Go on, my brother. We all assembled together and marched on. In the forenoon, we killed a fine fat buffalo and rested to take breakfast. The intestines were taken out and a portion of them cleansed and roasted. A long one was then brought into our mess, which numbered ten warriors, who formed a circle, every man taking hold of the intestine with his thumb and finger. And in this position, very solemnly regarded by all in the circle, certain questions were propounded to each in relation to certain conduct in the village, which is of a nature unfit to be entered into here. They are religiously committed to a full and categorical answer to each inquiry, no matter whom their confessions may implicate. Every illicit action they have committed since they last went to war is here exposed, together with the name of the faceless accomplice, even to the very date of the occurrence. All this is divulged to the medicine men on the return of the party, and it is by them noted down in a matter that it is never erased while the guilty confessor lives. Every new warrior at his initiation is conjured by the most sacred oaths never to divulge the war pass secret to any woman on pain of instant death. He swears by his gun, his pipe, knife, earth and sun which are the most sacred oaths to the indian and are ever strictly observed we marched on until we came to the missouri river and i was greatly edified at the novel manner in which we crossed the stream a sufficient number of robes were brought to the river bank and a puckering string run around the entire edge of one drawing it together until it assumed a globulated form five or six guns with other articles necessary to be kept dry were put into it together with a stone for ballast an indian would then attach one end of a string to the hide tub and taking the other end in his teeth swim across with the novel bark in tow when unfreighted on the opposite shore everything would be as dry as when embarked thus all our freight was conveyed across in a very short time and we recommenced our march. We had not proceeded far when our spies returned and reported that they had discovered a village of the Asnebonis on Milk River, about 40 miles distance. We started for the village intending to relieve them of a few of their horses, of which we thought they had more than their share. We reached there and succeeded in driving off nearly 300 heads. But in recrossing the Missouri, we lost about one-third of them by drowning. In consequence of our crossing over a sandbar in which, though covered with water, the animals became involved and perished. 
we reached home in safety with the remainder without being pursued. Indeed, on our whole route, we did not see an Indian. Although we bought no scalps, there was great rejoicing at our success. I received in the distribution 17 horses, which I gave to my friends, taking care to give my father a liberal share in the place of those he had previously parted with on my account. I had a month's interval at home, visiting at my father's lodge one day. He asked me why I did not head a party myself and go on some expedition as a leader. By so doing, he informed me, I stood a better chance of gaining promotion. Your medicine is good, said he, and the medicine of both will bring you great success. I replied that I had been domiciliated there so short a time that I did not wish to be too precipitate in pushing myself forward, and that I preferred to fight a while longer as brave rather than risk the responsibility of being leader. He replied, Here is your brother-in-law. Take him. Also, your brothers will go with you. If they all get killed, so be it. I will cheerfully submit to old age without them and die alone. I reflected that, in order to advance by promotion, I must risk everything, so I consented to follow his advice. Black Panther, my brother-in-law, was anxious to follow me, and there were seven young striplings, from ten to eighteen years old, that my father called sons, though in fact half of them were what I called nephews. I put myself forward as the leader, the party comprising only two men and the above-mentioned seven boys. We departed from the village and pressed on to the headwaters of the Arkansas, coming directly to the Arapaho and the Ayotan villages. At night we drove off 118 fine horses with which we moved on in all possible haste towards home. We were then about 300 miles from our village and 200 from the Crow country. In passing through the park, we discovered three Indians coming towards us, driving a small drove of horses. We concealed ourselves from their view by dropping back over the brow of a small hill directly in their route until they had approached within ten steps of us. We raised the war hoop and rushed out on them, killing two of the three. The third was at a greater distance driving the cattle, and when he saw the fate of his companions, he mounted one of the fleetest and was soon beyond pursuit. My company had achieved a great victory, the spoils of which were fourteen horses in addition to those already in our possession two scalps, one gun, two battle axes, one lance, bow, quiver, and etc. This trivial affair exalted my young brothers in their own esteem higher than the greatest veteran their village contained. During their return home, they were anticipating with untiring tongues the ovations that awaited them. We fell in with no more enemies on our way to the village. The horses we had captured from the three Indians had been stolen by them from the Crows, and as a recovery of lost horses is a greater achievement in Indian eyes than the original acquisition, our merit was in proportion. Note, formerly one of the greatest places for beaver in North America and well known to the mountaineers. We entered singing with our faces blackened bearing two scalps and other trophies, and driving 132 fine horses before us. The whole village resounded with the shouts with which our brethren and kindred welcomed us. I was hailed bravest of the brave, and my promotion appeared certain. My father and all his family rose greatly in popular favor. The antelope's distinguished skill and bravery was reflected in lucent rays upon their names. Great is the antelope, was chanted on all sides. The lost son of Big Bowl, their medicine is good and prosperous. There is one trait in Indian character which civilized society would derive much profit by imitating. Envy is a quality unknown to the savages. When a warrior has performed any deed of daring, his merit is freely accorded by all his associate braves. 
his deeds are extolled in every public and private reunion and his name is an incentive to generous emulation i never witnessed any envious attempt to derogate from the merit of a brave's achievement no damning with the faint praise none willing to wound and yet afraid to strike no faltering innuendos that the man has not accomplished so much after all the same way with the women when a woman's husband has distinguished himself his neighbors one and all take a pride in rejoicing with her over her happiness if a woman displays more ingenuity than common in ornamenting a husband's war dress or in adding any fancy work to her own habiliments she at once becomes the pattern of the neighborhood you see no flaws picked in her character because of her rising to note, no aspersions cast upon her birth or present standing. Such and such is her merit, and it is deserving of our praise. The fact received, it receives full acknowledgment. This leads to the natural conclusion that civilization in introducing the ostentation of display, which is too frequently affected without sufficient ground to stand upon, warps the mind from the charity that is natural to it and leads to all the petty strifes and scandalous tales and heart burnings that embitter the lives of so many in civilized life i now engaged in trapping until the latter part of december i celebrated christmas by myself as the indians knew nothing about the birth of our savior and it was hard to make them understand the nature of the event at this time a trading party started from our village for the Groban and Mandan country, where there was a trading post established for the purpose of buying our winter supply of ammunition and tobacco and other necessary articles. I sent 30 beaver skins with directions what to purchase with their value and had marked my initials on all of the skins. These letters were a mystery to the traders. He inquired of the crows who had marked the skins with these letters they told them it was a crow one of their braves who had lived with the whites kip the trader then sent an invitation to me to visit him at his fort while our party was away our village was attacked by a combined party of the sioux and the ikaras numbering two thousand five hundred so sudden was the attack that they inflicted considerable mischief upon us before we had a chance to collect our forces but when we at length charged on them it was decisive we penetrated their ranks throwing them into the direst confusion and they withdrew leaving two hundred and fifty three dead on the field our loss was thirty one killed and one hundred and sixty wounded they had supposed that nearly all the warriors had left the village when but a small party had gone and they met with such a reception as they little expected i had three horses killed under me and my faithful battle axe was red with the blood of the enemy to the end of the haft fourteen of the sioux had fallen beneath it although we had taken such a number of scalps there was no chancing or rejoicing all were busied in attending the wounded or mourning their relatives slain their mourning consists in cutting and hacking themselves on every part of the body and keeping up a dismal moaning or howling for hours together many cut off their fingers in order to mourn through life or at least to wear the semblance of mourning hence the reason of so many western indians having lost one or more of their fingers and of the scars which disfigure their bodies the crows fasten the remains of their dead in trees until their flesh is decayed their skeletons are then taken down and inhumed in caves sometimes but not frequently they kill the favorite horse of the deceased and bury him at the foot of the tree that custom is not followed so strictly with them as with most other tribes i was specifically engaged in trapping during the ensuing winter and the season being open and pleasant i met with great success could i have disposed of my peltry in st louis i should have been as rich as i coveted in the month of march eighteen twenty six a small war party of twenty men 
left our village on an excursion, and not one of them ever came back. Their pack dogs, used for carrying extra moccasins when a party goes to war, alone returning to intimate their fate. Another party was quickly dispatched, of whom I was appointed leader, and we soon came upon the remains of the massacred party, which yet bore the marks of the weapons that had laid them low. There are also many fresh Indian tracks around the place, which led us to the inference that there were enemies near. We made immediate search for them and had only marched about six miles when we came upon a village of nine lodges, which we instantly assaulted, killing every man but two. These were on a hill nearby, and as they made off, we did not follow them. My personal trophies in this encounter were one scalp and the equipment of its wearers, one young girl of about fourteen years and a little boy. We killed 48 of the enemy, took six women prisoners, together with a large drove of horses and a valuable stock of beaver, otto, and other skins, with which we returned to the village. There was great rejoicing again. Not one of the party was scratched, and the beaver skins, to the number of 163, were bestowed upon me for my skill in command. Before we made the assault, we felt convinced that this was the party who had killed our missing friends, and our convictions were substantiated subsequently by recognizing several weapons in their possessions which had formerly belonged to our braves. Indeed, some of our women prisoners acknowledged that our departed brethren had killed many of their people. The Crows treat the women whom they take prisoners much better than other tribes do. They do not impose upon them a harder life than their own women endure, and they allow them to marry into the tribe, after which they are in equal fellowship with them. On finding themselves captives, they generally mourn a day or two, but their grief quickly subsides, and they seem to care no further for their violent removal from their own people. At this time, the Crows were incessantly at war with all the tribes, within their reach, with the exception of the snakes and the flatheads, and they did not escape frequent ruptures with them, brought about by the Indians' universal obtuseness as to all law relating to the right of property and horses. The Crows could raise an army of 16,000 warriors, and although there were tribes much more numerous, there were none could match them in an open fight. The Comanches and Apaches have tilted lances with them repeatedly and invariably to their discomfiture. If the Crows ever suffered defeat, it was when overwhelmed by numbers. One principal cause of their marked superiority was their plentiful supply of guns and ammunition, which the whites always more readily exchanged to them on account of their well-proved fidelity to the white man. When other lodges, when other tribes were constrained to leave their firearms in their lodges for want of ammunition, the crows would have plenty, and could use their arms with great effect against an enemy which had only bow and arrows to shoot with. Farther, they were the most expert horsemen of any Indian tribe. Notwithstanding the great name bestowed upon the Comanches and Apaches, these two great terrors of northern Mexico, I have seen them all and consider myself in a position to judge, although some, perhaps, will say that I am prejudiced in favor of the Crows, seeing that I am one myself. Previous to my going among the Crows, the smallpox had been ravaging their camp, carrying them away in thousands, until, as I was informed by themselves, their number was reduced by that fatal Indian scourge to little better than one half. None of their medicine would arrest its course. After our last venture victory, the Crows met with numerous reverses which were attended with severe loss of life. In their small war parties going out on marauding expeditions, I had never much confidence. Although individually they were good warriors, therefore I never took part with them until six or eight of their parties would come back severely handled, and many of their braves slain. Thus their reverses accumulated until the whole village 
with one scene of mourning numbers of them being self-mangled in the most shocking manner and the blood trickling from their heads down to the ground some had lost a father some a brother some a sweetheart in a short their appearance was too fearful to look upon and their cries were too painful to hear when the last party came in defeated with serious loss i had just returned with a party from the pursuit of horse thieves we had brought in four scalps and were performing the scalp dance in honor of the event on hearing the disastrous news of the return of the defeated party we arrested the dance and i retired into my lodge soon however a crowd of wounded came and lifted it directly from over me leaving me in the open air they then threw before me immense quantities all kinds of goods leggings moccasins and other things until i was nearly covered with their miscellaneous offerings i called out enough I am aroused. I will go with you, warriors, and revenge the deaths of your friends. They were all satisfied and stood still. The news then circulated through the village that the antelope was aroused, and himself going against the Cheyennes to revenge the death of their braves. I had as yet met with no reverses since my translation. My medicine had always been good and true. I had never come home without scalp or spoils, and they began to associate my name with victory. The next day, five hundred warriors rallied around me, among whom were some who had suffered recent defeat, and their minds were burning for revenge. I sent forward fifty spies and moved cautiously on with the main body. My reputation was committed to my present success and i took more than ordinary pains to vindicate the cause they had entrusted to my care every man was well armed and mounted and i had full confidence in our ability to give a good account of double our number my command was very curious to learn my tactics on one occasion when they were completely harassing me with endless inquiries respecting my plan of attack i told them if they would bring me a silver gray fox unhurt my medicine would be complete and that we were sure of a great victory in a moment they left me and shortly returned with a live fox which they had caught in a surround i ordered them to choke it to death and then flay it it was done and the beautiful skin was handed to me i wrapped it around my medicine bow and made a brief speech informing them that the cunning of the fox had disappeared had descended upon my head and that my wiles would infallibly circumvent the enemy like another alexander i thus inspired confidence in the breaths of my soldiers and the spirit i was infusing in others partly commuted itself to my own breast some of the spies now returned and informed me they had discovered a village of cheyenne containing thirty-seven lodges well said i after hearing where it was now return and watch them strictly if anything happens acquaint me with it promptly away they went but soon returned again to report that the enemy had moved down the creek which was then called antelope creek a small tributary of the missouri had passed through the canyon and were encamped at its mouth i ordered them to send it all the I ordered them to send in all the spies except ten, and to direct those ten to keep a sharp lookout. I then determined to follow them down the canyon and attack them at the mouth, thus cutting off their retreat into the canyon. But again I was informed that the enemy had moved further down and had encamped in the edge of the timber with the evident intention of remaining there. I approached their village with great caution, moving a few miles a day until i occupied a position on a hill near it where i had an almost bird's eye view of the village underneath i then sent all my extra horses together with the boys and women to the rear i divided the warriors into three parties reserving the smallest division of fifty men to myself i placed the two chief divisions in juxtaposition out of view of the enemy and with my small party intended to descend upon the horses 
thinking to draw them after me my two concealed divisions were then in close them as in a lane re returning would place them under a triple fire i addressed them briefly begging them to show the enemy they were crows and brave ones too and that if we would strictly obey my directions we could retrieve all our recent reverses the two corps the army being in position was advancing with my small division when we came suddenly upon two of the enemy, whom we instantly killed and scalped. We rode on, being in full sight of the enemy, but they made no offer to come out of their camp. We tried every means to provoke them to advance. We shook our two scalps at them, yet reeking with blood and tantalizing them all we could. But they would not move. To have charged them as they were situated would have entailed upon us severe loss. We had taken scalps without loss of blood, more glorious in an Indian estimation than to take one hundred if a single life was sacrificed. We had braved our foes. We had stamped them as cowards, which is almost equal to death. So, contenting myself with what was done, I concluded to draw off my forces and return home. We were received at the village with deafening applause. Every face was washed of its morning paint, gloom gave way to rejoicing, and the scalp dance was performed with enthusiasm and hilarity. I was illustrated with the distinguished name of Big Bowl, Bate Sarsh, and hailed as a deliverer by all the women in the village. A little girl who had often asked me to marry her came to me one day, and with every importunity insisted on my accepting her as my wife i said you are a very pretty girl but you are but a child when you are older i will talk to you about it but she was not to be put off you are a great brave she said and braves have a right to paint their faces of their wives when they have killed the enemies of the crows i am a little girl now i know but if i am your wife you will paint my face when you return from the war and i shall be proud that i am the wife of a great brave and can rejoice with the other women whose faces are painted by their brave husbands you will also give me fine things fine clothes and scarlet cloth i can make you pretty leggings and moccasins and take care of your war horses and war implements the little innocent used such powerful appeals that notwithstanding had already seven likes and a lodge for each i told her she might be my wife I took her to the lodge of one of my married sisters, told her that the little girl was my wife, that she would make her a good wood carrier, and that she must dress her up finely as became the spouse of a brave. My sister was much pleased and cheerfully carried out all my requests, as I shall have occasion to speak of this little girl again. In connection with the medicine lodge, I shall say comparatively little of her at this time. I spent the summer very agreeably, being engaged most of the time in hunting buffalo and trapping beaver. I had now accumulated three full packs worth in the market three thousand dollars. One day I took a fancy to hunt mountain sheep, and for the company took my little wife with me. She was particularly intelligent, and I found by her conversation that she surpassed my other wives in sense. She was full of talk and asked all manner of questions concerning my travels among the great lodges and villages of the white man. If the white squaws were as pretty as herself, and an endless variety of questions. I felt greatly pleased with her piquant curiosity and imparted much information to her, fixing her deep black eyes upon mine. She at length said, I intend sometime in my life to go into the medicine lodge. I looked at her with astonishment. The dedication of a female to the service of the great spirit is a dangerous attempt, like all forms of imposture. It requires a peculiar talent and fitness in the candidate who seeks to gain admission into the sacred lodge, the war payer. Secret is associated with ministration, with many of the fearful ceremonies. The woman who succeeds in her ambitious project is an honored participant in the sacred service 
of the deity through life. But where one succeeds, numbers fail, and the failure tells instant death. Three years subsequent to this conversation, I shall have to relate how my little wife, the breathless silence of ten thousand warriors, passed the fiery ordeal in safety and went triumphantly into the lodge of the great spirit. I had great success in hunting, killing a great number of sheep and carried their skins with me to the village. On arriving, I called at the lodge of my old-head brother, who insisted on my entering and taking a meal. I accepted the offer while my little wife ran home to communicate my great success in hunting. Our meal consisted of strips of dried buffalo tongue, which is if the Indian did not half cook it, was a dish I never partook of. What was served me on this occasion, however, was well done, and I ate a hearty met supper completed. I was praising the viands and chanced to inquire what dish I had been eating. The women replied that it was tongue, and expressed by a look that I must have known what it was. My friend, knowing that I had departed from my rule, inferred that I had infringed my medicine, and he started up in horror, shouting, Tongue! Tongue! You have ruined his medicine. Should our hero be slain in battle, you are a lost woman. The poor woman was half dead with fear, her features expressing the utmost horror. I issued from the lodge, bellowing an imitation of the buffalo, protruding my tongue and pawing the ground like a bear in fury. This was in order to remove the spell that had settled over me and recover the strength of my medicine. I recovered at length and proceeded towards my lodge, commiserated by a large crowd who all deplored the taking of the food as a lamentable accident. The same evening the village was notified by the crier that on the following day there would be a surround and all summoned to attend. I accompanied the party and the surround was made. Several hundred buffaloes were enclosed. On charging among them to dispatch them, we discovered seven Blackfoot Indians who, finding retreat cut off from them, had hastily provided themselves with a sand fort. I struck one of the victims with a willow I had in my hand and then retired thereupon, declaring I had wounded the first enemy. This, I believe, I have before mentioned, is a greater honor than to slay any number in battle. I had retired to a short distance and was standing looking at the fight when a bullet discharged from the fort struck the dagger in my belt and laid me breathless on the ground. Recovering immediately, I rose, found myself bleeding at the mouth, imagining the ball had penetrated some vital place, gave myself up for dead. I was carried to the village by scores of warriors who, with me, supposed my wound to be mortal and were already deploying their warrior's fall. The medicine men surrounded me and searched for my wound, but behold, it was only a small discoloration to be seen. The skin was not perforated. The ball was afterward found where I fell, flattened as if struck with a hammer. It was then declared that I would recover. The enemy's bullets flattened in contact with my person. My medicine was infallible. I was impenetrable to wound. I did not afford them any light on the matter. As soon as the poor woman who had entertained me at supper heard that I was wounded, she left for another village and was not again seen for six months, supposing herself to have been instrumental in destroying my medicine, and knowing that if I died, her life would pay the forfeit of her carelessness. She did not dare to return. She chanced to see me unharmed at the village we had taken refuge, and then she knew her life was redeemed. While the doctor and medicine men were going through their spells and incantations, Previous to the uncovering my wound, my relatives, in their solicitude for my life, offered profuse rewards if they would save me. Some offered twenty horses, some fifty, some more, in proportion as their wealth liberality prompted. The doctors ransomed my life, and they received over five hundred horses for their achievement. One day, a slight 
dispute arose between one of the braves and myself about some trivial matter, and as both of us were equally obstinate in maintaining our views, we both became angry. My disputant remarked with great superciliousness, Ugh, you pretend to be a brave, but you are no brave. We drew our battle axes at the same instant and rushed at each other, but before either had an opportunity to strike, the pipe was thrust between us, compelling us to desist, to disobey, which is instant death. This is the duty of certain Indians who occupy the position of policemen in the city. They then said to my antagonist, You said that Big Bull was no brave. You lied. We all know that he is brave. Our enemies can testify to it, and you dare not deny it any more. Hereafter, if you wish to show which is the greatest brave, wait until you beat the enemy. Then we can decide. But never again attempt to take each other's lives. This interference procured peace. It was not long, however, before we both had a good opportunity to determine the question of our valor. A small party of thirty warriors was embodied, myself and my antagonist being of the number. After a short march, we fell in with a war party of eighteen Cheyennes, who, notwithstanding the disparity of numbers, accepted battle, well knowing that escape was impossible, pointed out one of the enemy, who I could see by his dress and the peculiarity of his hair, was a chief. You see him, I said, well, we can decide which is the best man now. You charge directly against him by my side. This he readily assented to, but still I could detect in his countenance an expression which I deciphered I would rather not. I saw the Indian we were about to attack open the pan of his gun and give it a slight tap with his hand to render its discharge certain. He presented his piece and took the most deliberate aim as we advanced side by side to the attack. The death of one of us seemed inevitable, and I did not like the feeling of suspense. A few spurrings of our charges, and we were upon him. I seized the muzzle of his gun at the very instant that it exploded and cut him down with the battle axe in my right hand. My left cheek was filled with the powder for the discharge, the stains of which remain to this day. My rival did not even strike at the Indian I had killed. He then said to me, You are truly a great warrior and a great brave. I was wrong in saying what I did. We are now good friends. Our few enemies were quickly exterminated, the loss on our side being four wounded, including my powder wound. My fame was still further celebrated, for I had again struck down the first man who was a great chief and had actually charged up to the muzzle of his gun, what few Indians have the stamina to do. On our return with the spoils of victory, we were warmly congratulated by the tribe, and I was still further ennobled by the additional name of Bull's Robe, conferred on me by my father. It was now the fall of the year. I had been a Creole for many moons. It was a time to repair to the trading post to obtain what articles we needed. I determined to accompany the party and at least attend to the sale of my own effects. What peltry I had was worth three thousand dollars in St. Louis, and I was solicitous to obtain something like an equivalent in exchange for it. We proceeded to Fort Clark on the missouri i waited until the indians had nearly completed their exchanges speaking nothing but crow language dressed like a crow my hair long as a crow's and myself as black as a crow no one at the post doubted my being a crow towards the conclusion of the business one of my tribe inquired in his own language for the be has i p hisha the clerk could not understand his wand, and there was none of the article in sight for the Indian to point at. He at length called Kip to see if he could divine the Indian's meaning. I then said in English, Gentlemen, that Indian wants scarlet cloth. If a bombshell had exploded in the fort, they could not have been more astonished. Ah, said one of them, 
You speak English. Where did you learn it? With the white man. How long were you with the whites? More than twenty years. Where did you live with them? In St. Louis. In St. Louis? In St. Louis? You have lived twenty years in St. Louis? Then they scanned me closely from head to foot, and Kip said, If you have lived twenty years in St. Louis, I swear you are no crow. No, I am not. Then what may be your name? My English name is James Beckworth. Good heavens, why well, I have heard your name mentioned a thousand times. You were supposed dead, and were so reported by Captain Sublet. I am not dead, as you can see. I still move and breathe. This explains the mystery, he added, turning to the clerk, of those beaver skids being marked J.B. Well, well, if you are not a strange mortal. All of this conversation was unintelligible to my crow brethren, who were evidently proud to see a crow talk so fluently to the white man. Now, I said, I have seen you transact your business without interposing with a word. You have cleared two or three thousand percent of your exchanges. I do not grudge you. Were I in your place, I should do the same. But I want a little more liberal treatment. I have toiled hard for what I have obtained, and I want the worth of my earnings. I set my own price upon my property, and to the great astonishment of my Indian brethren, I returned with as large a bale of goods as theirs would altogether amount to. But, as I have said, an Indian is no wise envious, and instead of considering themselves unfairly used, they rejoice at the white man's profusion to me, and suppose the overplus he had given me was an indemnity for the captivity they had held me in. On our return, I made various presents to all my wives, some of whom I did not see for months together, and to many other relatives. I had still a good stock to trade upon and could exchange with my brethren at any rate I offered. They placed implicit confidence in my integrity, and a beaver skin exchanged with me for one plug of tobacco contented them better than to have exchanged it for two with the white men. I had the fairest opportunity for the acquisition of an immense fortune that ever was placed in men's way. But saying one word to the tribe, I could have kept the white trader forever out of their territory, and thus have gained the monopoly of the trade of the entire nation for any term of years. That I am not now in possession of a fortune equal to that of an Astor or Gerard is solely the fault of my own indolence. And I do not to this moment see how I came to neglect the golden opportunity. While returning from the trading post, we fell in with a party of about 250 Cheyenne warriors, to oppose whom we numbered but 200 warriors. Beside being encumbered with a still greater number of women, as good fortune would have it, they attacked us in the daytime while we were moving, whereas had they but waited till we were encamped and our horses turned out, I do not see how we could have escaped defeat. In traveling, every warrior led his war horse by his side, with lance and shield attached to the saddle. The enemy was first seen by one of our scouts at some little distance from the main body. On seeing they were discovered, they gave chase to him and continued on until they came upon our whole party. Every man transferred himself to his war horse and was instantly ready to receive them. They advanced upon our line were receiving without wavering and finally driven back. It was now our turn to attack. We charged furiously with our whole force, completely sweeping everything from before us and killing or disabling at least 50 of the enemy. They rallied in return, but the reception they met with soon put them to rout, and they fled precipitately into the timber where we did not care to follow them. Our loss was severe. Nine warriors killed, thirteen wounded, including myself, who had received an arrow in the head. Not so serious, however, as to prevent me doing duty. We also lost one pack horse laden with goods, but no scalps. We took eleven scalps upon the field, and the Cheyennes afterwards confessed to the loss of fifty-six warriors. When we lost the horse in the action, the women would immediately supply its place with a fresh one. 
We were nearly two hundred miles from home, and we carried our dead all the way thither. On arriving at home, I found my father greatly irritated. He had lost two hundred and fifty head of horses from his own herd, stolen by the Blackfeet, who had raised a general contribution from the whole village. His voice was still for war, and he insisted on giving immediate chase. I dissuaded him from his intention, representing to him his advanced years, and promising to go myself and obtain satisfaction for his losses. He reluctantly consented to this arrangement. But four or five days after my departure on the errand, his medicine became so strong that he started off with a party, taking an opposite direction to the one I had gone on. My party consisted of 220 good warriors, and my course lay for the headwaters of the Arkansas and the Arapaho country. We fell in with no enemies on our way until we arrived at a village which contained upward of 100 lodges. We formed our plans for assaulting the place the next day, when we discovered four white men, whom we surrounded. The poor fellows thought their last day was come, and I was amused to overhear the conversation. They will surely kill us all, said one. In what manner will they kill us, said another. They may burn us, suggested a third. Then they communed among themselves, little thinking there was one overhearing them who sympathized with every apprehension they expressed. They summed up their consultation by one saying, If they attempt to kill us, let us use our knives to the best advantage and sell our lives as dearly as possible. Gentlemen, said I, I will spare you that trouble. Great God! they exclaimed. Mr. Beckworth, is that you? Yes, I replied. That is my name. You are perfectly safe but you must not leave our camp till tomorrow. For what reason, they inquired, because there is a village close by which we mean to assault at daybreak, and we do not wish our design to be known. Oh, they said. Oh, said they, we should not communicate your designs, and we did not even know of the village. They then poured out before me a whole sea of misfortunes, they had been trapping, had met with very good success. The Indians had stolen their horses. In attempting to cross the river by means of a badly constructed raft, the raft had fallen to pieces, and they had lost everything, peltry, guns, and ammunition. They were now making their way to New Mexico with nothing to eat and no gun to kill game with. They were uh, among Indians and were two or three hundred miles from the nearest settlement of New Mexico. I entertained them well while they stayed, and after our assault in the morning, I gave them two guns and twenty rounds of ammunition and counseled them to take advantage of the surprise of the Indians to make good their escape. One of the four afterwards informed me that they reached the settlements in safety, having killed a buffalo and a deer on the way. We made the assault as appointed. We were mounted on horses we had taken from the village during the night. As Indians go on horse-stealing expeditions on foot, I divided my force into two bodies, giving my principal scout the command of one. I gave orders to run off their horses without risking a battle. If no opposition was offered, but if they showed fight to kill whatever came in their way. The Arapahoes are very poor warriors. But on this occasion they defended themselves with commendable zeal and bravery. We were, however, compelled to kill fourteen of them. For our own security, before we could get their horses well started, on our side we had four wounded. And if they had not delayed to scalp the fallen Indians, that might have been avoided. We succeeded in driving away over 1,600 horses, all well-conditioned, which we arrived safely at home. My father also returned about the same time with, with near 3,000 head, all superior animals. The Bull's Robe family had certainly done wonders, and we were entertained to the greatest feast I had ever seen. The whole village was illuminated with numerous folding joy and such dancing was never known before. I received another addition to my list of titles in commemoration of this event, Isco Chu Ichu Ri, 
the enemy of horses. A feud now broke out, which had been long brewing between two different parties in our village, one of which worshipped foxes and the other worshipped dogs. The warriors of the latter party were called dog soldiers, of which I was the leader, and the other party was led by red eyes. The quarrel originated about the prowess of the respective parties and was fostered by red eye on the part of the rival company and by yellow belly an indian ari shiras a man of my company the ari shiras was as brave as an indian as ever trod the plain but he was also a very bad indian that is he was disagreeable in his manners and very insulting in his conversation red eyes was equally brave but of a different disposition he was a reserved pride the braddocio of a rishiris offended him this rivalry developed into an open rupture and the pipe men were obliged to interfere to prevent open hostilities at length it was proposed in order to cement a final peace between the two warriors that each should select from his own party a certain number of men and go and wage common war against some enemy the questions of bravery to be decided by the number of scalps brought in on each side red eyes accordingly chose from his party eighteen of the best men himself making the nineteenth men who would suffer death rather than show their backs to the enemy Ari Shiriz, with his accustomed fan Faronadad said, I can beat that party with less men. I will only take 16 men and bring in more scalps than they. He came to me and said, Enemy of horses, I want you to go with me and die with me. It is of no use for you to stay with this people. They are not brave any longer. Come with me and we will enter the spirit land together where the inhabitants are all brave. There is better hunting ground in the country of the Great Spirit. Come. I replied, I would rather not go on such an errand. I have women to live for and defend against the enemies of the crows, that when I fought I wished to destroy the enemy and preserve my own life. That, said I, is bravery and prudence combined. Ah, answered he, you are a leader of the dog soldiers and refuse to go. There are prettier women in the land of the great spirit than any of your squaws, and game in much greater abundance. I care nothing about my life. I am ready to go to the land of the great spirit. You must go with me. Perhaps your medicine will save not only yourself but all of us. If so, it will be so much the better. I, not wishing to be thoroughly cowardly, especially by a Shiris, at length consented to accompany him on the condition that he would stifle all harsh feelings against our brethren and let our expedition result as it would, accept the decisions in good faith and never refer to the past. It is well, he said. Let it be as your words speak. The two parties started on different routes to the Cheyenne country. I regarded it as a foolhardy enterprise, but if it resulted in their establishment of peace, I was contented to take part in it, at whatever personal sacrifice. We used every precaution against that surprise, and Ari Shiris willingly adapted his movements to my counsel, for though he was as brave as a lion and fought with the utmost desperation, he was very inconsiderate of consequences and had no power of calculating present combinations to come at a desired result. After traveling about twenty days, we arrived at a considerable elevation from whence we could see at some distance on the prairie about thirty of the enemy engaged in killing buffalo. We could also see their village at a distance of three miles. There is an opportunity, said A. Rishiris. Let us charge these Indians in the open plains. No, no, I replied. There are too many of them. The Cheyennes are brave warriors. If you wish to carry home their scalps, we must get into their path and waylay them. By that means, we shall kill many of them and run less risk of our own lives. We shall gain more honor by preserving the lives of our warriors 
and taking back the scalps of the enemy than by sacrificing our lives in a rash rash and inconsiderate charge your words are true said he and we will do as you say then added i turn your robes the hair side out and follow me we wound our way down the trail through which they must necessarily pass to reach their village and kept on until we reached a place where there were three gullies worn by the passage of the water through the center gully the trail passed thus leaving a formidable position on each side in which an ambuscade had ample concealment i divided my party giving the command of one division to a Rishiris. we took our stations in the ditches on each side of the trail though not exactly opposite to each other i directed the opposite party not to fire a gun until they should hear ours and then each man to take the enemy in the order of precedence the unsuspecting cheyennes as soon as they had finished butchering and dressing the buffalo began to approach us in parties of from three to eight or ten their horses loaded with meat which they were bearing to the village when they were about a dozen abreast of my party i made a signal to fire and nine cheyennes fell before our balls and eight before those of our Shiri's party some few of the enemy who had passed on hearing the guns returned to see what the matter was and three of them became victims to our bullets we all rushed from our hiding places then and some fell to escaping the prostrate foe and some to cutting the lashings of the meat in order to secure the horses the remainder keeping the surviving enemy at bay having taken scalps we sprang upon the horses we had freed from their packs and retreated precipitately for the enemy was coming in sight in great numbers we made a direct we made direct for the timber and leaving our horses took refuge in a rocky place in the mountain where we considered ourselves protected for a while from their attacks the storm is in front they had to advance right in the face of our bullets and to reach us in the rear they had to take circuitous route of several miles round the base of the mountain the enemy evinced the utmost bravery as they made repeated assault right up to the fortification that sheltered us their bullets showered around us without injury but we could bring down one man at every discharge to scalp them however was out of the question during the combat a great cheyenne brave named leg in the water charged directly into our midst and aimed a deadly thrust with his lance at one of our braves the warrior assailed instantly shivered the weapon with his back relax and inflicted a ghastly wound in his assailant's shoulder with a second blow he managed to escape leaving his horse dead in our midst by this time we were encompassed with the enemy which induced the belief in our minds that retreat would be the safest course none of our party was wounded except a Rishiris, who had his arm broken with a bullet between the shoulder and the elbow he made light of the wound only regretting that he could no longer discharge his gun but he welded his battle axe with his left hand as well as ever when night came on we evacuated our fortress unperceived by our enemies they deemed our escape impossible were quietly resting intending to insult us with their whole force in the morning and take our scalps at all hazards moving with the stealth of a cat we proceeded along the summit of a rocky cliff until we came to a cleft or ravine through which we descended from the bluff to the bottom which was covered with a heavy growth of timber we then hastened home arriving there on the twenty eighth day from the time we left they had given us over for lost but when they saw us returning with twenty scalps and only one of our party hurt their grief gave way to admiration and we were hailed with shouts of applause our rival party under red eyes had returned five or six days previously bringing with them seventeen scalps obtained at the loss of one man our party was declared the victor since we had taken the greater number of scalps 
with the weaker party and without loss of life thus excelling our rival in three several points red eye cheerfully acknowledged himself beaten good feeling was restored and the subject of each other's bravery was never again discussed we had still another advantage inasmuch as we could dance a celebration they were deprived of as they had lost the warrior they however joined our party and wanted nothing in heartiness to render our dance sufficiently boisterous to suffice for the purpose of both all the dancing is performed in the open air with the solid ground for a floor it consists of jumping up and down intermixed with violent gestures and stamping they keep time with a drum or tambourine composed of antelope skin stretched over a hoop the whole party singing during the performance end of chapter 13Chapter 14 of The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 14 Great Loss of Horses in the Mountains. Destructive Battle with the Blackfeet. Storming of their Natural Fort. Trouble with the Cheyennes. We went along without noteworthy occurrence until the following march when we moved from the western to the eastern side of what was at that time called tongue river mountain one of the peaks of the rocky mountain chain the buffaloes had receded from the environs of our old camping ground and had been attracted to the region whither we removed in consequence of the grass being in a more forward state our community numbered ten thousand souls men women and children together with an immense number of horses in crossing the mountain we found the snow to be so great depth being further increased with a three days recent storm that the mountain was impassable in this severe journey which occupied three days we had twelve hundred horses perish in the snow previously the blackfeet had stolen eight hundred head and we were in no condition to follow them as we were all engaged in packing up for the removal we reached the prairie on the eastern side of the mountain after a toilsome journey and found good camping ground on box elder creek the morning following our arrival we started on a surround in parties of fifty and upward and as our whole population was without meat i rode a pack horse and three of my wives were with me each leading a saddle horse i had not proceeded far before i heard a noise that sounded very much like a war hoop i stopped my horse to listen those near me said it was a signal from one of the parties who had discovered buffalo and we proceeded on our journey soon however i heard the yell again and i became satisfied there was something more then buffalo was stir i rode to a small eminence close by and descried a party of our hunters at a distance making signals for others to succor them i turned back to my wives and dispatched two of them to the village for my war instruments and then galloped on to ascertain the cause of the alarm not more than fifty of our warriors were then before me i then learned that they had before them a party of one hundred and sixty blackfoot warriors who had thrown themselves into an apparently impregnable fortress it was a stronghold manifestly thrown up in some of nature's grand convulsions it would seem for the very purpose to which it was now applied it was a huge mass of granite forming a natural wall in front of a graduated height varying from twenty-five feet to six feet the lowest part it was solid and nearly perpendicular all around there was in our camp a young kentuckian named robert mildrum naturally a brave fellow though he seldom went out in the war parties but when the village was assaulted he always fought like a tiger he was a good trapper and a skillful blacksmith and had been out in the employ of the american fur company i met him while i was surveying the enemy's stronghold 
I met him while we were surveying the enemy's stronghold. I said to him, Mildrum, if the adage is true, there is policy in war, these Indians make no question of our bravery. Had we not better resign to them the brunt of this encounter and not expose our lives in a cause that we have no concern in? How do you intend to act? As for me, said Bildrum, I must be in the fray. If we are to see any fun, I want my share of the entertainment. Well, said I, I shall endeavor to keep by you. The Indians had by this time assembled to the number of from five to seven hundred and were watching the fort indecisively, awaiting instructions from the chief. Many had succeeded in running and sheltering under the wall, while several had been shot in making the attempt. I ran to the wall to reconnoiter it and soon saw there were two ways in which it could be taken. One was by bombardment and the other by storm. Bombardment was out of the question, as our heaviest caliber was a rifle bore. I waited to see what steps would be taken. Longhair, the head chief of the nation, said, Warriors, listen, our marrow bones are broken. The enemy has chosen a strong fort. We cannot drive them from it without sacrificing too many men. Warriors, retreat. I replied, No, hold. Warriors, listen. If these old men cannot fight, let them retire with the women and children. We can kill every one of those Blackfeet, then let us do it. If we attempt to run from here, we shall be shot in the back and lose more warriors than to fight and kill them all. If we get killed, our friends who love us here will mourn our loss, while those in the spirit land will sing and rejoice to welcome us there. If we ascend to them, dying like braves, the great spirit has sent these enemies here for us to slay. If we do not slay them, he will be angry with us, and will never suffer us to conquer our enemies again. He will drive off all our buffaloes, and will wither the grass on the prairies. No warriors. We will fight as long as one of them survives. Come, follow me. I will show you how the braves of the great white chief fight their enemies. Enemy of horses, exclaimed hundreds of the brave and impatient warriors who were crowded around me. Lead us, and we will follow you to the spirit land. Accepting the charge, I stationed a large body of those who were never known to flinch on one side in a position which I, with my followers, intended to scale. I thus thought to engage the attention of the enemy until we made good our entrance when I felt no longer doubtful of success. I then told them, as I threw up my shield the third time and shouted, Hokihe! They were to scale the wall as fast as possible and beat down whatever resistance might be offered them. I had divested myself of all my weapons except my battle axe and scalping knife, the latter being attached to my wrist with a string. I then made the signal, and when I raised the shout, Who ki the party opposite began to hoist one another up. When I sprang for the summit of the wall, I found that my women were holding my belt. I cut it loose with my knife and left it in their hands. I was the first on the wall, but was immediately followed by some scores of warriors. The enemy's whole attention when we entered the arena was directed to the opposite party, and we had time to cut numbers down before they were aware of our entrance. The carnage for some minutes was fearful, and the Blackfeet fought with desperation, knowing their inevitable doom if taken. The clash of the battle axes and the yells of the opposing combatants was truly appalling. Many leaped the wall only to meet their certain doom below where hundreds of battle-axes and lances were ready to drink their blood as soon as they touched ground. The interior surface of this huge rock was concave, and their blood all ran to the center, where it formed a pool, which emitted a sickening smell as the warm vapor ascended to our nostrils. It was also work of great difficulty to keep one's feet, as the mingled gore and brains were scattered everywhere around this fatal place. The blood of the crow and the blackfoot mingled together in this common pool. Many of our warriors fell in this terrible strife. 
All was silent within a few minutes after we had gained an entrance. Victims who were making away with their bowels ripped open were instantly fell with the battle axes and stilled in death. The wounded were cared for by their friends and the dead removed from sight. Upwards of forty crows were killed and double the number wounded. There were engaged on the side of the crows about twenty white men and only one wounded, though nearly all scaled the wall with the Indians. Mildrum was seriously injured by leaping from the heights after an Indian, but he soon recovered. Our spoils were one hundred and sixty scalps and immense quantities of guns and ammunition, a large amount of dried meat with arrows, lances, knives in great abundance. Here an incident happened with my little wife and mother worth mentioning. They were seated outside and under the wall when Owl Bear, one of the chiefs happening to pass, asked the girl if she was not the wife of the enemy of horses. She answered that she was. I thought so, he said, because you are such a pretty little squaw. But you have no husband now. He was shot through the head in the fort and instantly killed, and here you are playing with sticks. The poor thing, together with her mother, screamed out at the intelligence, and seizing a battle axe, each cut off a finger. The girl then stabbed her forehead with a knife and was instantly dripping with blood. The chief came laughing to me and said, that little wife of yours loves you better than any of your other wives. How do you know? I inquired. Because I told them all you were dead, and she was the only one that cut off a finger. And he laughed aloud as he passed. Soon, however, she climbed the wall, forced her way into the fort, and came directly to me. She presented a sickening spectacle and was covered entirely with blood. Seeing me, she burst into tears, and as soon as she could articulate, said, Why, you are not dead, after all. Owl Bear told me you were killed, and I came to seek your body. Who are you mourning for, I asked. Is your brother or father scalped? No, I mourned because I thought you were killed. Owl Bear told me you were. You must not believe all you hear, I said. Some Indians have crooked tons. But come and spread your robes and carry this gun and spoils of my first victim to the village, and there wash your face and bind up your finger. She did as I directed her and departed. As soon as we had collected all the trophies beneath us by our fallen foes and gathered all our dead, we moved back to the new camp. On our way, I exerted myself to the utmost to console the afflicted mourners. I told them that their friends were happy in the spirit land where there were no enemies to fight and where all was everlasting contentment and where they were happy in endless amusement. I said that in a few days I would avenge the fall of our warriors and depart for that peaceful land myself. I could plainly see that this last promise afforded them more satisfaction than all my other consoling remarks. But I disliked to see their horrid fashion of mourning, and my promised future victory speedily washed their faces of their present grief, for a promise for me was confided in by all the trod. There was, of course, no dancing, for we had lost too many warriors. But in the evening, there was great visiting throughout the village to talk over the events of the day and hear the statement of those who had taken part in the battle. Long hair came to the lodge of my father to congratulate me on my great feat in scaling the wall and to talk of the victory of his people achieved through my valor. All who were present related the deeds they had performed. As each narrated his exploit, all listened with profound attention. While this was going on, my little wife, who sat nearby, crawled behind me and whispering in my ears, and inquired if I had obtained any cues. These cues, she inquired after, are same as counts in a game of billiards. The death of one warrior counts as one, of two warrior counts as two. Every battle axe or gun taken counts one to the victor's merit. I said I had not, at which she looked aghast. But when the question was put to me by the chief shortly answered, I answered, eleven. 
On this she administered eleven taps on my back with her finger, and again whispered, Ah, I thought your tongue was crooked when you told me you had no coos. All the coos are registered in the great medicine log in the favor of the brave who wins them. I trust that the reader does not suppose that I waded through these scenes of carnage and desolation without some serious reflection on the matter. Disgusted at the repeated acts of cruelty I witnessed, I often resolved to leave these wild children of the forest and return to civilized life. But before I could act upon my decision, another scene of strife would occur, and the enemy of horses was always the first sought for by the tribe. I had been uniformly successful so far, and how I had escaped while scores of warriors had been stricken down at my side was more than I could understand. I was well aware that many of my friends knew of the life I was leading, and I almost feared to think of the opinions they must form of my character. But in justification it may be urged that the Crows had never shed the blood of a white man during my stay in their camp. And I did not intend they ever should, if I could raise a voice to prevent it. They were constantly at war with tribes who coveted the scalps of white men, but the Crows were uniformly faithful in their obligation to my race, and would I rather serve than injure their white brethren without any consideration of profit. In addition to this, self-interest would whisper her counsel. I knew I could acquire the riches of Croesus if I could but dispose of the valuable stock of peltry I had the means of accumulating. I required but an object in view to turn the attention of the Indians to the thousands of traps that were laid by to rust. I would occasionally use arguments to turn them from their unprofitable life and engage them in peaceful industry, but I found the Indian would be Indian still in spite of my efforts to improve them. They would answer, our enemies steal our horses, we must fight and get them back, or we'll steal in turn. Without horses we can make no surrounds, nor could we, to protect our lives, fight our foes when they attack our villages. Of course these arguments were unanswerable. So long as they were surrounded by enemies, they must be prepared to defend themselves. The large majority of Indian troubles arise from their unrestrained appropriation of each other's horses. It is their only branch of wealth. Like the miser with his gold, their greed for horses cannot be satisfied. All their other wants are merely attended to from day to day. Their need supplied, they, took, they look no further. Their appetite for horses is insatiable. They are ever demanding more. Mildrum and myself had a long conversation on the subject while he was smarting from the injury he received in leaping from the fort. He would say, Beckworth, I'm pretty well used to this Indian life. There is a great deal in it that charms me, but when I think of my Kentucky home, a father, mother, and other friends whom I tenderly love and with whom I could be so happy, I wonder at the vagabond spirit that holds me here among these savages fighting their battles and risking my life and scalp, which I fairly suppose exceeds in value 10,000 of these bloodthirsty heathen. How in the name of all that is sacred can we reconcile ourselves to it? Why don't we leave them? The medicine men held counsel and resolved to remove village. The great spirit was displeased with the spot and had therefore suffered all our warriors to be killed. We accordingly pulled up stakes and moved a short distance further. While we were busy moving, my little squaw angered me, and I drove her away. She not daring to disobey me, I saw no more of her until she supposed my anger was appeased. She then came to the lodge while I was conversing with my brothers, and putting a childless head into the door, said humbly, I know you are angry with me, but I want you to come and stay at our lodge tonight. We are outside the village, and my father and mother are afraid. Yes, said my brother. She has no ears now. She is by a child. She will have ears when she grows older. You had better go and protect 
the old people. I told her to run home I would soon follow. I went to the lodge accordingly. In the night I heard the snorting of horses, which were tied near the lodge door, crept softly out and looked carefully around. I then crawled without the least noise out of the lodge and caught sight an Indian, who I knew was there for no good purpose, was using the utmost precaution. He had a sharp point stick with which he raised the leaves that lay on his way so that his feet might not crush them and thus alarm inmates of the lodge. Every step brought him nearer to the animals, who, with necks curved and ears erect, gave a occasional snort at the approach of the Indian. This would bring him to a halt. Then again he would bring his stick into action and prepare a place for another step, not mistrusting that he was approaching the threshold of death. The ropes were tied close to the lodge door, and to untie them he must approach within six feet of where I lay on the ground. I let him advance as near as I thought safe, when with one bound I grappled him and gave him the war hoop. He was the hardest to hold that I ever had my arms around, but I had both his arms pinned in my embrace round his lithe and nimble body, and he could not release one so as to draw his knife. Instantly we surrounded with fifty armed warriors. When I saw a sufficient breastwork round about, I released my hold and stepped back. He was riddled with bullets in an instant and fell without a cry. His scalp sufficed to wash off the morning paint from every face in the village, and all were turned into mirth. Although this general change in feeling did not restore the dismembered fingers or heel, the voluntary wounds. Greater than ever was the enemy of horses, and I received a still more ennobling appellation, Shaska Ohusha, the bobtail horse. The village, the village exhausted itself in showing its admiration of my exploit, and my single scalp was greeted with as much honor as if I had slaughtered a hundred enemies. End of chapter fourteen. Chapter 15 of The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 15. Short account of Pine Leaf, the Crow heroine. Twenty days battle with the Cheyennes. Return of the village to the west side of the mountains. Letter from Mackenzie. Visit to his trading post at the mouth of the Yellowstone. In connection with my Indian experience, I conceived it to be my duty to devote a few lines to one of the bravest women that ever lived, namely Pine Leaf. In Indian, Bachi M. P. For an Indian, she possessed great intellectual powers. She was endowed with extraordinary muscular strength and with the activity of the cat and speed of the antelope. Her features were pleasing, and her form symmetrical. She lost a brother in the attack on our village before mentioned, a great brave, and her twin brother. He was a fine specimen of the race of red men and made fair to rise to distinction, but he was struck down in his strength, and Pine Leaf was left to avenge his death. She was at that time twelve years of age and she solemnly vowed that she would never marry until she had killed a hundred of the enemy with her own hand. Whenever a war party started, Pine Leaf was the first to volunteer to accompany them. Her presence among them caused much amusement to the old veterans, but if she lacked physical strength, she always rode the fleetest horse, and none of the warriors could outstrip her. All admired her for her ambition, and as she advanced in years, many of the braves grew anxious for the speedy accomplishment of her vow. She had chosen my party to serve in, and when I engaged in the fiercest struggles, no one was more promptly at my side than file young heroine. She seemed incapable of fear, and when she arrived at womanhood, could fire a gun without flinching, and use the Indian weapons with as great dexterity as the most accomplished warrior. 
I began to feel more than a common attachment towards her. Her intelligence charmed me, and her modest and becoming demeanor singled her out from her sex. One day, while riding leisurely along, I asked her to marry me, but provided we both returned safe. She flashed her dark eye upon mine. You have too many already, she said. Do you suppose I would break my vow to the great spirit? He sees and knows all things. He would be angry with me and would not suffer me to live to avenge my brother's death. I told her that my medicine said that I must marry her, and then I could never be vanquished or killed in battle. She laughed and said, Well, I will marry you. When we return? No, but when the pine leaves turn yellow. I reflected that it would soon be autumn and regarded her promise as valid. A few days afterward, it occurred to my mind that pine leaves do not turn yellow, and I saw I had been practiced upon. When I again spoke to her on the subject, I said, Pine leaf, you promised to marry me when the pine leaves should turn yellow. It has occurred to me that they never grow yellow. She returned no answer except a hearty laugh. Am I to understand that you never intend to marry me? I inquired. Yes, I will marry you, she said with a coquettish smile. But when? When you shall find a red-headed Indian. I saw her I advanced nothing by importuning her, and I let the matter rest. However, to help her on with her vow, I never killed an Indian if she was by to perform it for me thinking that when her numbers were immolated, there might be a better chance of pressing my suit. We frequently shifted our camping ground in order to keep up with the buffalo and furnish our horses with sufficient grass, for we had such an immense number that the prairie round our lodge in a few days had the appearance of a closely mown meadow. Finally, we removed to the western side of the mountain again, and encamped on Little Horn River, one of the sources of the Yellowstone. Shortly after our encampment, we found that there was a village of Cheyennes about 12 miles distant, and an incessant warfare was maintained between the two villages for 20 days. Sometimes they would take three or four crow scalps. In return, our party would retaliate by taking as many of theirs. Thus they went on, with very unfortunate during the whole twenty days. I had never been engaged in these skirmishes, but one evening I, with three others among whom was Yellow Billy, resolved to go on an adventure. Accordingly, we started for the Cheyenne, arriving there the next morning and unhesitatingly entering their village while the inmates were quietly reposing. After passing through one quarter of their village, we saw an Indian approaching who, on perceiving us, wheeled his horse to escape. I shot an arrow into his back, but before he fell, I rode up, cut him down with my battle axe, and rode on. One of our party, not wishing to lose his scalp, dismounted to take it. In doing so, he lost his horse, which followed us, leaving his rider on foot close to the enemy's village, whence the aroused warriors were issuing like hornets. Perceiving his danger, I rode back and took him up behind me. We had to run for him, but we made good our escape, driving home before us seven horses captured from the enemy. This was a great achievement by our Crow brethren, and they again washed their faces. The enemy now charged on our village, killing six crows, among whom was a brother-in-law of mine. His relatives appealed to me to avenge them, supposing that the enemy would renew the attack the next day. I selected 130 warriors, all well mounted, to waylay them. We posted ourselves midway between the belligerent villages, but the Cheyennes had passed within a few hundred yards before we were in ambush. Being there, the idea occurred to me to await their return. On their repulse from the village, we would spring up and cut off their retreat, and I made no doubt succeed in killing a great number of their warriors. It fell out as I had expected. The crows drove them back with a loss to the enemy of four, and when they neared us, their horses were badly jaded and our friends hotly in pursuit. We sprung up, 
cutting off their retreat, and they solely placed in their rear, seeing our party in front cutting down right and left, became panic-struck and fled in all directions. We took sixteen scalps with the horses and equipment of the fallen warriors and returned home in triumph. This made twenty scalps taken in one day, which was considered by the close a glorious victory, and the scalp dance was performed with unusual vivacity. In this battle, the heroine was by my side and fought with her accustomed audacity. I counted five boots, and she three, for three enemies killed with her lance. The Cheyennes, disconcerted with their misadventure, moved their village away from the Crow territory. We also took up our line of march and moved on to Clark's Fork, a branch of the Yellowstone, where we found abundance of buffalo and good grass. While encamped here, I received a letter from Mr. McKenzie, written at Fort Union, at the mouth of the Yellowstone, where he desired me to see him. It was delivered to me by Mr. Winters, who, in company with one man, had found his way unharmed. Mr. McKenzie wished me to see him immediately on business of importance, as he wished through my influence to establish a trade with the crows. On communicating my intention of performing the journey, all postulated at my going. I gave them my positive word that I would return in eighteen sons, if not killed on the way. It was a long and hazardous journey to undertake. Having to traverse a distance of 760 miles, exposed to numerous bands of hostile Indians, I succeeded in reaching the fort in safety, where I found Mackenzie with a great stock of miscellaneous goods. I arrived late in the afternoon, dispatched my business with him hastily, and started on my return in the morning. I took ten pack horses laden with goods to trade with the Indians in addition to which several boats were freighted and sent to me up the Yellowstone. Two men accompanied me to the Crow country. We had no trouble on our way until we arrived within a few miles of our village, as I supposed it, when, as we were marching on, I remarked something unfamiliar in the appearance of the place. I ordered the two men to turn their animals up a little valley close by, while I took a nearer look at the village. A closer inspection confirmed my mistake. I saw the lodges were painted a different color from our own. I followed the pack horses and found the trail which led to the Crow village and concealed from the observation of the village we approached. Soon after entering the trail, I discovered the fresh tracks of five Indians going the direction that we were. I halted the pack horses and rode on to get a sight of them. At a short distance, I perceived the five men, and unobserved by them, I rode on and entered a low place where I approached within a few rods of them. I took a short survey of them and concluded that they must be enemies belonging to the village we had just left. They were on foot, and I conceived myself a match for the whole five. I leveled my rifle and was taking aim when my horse moved his head and disconcerted my sight. I tried again with precisely the same result. I then dismounted and advanced two or three steps nearer my object. As I was about to fire, having the rein on my arm, the horse made another motion, thus spoiling my aim for the third time. At that moment, one of them made a yawning expression in the crow language, and I was so terrified at his narrow escape that the rifle dropped from my hand. I called to them, telling them the danger they had escaped. Why, said they, you would not have attacked the five of us? Yes, I said, and would have killed every one of them had you been enemies. Then they informed me that they had lost two men at that day near the village of the Blackfeet, who were now, beyond doubt, dancing over their scalps. I did not wait to hear more, but directed them to return to my horses and assist the men in getting on to the Crow Village as soon as possible. I rode forward to make my arrival known. My return was welcomed 
with the liveliest demonstrations of joy by the whole tribe. But I delayed no time in ceremonial. I called the council forthwith and informed them that the Blackfeet were encamped ten miles distant, and that two of our warriors had that day fallen by their hands, and that we must go and avenge their death. The chief assented, but as a preliminary, directed me and another to count the lodges that night. I undertook the dangerous task, although extremely fatigued with my long journey. We succeeded in the object of our expedition, and found their lodges outnumbered ours by one. There are, as a general thing, from four to six warriors to a lodge. The Blackfoot village comprised 233 lodges. Hence, we could form a pretty accurate estimate of the number of warriors we had to contend with. Their village was closely watched by our spies. Every movement made by the enemy was promptly reported to our chief. During the night they appeared to sleep soundly, probably fatiguing with the late dance. But in the morning they were astir betimes, and having packed up, started forward in our direction, apparently unaware of our presence. On they came, men, women, and children, utterly unconscious of the terrible shock that awaited them. Our warriors were never better prepared for a conflict, and never more certain of a victory. We were drawn up on a high table prairie, and our whole force concealed from view at no greater distance than half pistol shot. Their chief led the van, and with him were several young squaws who were laughing and dancing around him, evidently to his great amusement. They were near enough to launch the thunders of war upon them, and our chief gave orders to charge. The order was instantly carried into effect. The chief, who a moment before was so joyous, surrounded by his tawny young squaws, was the first to fall beneath my battle-axe, and his attendants scattered like chaff before the wind. We were upon the warriors so unexpectedly that they had hardly time to draw their weapons before they were overthrown and put to flight. They were encumbered with women, children, and baggage. Our attention was directed solely to the men, the women unharmed except those who were overturned by our horses. During the engagement, a powerful Blackfoot aimed a blow at me with his battle axe, with his battle axe which Pine Leaf deprived of its effective by piercing his body through with her lance. In a few moments, the fighting was over, and after pursuing the flying enemy through the timber, we returned to collect the spoils of victory. We took 170 scalps, over 150 women and children, beside abundance of weapons, baggage, and horses. The Crows had 29 wounded. This was a severe blow to the Blackfeets. Such a slaughter is of rare occurrence in Indian warfare. Notwithstanding this sad defeat, they rallied their broken band and attacked us again in the afternoon, but it amounted to nothing, and they fled in gloomy confusion beyond the Crow territory. Pine Leaf never signalized herself more than on this occasion. She counted six coups, having killed four of the enemy with her own hand. She had but few superiors in wielding the battle-axe. My horse was killed by a blow which was aimed at my head by the Indian whom the heroine killed. I wore a superb headdress, ornamented with eagle's feathers and weasel's tails. The labor of many days. Early in the action, three of these tails were severed by a bullet which grazed my head. These black feet shoot close said the heroine as she saw the ornaments fall but never fear the great spirit will not let them harm us i took a pretty young woman prisoner but was obliged to give her up to one of the braves who had my promise before the battle that if i took one i would give her to him and if he took one he should give her to me when a warrior of the crow tribe takes a woman prisoner she is considered his sister and he can never marry her if she marries a husband is brother-in-law to her captor 
our prisoners soon forgot their captivity they even seemed pleased with the change for they joined with great alacrity in our scalp dance over the scalps of their own people all indian women are considered by the stronger sex as menials they are thoroughly reconciled to their degradation and the superiority of their lords and masters is the chiefest subject of boast they are patient plodding and unambitious although there are instances in savage life of a woman manifesting superior talent and making her influence felt upon the community during my visit at fort union i engaged to build a fort for mackenzie to store his goods in safety at the mouth of the bighorn river one of the branches of the yellowstone accordingly i repaired to the place to select a good site and commenced operations on arriving at the spot i found the boats close by but as there was no secure quay at the junction of the streams i selected a site about a mile below there were fifty men who had arrived with the boats hired to assist me in erecting the fort the stipulated dimensions were one hundred and twenty yards for each front the building to be a solid square with blockhouse at opposite corners the fort was erected of hewn logs planted perpendicularly in the ground the walls were eighteen feet high as soon as the pickets were up we built our houses inside in order to be prepared for the approach of winter when i had been engaged about six weeks upon its construction four hundred lodges of crows moved into our immediate vicinity thus affording us plenty of company and a sufficient force to protect us against the attacks of hostile tribes when we had completed our building we unloaded the boats and commenced trading with the indians during the first year the company was very unsuccessful sinking over seventeen thousand dollars in the undertaking this however was principally attributable to the outlay upon the fort the wages of fifty men engaged in constructing it ran for twelve months and to the number of presents which it is customary on such occasions to distribute among the indians after the crows had removed to the foot they were repeatedly annoyed with attacks from different hostile tribes i was engaged in two small encounters during the winter in both of which we were completely victorious the crows were fully occupied in protecting their own horses or levying contributions upon their neighbors during the winter we accumulated a large amount of peltry which in the spring i sent down to fort union in five mackinaw boats built by ourselves for the purpose i sent a sufficient number of men to take good care of the boats and to return upstream with a fresh supply of goods i then left the fort in charge of winters leaving him thirty men for a guard i also had provided an ample stock of dried meat so that they might avoid the risk of hunting for provisions early in may we commenced our march in search of summer quarters we traveled by easy stages and on a circuitous route so that when we finally arrived at rosebud creek a branch of the yellowstone we found ourselves but twenty miles distance from the fort after we had remained about a week at our encampment our village was invested by a large war party of blackfeet it happened very fortunately we were building a medicine lodge at the time and our whole force was at home which circumstance most probably preserved us from a disastrous defeat our enemies numbered about four thousand warriors to oppose whom we had two thousand eight hundred practiced warriors beside the old men who always acted as village guards at daybreak the enemy advanced upon our village with great impetuosity our war horses being tied to our large doors the first alarm found our defenders ready mounted to meet the assailants we did not allow them to enter the village but advanced on to the plain to meet them the contests were severe for several minutes and the clash of battle axes and the fierce yells of the opposing forces made the whole prairie tremble 
the two parties charged alternately according to the indian mode of warfare but the crows gained ground at every attack for they fought with everything at stake the fight lasted for several hours early in the action we discovered a maneuver of the enemy which would probably have resulted seriously for us had we not perceived it in time about half their force was detached to attack us in the rear and take possession of the village i formed from fifteen to eighteen hundred warriors into a body and rode down to meet their detachment as it wound around the foot of a small hill they were in quick march to gain their position and approached in seeming security my warriors being formed upon the brow of the hill under which the enemy was passing i gave the order for a rush down the hill upon them the attack was made with such irresistible force that everything in our way was overthrown and warriors and horses were knocked into promiscuous piles we happened to burst upon their center thus severing them in two and the confusion they became involved in was so irremediable that their only hope was to get back to their main body with as little delay as possible in the attack a lance thrown by a blackfoot perforated my legging just grazing the calf of my leg and entered the body of my horse killing him on the spot my ever-present friend pine leaf instantly withdrew it releasing me from a very precarious situation as i was pinned close to the horse and his dying struggles rendered such proximity extremely unsafe i sprang upon the horse of a young warrior who was wounded and called to some of our women to convey the wounded man to a place of safety the heroine then joined me and we dashed into the conflict a horse was immediately after killed and I discovered her in a hand-to-hand -hand encounter with a dismounted Blackfoot, a lance in one hand and a battle-axe in the other. Three or four springs of my steed brought me upon her antagonists, and, striking him with the breast of my horse when at full speed, I knocked him to the earth senseless, and before he could recover, she pinned him to the ground with a lance and scalped him. When I had overturned the warrior, Pine Leaf called to me, right on i have him safe now i rode on accordingly but she was soon mounted again and at my side the surviving blackfeet speedily dispersed and they all retreated together leaving the crows master of the field they left behind ninety-one killed besides carrying off many dead with their wounded we lost thirty-one killed and a large number of wounded i had five horses killed under me but received no wound our enemies in their retreat drove off sixteen hundred horses among which were eighty of my own but we had plenty left and we considered these only lent to them we had no dance and the relatives of the slain went through their usual mourning a few days after the battle a messenger arrived from the fort with a request for me to return as quickly as possible as the blackfeet were continually harassing the men and they were in fear of a general attack accordingly i returned in the latter part of june and found affairs in a very serious condition the indians had grown very bold and it was hazardous to venture outside the fort one morning seven men were sent about one mile away to cut house logs it being supposed there were no indians in the vicinity Sometime in the forenoon, I heard the report of a rifle close to our gate. I ran out and just caught sight of the retreating Indians as they entered the bushes. They had shot and scalped one of our men as he was chopping only a few paces from the gate. The danger that the other men might be placed in then occurred to me, and ordering the men to follow me, I mounted my horse and hastened to the rescue. I was followed by about one half of the men, the remainder preferring the protection of the wooden walls. I soon discovered our men. They were surrounded by forty Indians, the chief of whom appeared to be addressing the sun and was gesticulating with his battle axe. On raising his arm, I sent a ball through his body and then shouted to the men to run to me. They started, but one of them was shot down before they reached me. 
The survivors were so terrified that they did not dare to stop when they reached me, but continued their course unslackened until they gained the fort. My followers, seeing their alarm, became fugitives in turn, and I was left alone within gunshot of the remaining 39 Indians. Uttering the deafening yells, they made a rush for me. My horse became frightened, and I could scarcely mount him. However, by running by his side a few paces, I managed to leap on his back and retreated at full speed, while their bullets and arrows flew around me like hail. When I approached the fort, a voice near me cried, Oh, Jim, don't leave me here to be killed. I wheeled around and, with my double barrel gun in my hand, made a charge towards the whole approaching party, who, seeing my resolute bearing, turned and scampered off. I rode up to the person who had called me and found him an old man who was unable to run and had been abandoned by his valorous companions to the mercy of the savages. I assisted him on to my horse and was about to spring on behind him when the horse sprang forward, leaving the old man's gun behind and carried him to the fort. By this time the Indians had turned upon me. I ran wherever shelter offered itself, and, when closely pressed, would face round and menace them with my gun. Within a few hundred yards of the fort, I came to a small covering which had been used as a shelter by the horse guards, and I sprang into it, with the Indians at my heels. After expending the contents of my gun, I plied them with arrows to their heart's content until they gave up the fray and retired. This took place in fair view of the fort, when not one of its dohi inmates dare come to my assistance and who even refused to resign their firearms to the women who were anxious to come to my rescue. When at length I succeeded in reaching Fort, I favored the men with my unreserved opinion of them. I had been the means of saving their lives even after the chief of the savages had returned thanks to the sun for their scalps, which he had already deemed secured. I really believe that with Pine Leaf and three other squaws I could have stormed and taken a fort from their possession. These men were not mountaineers, they were nearly all Canadians, and had been hired in the East. They were unused to savage warfare, and only two of them had seen an Indian battle. If they had come out like men, we might have killed one half the Indians, and I should have been spared a great deal of hard feeling. They acknowledged, however, that I had flogged the Indians alone, and that six of them were indebted to me for their lives. In July, after the arrival of the boats, the crows again returned to the fort. They came to make purchases with what small means they possessed, as they had disposed of all their peltry on the previous visit. They, however, brought in a great quantity of roots, cherries, berries, etc., which they traded for articles of necessity. They also sold 60 horses, which we sent to McKenzie at the lower fort, Clark. It greatly charms the Indian to see new goods when they have the means to buy. There is no end to their purchases. When the lances, battle axes, and guns are spread before their eyes, glittering with their burnished steel, notwithstanding they may have a dozen serviceable weapons at home, they must infallibly purchase a new one. If one purchases, all must follow. Hence, there is no limit to their demand, but the very important one imposed by the extent of their exchangeable commodities. The newly arrived boats were manned with Canadians. All strangers in the country, nearly all having been imported for boating, as they were willing to submit to the hardships of such a life, for a smaller remuneration than men hired in the States. On their arrival, their brethren related a thousand tales about the Indians and what feats I had performed against them single-handed. They listened to the marvelous tales and gazed at me in wondering admiration. When Canadians are fairly broken in and have become familiar with Indian character, they make the best of Indian fighters, especially when put to it in defense of their own lives. They become superior trappers, too, being constituted, like their native ponies, with a capacity to endure the extremest 
hardships and privations and to endure starvation for an incredible long time. End of chapter 15